our agenda to uh, try to continue our levy item when he gets back. So just warning you about that. So we'll have a little bit of a change. So at this point, our work study is on our levies and there have been some questions. And so I wanted to go over some of the information um, that was just recently sent out. Um, one piece that is important is the um, additional uh, teacher responsibilities and compensation. And so we have um, some slides to try to help explain what that piece is. So I was going to have Martin and Jake talk about that part first, so we can address any questions around it. And then we can go into other questions related to either of the levies. All right, does that sound okay to everybody? Board, the yes, tier? Yes. Okay. Good. All right, so I'm gonna pass it over to um, Martin and Jake about the um, details. So between this board meeting and the last, um, there were several questions from board directors. Um, I'm going to dive a little deeper, sorry, into the um, numbers that were provided in the enhancement list prior meeting. So with these uh, corresponding slides we'll do, we'll take you through in detail what um, the 11 and what, 11 and a half million or so um, of enhancements outside of basic ed are for in particular, in this case, the IEA bargaining unit. So under state statute, um, you are allowed and continue to, and districts have continued to, to pay to try, which is time responsibility incentive under the state law. So you're uh, allowed to compensate um, certificated staff members for either of those, either so time is work time, uh, work time as it, as it would easily mean. Responsibility is a little more vague in statute, but uh, we used to have ARC in the school district and that was the additional responsibility contract. So responsibility are for duties outside of basic ed or duties outside of the classroom. And we'll flesh that out a little bit here shortly. And then incentive on the I part of the statute is most commonly used um, for either incentive pay as it relates to an achievement. I could, I've seen it used for academic performance, but most commonly it's used for um, commitment, stipends or retention. So as you are longer in your career and you've worked with us for a certain amount of time, you then you get incentive pay, which is commonly driven out in the form of retention and commitment. So um, to break out the total in the try that is remaining in the collective bargaining agreement. And all this is available um, on the website as well. The IEA collective bargaining agreement and the salary schedules provide you all the information that is underpinning the slide deck this evening. Um, so there was a question about what, what are those cost items in detail? And so the biggest chunk post McCleary, I wanna say is that after the McCleary settlement or the settlement between the state and the McCleary party, we were provided a significant amount of additional state revenue. And then school districts around the state of Washington had to renegotiate their entire salary schedules. So we had, for example, we had pre-McCleary, we had smaller base salaries and much larger tri packages or uh, ARC as we had it here. So at the peak, the district had um, ARC or incentive uh, tri pay about 21 and three quarters percent of base. So for example, if you were a $50,000 employee, you'd be making what, 10,000 and change, 10,175. So out of your additional responsibility. Districts, again, changed how they compensated teachers post McCleary. So we redid the entire salary schedule. And what you see in uh, ARC or TRI is approximately 4% of their teacher's base. So every staff member in the district, counselor, um, TOSA, et cetera, gets this 4% of base salary. So as base moves, as an example, you get a, you get a promotion, not a promotion, you, your years of service change, credits and clock hours, et cetera, um, that would rise as your base salary raises. So to quantify that into hours, when we bargain this, I don't know, this would be four years ago now or so, um, one thing the district did pre McCleary was elongate its Wednesdays to add additional half an hour. If you recall, we weren't we weren't close to the 1080 marker. So we had to get 1,080 mark, uh, hours at 912. We were short. So what we did during that negotiations is we had secondary staff elongate the school day, um, 612. And then the additional half an hour in elementary is actually paid non-student time for, prep, for prep. And that was because at that point in time, we had provided what, three or four adoptions in a row, curricular adoptions to the um, elementary folks, and they were uh, having trouble keeping up with that pace. So we did in that bargain, we slowed the pace of curriculum adoptions down. We also decided 
to add additional half hour prep once a week for elementary folks. Um, to that end, that eight hour Wednesday, again, half an hour, 36 to 38 Wednesdays in a year, it depends upon when we start and stop. So there is, there is a, always a variance of two when I model that for you, because you could have as uh, few as 36 and as many as 38. Um, so that is all staff members, half an hour extra a day, um, over 36 to 38 Wednesdays, you get two, just under 2.4 million for that additional cost. Now curriculum night, this is really considered a responsibility, but I was asked to, to quantify it in an hourly amount. And so, you know, we estimate, you know, staff, staff members stays after school, they're doing some preparatory time. So we estimate that about a half, half day of additional work, which is about $437,000. And the remainder is uh, truthfully a relic of the additional responsibility contract that we had bargained. Remember, and in the CBA, it is uh, in addendum E, which defines that it's basically um, work outside of the workday, parent and volunteer meetings. Um, what else is in there, Mr. Attorney? Um, attending activ activities outside of the workday and other professional duties. So it does recognize that certificated staff in particular are doing work outside of the classroom. Um, however, most of that compensation is now on their base salary. So the responsibilities are fewer than they historically have been under the additional responsibility contract. So that goes through the tri portion. Is there any questions on those three drivers of the tri? Like it. Other compensation. So we're going to get to the $11 million total that was on the enhancement list here shortly. So also in the IA salary schedule are the commitment stipends. So if you're at the very top end of the salary schedule, I think the top end is $3,500 commitment stipend or retention. So if you're at the very top end, your master's MA90 and you've been here 15 years or longer, you'll get that $3,500 stipend. And then we have retention stipends, which actually begin, and they're not on the salary schedule because they begin with years of service, which doesn't nearly necessarily correspond with um, where you're placed in the salary schedule because it only includes um, out of our district service, if I recall. So there is a difference there, but then there's retention stipends all the way up from year 10 to uh, 15 and 20 and, and beyond. So that is uh, retention and commitment. Overload pay when required. Usually runs about 1.3 million. I say when required because if the district executes a reduction in force, like we did this past year, um, that overload expense is suspended. Um, I know that um, certificated staff members always have uh, difficulty when we suspend that and do a reduction in force. Um, however, that is part of the CBA. It is a practice we've engaged in uh, about three or four times in my career. So, hey, Jake, could you explain what overload pay is? Yes, I can, Director Moore. Overload pay in this system is when um, our student enrollment numbers or class sizes exceed a hard cap in the collective bargaining agreement. So for example, if you're in grades K2, I think we have abandoned now. Uh, Elena, do you recall? It's if you're above 25 or greater, if I recall in K2, 23. Well, that was a staffing goal. I think overload kicks in at 24 K2. And then each corresponding grade span has different overload triggers, 32, 33, and then it's a different calculation at secondary. Sometimes it's overall caseload or you can have double overload. So what the district has done and parties around the state have agreed to is that to ameliorate some of the workload, um, we're compensating the teacher for the additional class load. They do have the option and some do and take it as para support. But either, either way, the para hours drive the um, overload rate. So the teacher gets a uh, what the, the para would cost, and then that is their resulting compensation. So, um, but that is in the system, has been for many years, and of course varies upon how high our class sizes are, how accurate we project enrollment, do we have the right amount of teachers in front of everybody at the right time. And so in any given year, I've seen that as, I've seen it as low as 600 and 700,000, 700, I've seen as high as 2 million. Just depends upon really how those overloads come in. Um, but that is usually a topic of collective bargaining as it relates directly to workload, but a very common negotiated item. And fortunately in this district, we don't have hard caps. Some districts have hard caps where you would, if it reaches 25, you'd be forced to hire an additional teacher. Um, so here we do it through compensation or para time. And quite frankly, it, it's also important because we have historically had not classroom space to add those uh, teachers. So um, 
And then we have a, a myriad or potpourri of different competition items driving that remaining 2 million. You see a lot of the extended days as they come to your board packet. Um, counselors, psychs, SLPs, OTPT, uh, TOSAs, team leads. Um, you get the drift. There's a significant amount of uh, compensation tied up in those extended days. And that is additional work um, by staff members. We also have report card writing, and that's kind of an overload situation in elementary. If you write a certain number of report cards or you have a certain number of conferences, you get additional compensation. Covering of colleagues' classes, that's not really in the substitute budget, but we've had a lot of that lately. If you've known, if, if you're at the secondary and there's two prep periods and you're going to cover for somebody and you don't get your prep period, then we will pay you that hour or 55 minutes to cover your planning. And then request for compensations. And that is a lot of one-off meetings, um, curriculum adoptions, late special education meetings you know, that, are, that run late. So those are timesheet time sheet driven. So a, a certificated staff member, um, maybe they were requested by their uh, supervisor to stay for a late IEP meeting, 6 to 7 p.m. as an example. That would be something that normal outside of their work day, they would submit a request for compensation to their supervisor, and that's paid on an hourly basis. So that's the total for the other comp. That should, if Mr. Turney and I's math is correct, add approximately uh, right near the um, figure that was provided to you on the enhancement list and was also uh, worked through the committee during the process. Any questions on the 11.2 million and change on the try and supplemental compensation? Right, and because, um, because there are many factors that go into this, it's, it's a variable number year to year. It's oh, significantly because, variable. Because both of things like your overload depends on how much that is um, and other responsibilities. So, oh yeah. So I was just saying that's part, that was part of what leads into it is it's a variable number each year. And this is the best right. estimate at the moment. Correct. And most, the other thing that drives it is as as the per diem or daily rate of the certificated staff member increases. So we have a cost of living adjustment or IPD. Um, you know, it goes up 4%, 5%. That has a ripple effect on all your um, hourly compensation. So as you, as the base goes up, so does the compensation. And remember, since we increased base salary in McCleary um, quite significantly over a what, four or five year period, that resulted in higher per diem rates for our certificated staff members. Thank you. Yep. Other questions from the board? And we can pass this down if that helps. That is what we like to hear. Okay. The other request. I guess uh, my qu my oh, question sorry. would be uh, over the next four years. I mean, the, the biggest problem I think we're having is less about this and more about projection of students. This still covers the number of actual teachers we have and is not related to any projection of students as far as um, the, what, what's it called? The, it's kind of the stabilization, enrollment stabilization. This has nothing to do with that because the actual teachers we have are the actual teachers we have. So the only way to lower, well, the only way to lower that number would be to have less staff in the system or have uh, a lower base salary. Or otherwise, those, no, those, those compensation figures will grow over time. Right. And what she's saying is that the, these numbers here are based on what we currently have today. Correct. Which is based on the number of students we actually have today. So yep. it's separating out the difference between, you know, what it's costing us today. And, and it's a separate um, piece that talks about um, our, our enrollment return and how um, – we could have additional students over the next few years, and how do you plan for that? Those are kind of two separate things to what you're saying. Okay, Correct. got it. Correct. And then if and when I think students will return, we just don't know how, at what pace or the volume. I mean, if I could project that, I would be Nostradamus. I mean, yeah. it's pretty pretty impossible, I think, for folks in our field to do that. Um, that is a separate, that's a variable expense. Remember that as students increase, so does your staffing and vice versa, um, up and down, if, you're, if, you're re if your labor is matched to your enrollment. Next one. Um, and what also what <clears throat> what has been uh, spoken about to Mr. Turney and myself by a few board members and community members was the growth in this measure. 
um, as a percentage. Um, and so what we have charted here for you is the percentage growth or change of our levies since 1996, I believe. 99, sorry, it's a long ways away. It's one year after I graduated high school, so I'm still old. But as you can see, the math is the math. So there was claims from folks that 30% escalation over a four year period, which is actually five. When people were saying it was 30%, they were counting five years in total. Our escalation and growth or change in our levy, EPNO, you can see where it's been um, over the last, how many years did we end up? 27 years. So even ups and downs, we were running right at seven and a quarter. And then without the levy, we're actually a little better at seven and 33 bips. So when folks say, oh my gosh, this levy's grown faster than any other levy, that would be mathematically untrue. Um, the graph demonstrates quite clearly that our levies over time, and you can track the, track the growth. So student growth, inflation, those are all, you know, those are historical numbers now. But remember, today on the news, we heard, what's the inflation nationwide? Seven and a half. That's the CPI, but still our levies are run by CPI, our um, funding from the state. They were very wise. <laughs> They're doing an IPD. So they, sh they short us when they use a little bit different measure, but I can see why they used it because it does control some costs at the state level. I understand that. But not our actual costs. It doesn't control right. our costs. It doesn't really help us. We at usually all. run closer to CPI. Right. They would like to run closer to IPD. But, but I, I understand from a financial standpoint why that uh, decision was made. But in all sincerity, you can see it's graphed out over time, the change in our levy as a percentage. And it runs right around seven and a quarter for a 27 year period. So when you're looking at 30% over five years, that is actually less than our historical growth average. And that first year, we're actually picking up 13 of that 30% from 22 to 23, because we have a, uh, a rather big jump up. And then we compound, actually you can see we compound less. Mr. Trini, what are those numbers on the far right? I should look at my handout. So our model, um, as you can see, has a 13% kick up in 23, but then we are lower than historic average on the out years. So five, five, and four. And we don't have the change to 27, so we can't measure that. So I just want to say that, that the, the board has asked that question in several different ways. And then um, uh, Director Moore actually uh, said, why don't you show it as a percentage change uh, to quantify it? So I want you to know that that what we're the district is proposing to the board of directors this evening is actually less than historical average and not 30% over four years, but less than that. Right. So I will ask just so that we can, so that it can be clear to the community whoever's listening, that we had this big drop in our levy collection in 2019. And that had to do with the change in how schools are funded with the McCleary decision, right? So we got more money from the state we collected less through our levies, right? Correct. So the McCleary, um, there's some, some confusion that we're still going to be getting more McCleary money. But it's my understanding that all the funding related to McCleary and that change, we've already gotten. There's no additional McCleary money coming. The state always can change how it funds with its prototypical school model or its allocation model, but there's no more planned McCleary money. Is that correct? That is correct. So the large influx in McCleary funds was a one, it came over a two year period. Remember actually it came early, earlier than lots of thought and we had a huge amount of uh, money that we weren't quite ready to spend. It came at the end of the year, which, you know, usually I would never say that, but that was the timing of the McCleary funds. But you're correct, Director Moore, they will, are now only tweaking, they will rebase the salaries and the regionalization. I think that's in 23, um, but they're set to do that every six or eight years. And that's basically just a funding driver, same as any changes to the prototypical model, which have been floating around. You've heard in the news, potentially uh, increased funding for nurses and psychologists uh, as two examples that are in the funding drivers. So, Director Moraldo. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to go back there because that really was our decision. It dropped as significantly as it did, not just because of McCleary, but we as a board decided to not go for full authority. 
And I think that that's really clear for us. We are now in a position, had we not done that, we wouldn't be at a $17 million deficit this year. And, and but we made a decision in previous years to be conscious about what we were doing, not knowing that there was a worldwide pandemic on the way, right? So part of this is we've got to right size those kind of decisions. We have to be prepared for what might happen because this pandemic is not over. We don't know how it's going to affect us in the future. We know, there's a sense of relief, a sense of endemic nature to it, but I don't know that. And so I think we do need to specify that that 19 number is because we chose as a board to not go for full authority. I do think it's important to note that we received, I believe, with McCleary, uh, a net 38 million. Uh, that, that number comes to mind. The board made the right decision then. Right? We, we did not know. Here's what I will say. There's too many unknowns. I will say this. We, we, we were able to um, position ourselves in a, in a way that we could uh, provide our certificated and other staff members kind of pent up wage demand that had, you know, remember there was a bunch of goose eggs for lots of legislative sessions before that. Um, so we, if I recall, if I remember correctly, uh, we spent about half of the money on additional compensation. And then we also as a district decided to add the program and a significant amount of program that we have before the uh, community today. So seven period day, uh, expanding mental health, et cetera. Those were all part of the, uh, the levy um, package. The first levy package is we decided to rebuild it as a group from the ground up, which I think was prudent then. And, you know, <clears throat> at that point in time, I think it was prudent not to have a full authority levy. There's, there was a lot of, lot of new money. We actually had disagreements with the legislature about how much money and when, right? Um, so, and our, and our voters at that point in time did experience a large increase from the state on their state property taxes, not from the district, but the state side, which, which is fine. That's, that's what funds are at most bulk of our schools. And then over time though, however, I think as we become clear and more succinct about our programs that have kind of have a longitudinal uh, stay here in the district, seven period day, mental health, et cetera, uh, and our expenses have continued to grow and our enrollment has declined. I, again, uh, I think it would be obviously prudent to have a higher levy authority. Um, but over time, and to be prudent to the taxpayers, the district actually collected, uh, well, we were $23.7 million less over our four-year period since our authority was not a, uh, at full statutory authority. Yeah, you got it? Jake, you bring up another Hold on. point. Oh, sorry. Forget that we have to do the mic. You bring up another point um, that I think is really important, and I'm going to try to say this, correct me if I'm wrong, but when people look at their property tax bills and they say, X percent of my property tax goes to schools. When it goes to schools, it doesn't all go to this $3.52 that we're levying, correct? A lot of that goes to the state who allocates it out, not necessarily to Issaquah, not necessarily even to King County, but just somewhere in the state. Is that a correct statement? Correct. So on your tax bill, last time I looked, there were three, there were three school portions of your tax bill there used to be. There used to be common schools levy one, and I think it's, it might even say McCleary now. And then there's your local portion. So you see three wedges on your, on your, on your tax bill. We, schools are your largest portion of your property tax in, in Washington state. Paramount duty. It, is, it is true. It's, it is a paramount duty of the state constitution. We are a property tax state. We don't have income tax as a, you know, like other states do. So it is a predominant driver of our revenue and so, coupled with sales tax. Um, but to your point, Director Weaver, one of those three pieces of the pie are ours. That is a local, it'll say local, local school district or ISD, a school school district on your property tax bill. The other are common school levy ones that, you know, if, if you extrapolated our $43 billion of assessed valuation here in the district and multiplied it by the state tax rate, we are a donor to the rest of the state. So, you know, if, if we generate... 100 and, well, 160 million or 180 million in property taxes, you know, we're not getting that on our local levy side. Now, admittedly, we are getting some of that back in state apportionment, but those tax, those st state property taxes for the most part get spread across the whole state of Washington 
They get put into the state general fund and they're apportioned by the legislature. So I just think that's a really important distinction to make when people look at their property tax bills. Not all of that is going to Issaquah, although it is all going to schools. Correct. And so you actually went close to where I was going. So I don't know if there's any more on the EPO percentage, because my question goes on to the next page, which is kind of in the assessed value. Yeah. Oh, tax chart? Yeah, this one. Uh, projected tax rates. Like, 10, 12, 20. Yeah. Because I think, I think it's an important point to where Suzanne was just going, which is I, I do know that there was some reaction, as you just said, Jake, to the increase over time. But a good amount of that is being driven by the forecasted assessed values. Correct. And you made a comment. So I just want to go through exactly what that means. The, the 15, the preliminary, the 15.83, which is the big leap. Um, so if you go up in the chart, like I think we focused a lot into the bottom of this chart, but if you go up in the slide, hey, this go. is what I think is yeah. the part, the assessed value no, part. Yeah. This is where I think that we jumped down. <laughs> I was like, we're missing to me what's the important factor. So I'd love to understand is preliminary how how do you get that where does that number come from the 15.83 preliminary comes from the county king county assessor's office usually december-ish november-ish um i get an email from my friend hazel at king county uh, she was charged all the assessed values she'll give us uh and a she will give us a, a preliminary number saying this is a, the number without um any of rebates or challenge tax challenges, et cetera. And sometimes new construction can lag on the roll, but they like to give us a preliminary value because I don't know if the community knows that we levy blind. So when we, right. when we figure out your taxes and, and calculate a rate, Mr. Turney and myself don't know assessed valuation yet. So we, boy, we guess, and we, we try to guess well, but I, I do want the voters to know is that it is, a, and that's why on your ballot it says estimated. It doesn't say your tax rate shall be. So we really try, but again, look at the some of the sw swings we've had. Right. Um, so yeah, that number, Sydney, is likely only to increase. They should provide Perfect. final assessed valuation around around this time of year. It should, should come out any time. So so for me, this is this is a quintessentially important point that I think people are mixing, which is this concern. I understand there's a concern around assessed value and what that means. It has absolutely no connection to what we put in the package for schools, for this school system. And I think we're, we just continuously mix those up. Yeah. Yes, is it impactful? Am I gonna be thrilled when I see that 15.83 or greater in my? No, but I think we have a misnomer that somehow the, the items included in the levy package, to your point, it's, we're, we're doing this blind of what the actual assessed value will be. So I think coupled with your point, Suzanne, about the vast majority of that number on your tax bill doesn't come to us either. I think those are key points that we have to be super clear about. So when we jump down to the chart below and everybody gets excited about the jump, we really have to go back up and say, the county we live in is projecting a 15.83 increase. And we all have to wrap our heads around that separate from what's in the levy package. Right. And we are levying a fixed amount. So if your house suddenly doubles in value, that does not mean you pay double in taxes, it means in fact that your tax rate goes down, assuming that your house went up at the same percentage that everybody else's house went up. Right, and I think there's a key to that. Is that Hold on. There, sorry. We got an, another spare. <laughs> okay. Uh, the other key to that is not everyone in our districts, their assessed value doesn't all move together. Not everybody's <laughs> assessed value is going to change by the 15.83. Some people go up higher, some people don't change, and some people's property values can actually decrease. Other variable, a couple hundred million of that, I think 500 million in that growth was new construction. Right, so it spreads it out. So you, you have appreciation, um, and you, you've all seen our prospectus as we go out to sell bonds. One of our top taxpayers is Costco, and you know when they open up their new HQ, that is going to add significantly to the tax rolls. Unlike Swedish, which is tax exempt on the Hill. Um, Cause we thought initially we thought, but that's a large example, right? Of those massive uh, construction projects that come in. You're like, oh, that'll add to the tax base. And 
we will see that we've seen commercial development here in the district, but it, it's also additional tax base growth based on new construction. So it's not just appreciation. So, so, so I am hopeful that in the rest of this conversation, we can detach the contents of the levy and what they provide in the district from overall tax valuation and tax detail. That is not in our control and it is not part of what we're doing today. That is my hope. I realize it could be for naught. <laughs> and I just, I wanted to note two things. One, is that 15% jump or likely to be 16 practically at the rate it's at applies to the taxes you already agreed to two years ago. Oh, correct. Right. I mean, that's yes. another thing. Is that's not we're not asking you like like you're gonna you're gonna end up paying that anyway because you already agreed to it. Um, it it's in the book. Yeah. Uh, it, and right. also to note that in 2021, the assessor did their best during the pandemic to do tax relief by only raising the assessed value a third a, a point three. Yeah, yeah. thirty base thirty one basis points. Um, and so. So we're eating up. So that fifteen percent jump is really two years worth of growth that we've seen, and we know it's we know it's going to escalate even more. You can tell every time your neighbor sells a house. Mm -hmm. well, um, and so. and to that end, that is why if you see, uh, Mr. Turney and I try to be very transparent about the AV assumptions. You you see our two thousand seven to twenty one is at six and thirty nine basis points, and then we're at seven and twenty six on the ten year. So five percent has been a, was historically been a very conservative estimate on AV. Now, to that end, you do have anomalies because the assessor is a, it's a politically elected office. And so they do things like during the Great Recession, they ratchet down assessed valuation significantly instead of doing a three-year roll, they did a one-year cut. Or when it comes to COVID, you can see um, there was a lot of obviously uh, concern about housing and evictions and things of that nature during the pandemic period, at least the start. And so you can see they held those kind of constant. Which, right. which makes sense. It does. And from a political standpoint, not from a mathematical right. standpoint. Political. And, and you are projecting conservatively by doing the 5% AV growth over those next few years. And Correct. it's probably likely to come in higher. And if it does, that decreases the tax rate. If the assessed valuation comes in higher, it will decrease the rate, yes. And one thing that I used to have told voters for years is... Um, since we only levy a flat amount on the tax base, which is important. If you have a half million dollar home and we're levying $2,000, you're going to pay $4 a thousand. If it's the other way around and you've got a $400,000 home, you're going to pay five bucks a thousand. We're still generating $2,000 of taxes. So to that end, it doesn't. Right. We are not, and that's what often gets confused during the election cycle. We are not going to get any more in money if, you're, if your assessed valuation increases. Right, because we are putting out to our voters for this, these levies a fixed amount of money that we can collect, and the tax rate is calculated from that, not the driver of the amount of money that the district can collect. There, there are some taxing agencies that would levy a ma an amount, and we've discussed this over the years. So maybe I'm a, um, a county or a city, and I want to assess you at a dollar per thousand of all uh, real, real property value. So, but, but that's not the way we get. That is work. not the way we do it. We do, we do not do it that way. We do a we flat don't. amount, and then we um, estimate the per thousand rate because we levy blind, and then you will see the actual on your tax bill. And every year, I get calls from voters if I'm a high or low, one way or the other, um, which is fine. But uh, I will get calls around tax season, which is good. I did also want to specify that for the first time since before, I think I've been a citizen of Washington State, uh, at least the second time around, um, we did not go out for a bond during our four-year period. So we actually have bonds expiring, and rather than going out for a bond, we're doing a capital levy that will have that cost incurred over four years and not 20. So I think that's another thing to think about, and that might hit a tax rate higher because you're paying that money off in four years and not in 20. And so I think that that's another thing to consider is that we really are looking at those costs, what it's going to cost the taxpayer to pay for the things that are here, and what can we do to eliminate what would be a significant amount of interest by trying to get some of those capital projects over another long period, which I know we'll have a whole discussion about high school for in a moment, I'm sure. 
Where would you like to go next, Director right. Moore? So I'm going to ask the board, and I, I'm pretty sure Harlan, of course, had already dropped off of our um, Zoom. He was listening. Oh, he might actually still be listed there. So hopefully he's still able to be listening at this stage. I just knew at some point he was going to have to drop off. All right. So are there any other questions about the EPNO, additional teacher um, compensation responsibilities, the tax rate, um, Marnie? I, I think the last one is really, I think what I have heard around is, is enrollment projections. Oh, well, you're projecting these high enrollments. What if, um, not just what if they don't come in, but it's really around this uh, uh, enrollment stabilization. You're asking us to pay for kids and the state is looking like it's willing to give you money for kids that aren't in the system. And I think that's something I'd like to know some of your thoughts around that. I know I have my own, but I think that's the primary thing is why are we paying for students who aren't here? Here's what I believe, truthfully. Um, the ESSER formula that we were provided in the allocation, uh, and given that it was pushed through the Title I uh, formula at the federal level, only provided us a little less than $6 million. We have districts of our equivalent size that received 10 or 12 fold, um, even though we, a lot of us have the same base pandemic um, expenses. Now there's obviously expenses different depending upon your community that are going to vary depending on the income status. Granted, I don't know if it's 12 times as much. So there are very few districts around the state that had precipitous decline in enrollment and received few ESSER dollars. We would be one of those districts. Bellevue would be another one. And to an extent, there's some few floating around in Eastern Washington and Mercer Island. So to that end, I think that um, capturing revenue or gaining revenue that could be provided by the local voters to be able to continue to support us uh, as we move forward through the pandemic is, is, is essential. Um, we will continue to manage uh, the system up or down as we demonstrated as a body uh, last spring. You know, it was very, it's not very enjoyable to reduce budget. Um, so I would say, Marnie, yes, the legislature right now, there's two bills um, as it relates to levy in particular. And that the, the one in the Senate would extend the as if enrollment for levy, which is a very, uh, it's a concept with, if you recall, we had ghost money and base, ghost base, and we called it many different things under the old formula where we would increase the, the levy base because the state either has uh, failed to fund something or there was something unforeseen in the economy and it happened every time. This is, this is the new modern way to, to play around with the levy base. Let's just, let's just call that out, right? What it is, you, you are enhancing the levy base, allowing districts to potentially levy more uh, than the students they have received. So, which in this case, as we fight through the end of the pandemic, hopefully, um, th those are proceeds we can use. Now, remember the levy situation around the region is not, not equal either. Seattle's getting 3,500 bucks a kid. I have no idea why. Oh, I know why they had enough legislative votes to do it. But it doesn't mean that it's fair or equal. And so we, our neighbors all around us, since we, as you know, we fought for equal levy funding forever. And that equal levy funding, I think is still important to continue as we implement our seven period days and we move forward. Now you still have the ability not to collect that. Remember, this is all about authority and authorization. Right, and so you can still annually every year choose not to collect your full amount, which you've done before. So, I mean, I, I think some some folks um, get perturbed at ghost money, ghost ghost funding, etc. However, it is a mechanism just to stabilize your levy authority, because the other thing that could happen is those kids could come roaring back, and that's my biggest fear: is that we're left short-handed, high inflation, low levy. And then the kids return, and now we don't have the revenue to serve them. That's a train wreck. Um, but if they don't show up, then you don't collect the funds. And I think that's the key, too. I mean, for this calendar year, 
of Levy Collection 2022, the legislature gave us the authority to use the enrollment that we had in the 1920 school year if it was higher. And we did that, and that is helping us. What the legislature has before them now is additional bills that might authorize that for 22, might authorize it for 22 or 23. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, 23, 23 and 24. 24. Sorry, thank Senate you. Senate has 23. The House has two, two okay. years, 23, 24, which would, would span half the life of your current uh, levy request. Right. So there is the part of the reasoning for keeping our enrollment in the calculation for our levy collection for the EPNO with the 1920 enrollment so that we would have the capacity built into the levy to collect that. Then the, the next two years, 25 and 26, we have left it at that level because we have to anticipate that we might have real returning enrollment and be prepared for that. So that's kind of the, the collection of why it's at that level for the capacity into the levy. But again, the key thing is we only collect what is legally allowed, either through the enrollment stabilization that lets us collect at the enrollment of something like the 1920, or when that goes away, simply with the number of students that exist within our schools. It does provide a easier glide path downward, right? If, if we have to continue to make reductions, and that's the other reason that it's kind of, I think it's important to kind of feather it in on the finances. So if, if you just, you know, we lost 1,450 kiddos of enrollment. Um, and that has, we, st we still, are running a deficit. We have a 15 to 17 million, $17 million deficit currently. So we're in a deficit position. Um, I'd like to grow us out of that deficit position. And there's only a few ways to do that. That's either to reduce or increase revenue. And ideally like do both at the same time, a financial person would. But so it, it is important. And the, the, you are 100%, 110% correct if possible. We will not collect or not allowed under statute to collect that money unless it's allowed by the legislature in either the formula um, or the kids show up. Yeah, and I think this just got a little bit more complicated in terms of, because I was all prepared to explain to people that we're using these higher enrollment numbers to build capacity into the levy, True. because if the kids show up, we yep. need to be able to support them, but that in fact, the state limits us to 2,500 plus inflation, times the actual number of kiddos. That's my explanation. It's real clear. Now, the legislature is making this a little more complicated by creating, as you say, for lack of a better term, ghost enrollment. And normally I would say, well, that's a little squiffy, except that we are running a $17 million deficit and we are doing that because we had a pandemic and because we precipitously dropped enrollment. So, from that standpoint, I think these bills are doing exactly what they should do, which is saying you lost enrollment at, in a hurry. It wasn't your fault. And we want to make that transition smoother for you. And, and again, because we're running a deficit, I think it's really important. I am okay with collecting levy on kids who aren't there, but should be. Uh, I mean, when we were- For the well, first year or two. When Martin and I looked at the model and we looked at it all different ways, a few things that when we're building out four years, a lot can happen in four years. I mean, you've seen our four-year measures before. Sometimes we're, we have a huge amount of what used to be called rollback or we were short and, and we weren't up at statutory authority. Two things that scare me in the, in the or unknown, the inflation is the biggest driver for me. Uh, is, this, is this inflationary environment going to last for 12, 24, or 36 months? And inflation is going to compound. So if we get seven and a half now in the CPI and it's going to compound later. So the model is, was we froze enrollment. There was, again, I, we did not project gr enrollment growth in the model. It's frozen in 1920 levels where the statute had frozen it. Um, so I, I think if you don't build yourself some capacity, and there's not a lot, if you notice that when we calculate it, there is not a lot of slack when it comes to what I believe the statutory capacity is in the collection. So enrollment and then the inflation, Suzanne, as you know, it, it, it's the real wild card for all, all of us. I mean, there, there, there was a time in this country where we ran double digit inflation, and that was not too long ago. So 
that is the biggest driver for me is if you have high inflation and the kids return, and as we talked about this, you have to be able to, Ron and I talk about it as a hedge, but it's, it's a little more uh, educated guess than a hedge in this case. It, 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 it will hopefully help you have stable financial uh, picture going forward. So we don't want to sit here three years from now and go, What's that superintendent thing? Yeah, they made the decision to uh, shortchange us going forward. Yeah. Looks like uh, Marnie has a question and Sue. But I know Marnie's had her hand up first. <laughs> and then we'll give this a few more minutes so we can keep going. And then our meeting does start at six. And then, of course, this conversation will continue um, during the meeting as well. So, mine, I'm, I'm probably going to complicate things with my next question. So I apologize. But so if we are getting revenue from the state and also, or at least within our levy as well, um, the capacity for staffing of a 20,000 student system. Are we running a staffing of a 20,000 student system? Or so if we were to not be able to collect for the 2019 numbers, what would that look like to our staffing cuts? Because my I have two concerns. One is if it doesn't, happen, am I looking at staffing cuts related to that? Or two, are we using these 2019 numbers, but we're really staffing at 18,500 kids. And then if more come, we're gonna need more staff and we're gonna be extended beyond what we can afford. I know, I knew it wasn't no, no, gonna that, be an that's easy fine. one. Um, so, What's the math on 18.5 versus 28.70? Sorry. So let's just say that's 2,300 kids, right? Yeah, or 19.3, sorry. Yeah. Give me too low, Marnie. 18.5, I'm like, that's a lot more less kids than I have. Um, so you'd be looking at approximately $6 million then if it, if it swung down. get out of the legislature when we got some of that ESSER stabilization we got a few more million dollars then we were able to um, immediately call back a lot of those positions so I would say Marnie yes if none of these dollars came we would have to reduce more we'd have to we, we came with that idea last year we, we kind of got half bailed out right at the end of the, and it was a long session, you'll recall last year too. This session is scheduled to end on, I believe, March 10th. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So at least in that way, I think we're gonna have more certainty out of what the legislature is gonna actually do. Um, so that that could help us. But we we have to also remember, neither of those bills might pass out either. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no guarantees there. I mean, I'm, I'm glad to see they're making their way through the sausage factory down in Olympia, but they're not, over the line yet. Oh, right. Correct. So all we know right now is what we've staffed for this year. But until the legislature finishes, we know if these bills pass that might allow us to collect our 23, 2023 or 2024 levy at the enrollment of our 1920 school year. So that, that will help us as we plan and move forward, whether we have that funding that would then taper off in the latter two years, or we have to react to it right now and the funding is just what it is. Correct. And we will have to, again, kind of right size to that. Yeah. And I, oh, okay. yes. I have like, my, my question is, we are being funded as if we were still at our 2019 student level. Is the system operating at that level no. as no. far as staffing? No. Or we've we, already reduced We are staffing? being, uh, well, if we had the authority in 2022, we would have been funded at 1920 levy levels or in enrollment levels. So remember, we're, we're, we have authority in 2057, right? But are we making, just to add to your question though, are you talking about- I, I wanna know, so funding, we're being- Is the state all, all funding of it, us, all of it. the levy, is the state funding at the 1920 student number? So, uh, so we're getting state funding- no, at, I'm asking, that's the point. Are we getting state funding at the 2019 levels? No. Okay, that was probably something that I thought we. So we, what we what we did get is we got about what thirteen million in one time hold harmless money. 
So remember, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't cover our deficit transportation. We got two and a half, three million dollars there. We got 10, 12 million in enrollment hold harmless, I believe. But that was one time money, and that is not the full boat. Well, if if it all those kids had ran through the full apportionment model, that is not we would we would have received much more than that. So if we had not lost students, we would be way way deeper in the hole right now than we currently are. No, I believe we would have continued to generate the revenue. And we the may state would have given us the revenue for those kids Correct. enough that Correct. our levies. The differences there wouldn't have yeah. been a. I think the main problem. takeaway is you're operating in a deficit now, of 15 million. When we we adopted a budget, we knew we were in deficit position. Any additional revenue from here on out is going to cover that deficit, or have to be. Uh, there's only what there's only two ways to cover a deficit: increase revenue or decrease expenses. So that means you either uh, continue to winnow down staff. Now we'll say our, our classroom staff are appropriately ratioed. I'm not going to get into class sizes um, at the moment, but they're appropriately ratioed, at least in our historic ratios. It's, it would be the staffing outside of the classroom um, that we still would need to adjust um, above and beyond formula. So I know it's not a bright picture, but if you already have a structural deficit and you have some additional revenue, you're going to try to cover that deficit or you're going to have to do uh, reduction in labor. Those are your main drivers. Both not really awesome things, I, I understand, but that's how I think of it anyway. We, we're already 15 million in the hole. So anything we can do to get out of the hole and move forward and then hopefully resource the rest of the system in a way that uh, the community and the board expected to be resourced. Okay, I know it does look like there are more questions, but we're almost at our time to start the regular board meeting. So I would propose we just take a five minute break so we can move ourselves over. And then we can continue this conversation. And some of this may end up just, we may ask you some of the same questions again while we're um, up during our board meeting. So don't be surprised about that, but that way we can continue this discussion and to the high school enrollment, we might talk about that more during the um, capital levy that we didn't really talk about during this time. So um, we'll still cover any questions that people have as we go into the regular meeting, okay? All right, so I'm gonna turn this part of it off and we'll head over there.
All right, I'd like to call to order this meeting of the Issaquah School Board. Today is Thursday, February 10th. And um, we have just completed a work study on our levy. And we are now going to do our Pledge of Allegiance. And we'll go from there. So if you'd all please stand and join me in the pledge. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. All right. Like I had indicated, uh, the board just had a uh, about one hour work study on our levy proposals that we will also be discussing um, later in our meeting, their agenda items. Um, Director Gallinger is not up here with us. He was able to join us over the Zoom for probably half to three quarters of our work study session. He had a work issue come up and so he will be joining us as soon as he can. Um, and so that's why he's not here for this moment. Uh, at this point, we are ready to go into student input. So if our students are in the Zoom, we have three students from Gibson Eck High School. I have Sherayu, uh, Anna, Anna, and Joe. If we have any of the three of you, you can go ahead and turn on your video and unmute yourself. All right, here we go. We're getting one of them. Hello. I'm not entirely sure, but one of us had to cancel and one of us might have left, might have not because they have are busy. Oh, look, so, we have two of you. Excellent. Oh, All yay. right. Well, that's okay. We'll take the two uh, out of the three of you. That's great. So we'll go ahead and let you go uh, give your input. Um, hi, members of the board. Um, as always, thank you for putting aside time to listen to us and hear our voices um, at, at Gibson Eck. Um, it, it's a huge part of, part of our learning to engage and better our community as we are trying to bring in change for the better. Often in traditional schools, uh, math instruction tends to focus on how to do equations and get the right answer, as opposed to how the math works and how it can be applied in real life. Students are rarely given opportunities to apply math in their daily lives and instead given tests and worksheets, which although useful for some things are ultimately unhelpful for the application of math. At Gibson Eck, we use competencies that are uh, set up to help students apply math and science into the independent projects that they are working on and in and the things that they are passionate about whether that is painting coding or cooking many students at gibson Eck are taking math and science to ensure that math is not only learned but applied um, for example one student linda king uh, surveyed the student body to find out how they feel um, about our current system and what they need in doing so she has found out that um, roughly 51 percent of students feel that math is an important part of their education and career goals and more than 50% say that our current system is actively lowering their confidence in their ability to do math. Linda is working to make more comprehensible and less frustrating for all our students. Um, she is collaborating with a company called Brilliant and to provide students with tools that they need to learn math in a way that's engaging and applicable to their interests. Other students like Abigail Smith are working uh, with the uh, students in the tech space to turn plastic water bottles that would otherwise be thrown away into usable 3D filament from our, our for our 3D filters. Uh, the this has meant uh, meant determining uh, meant determining the volume of recycled materials produced, the size of plastic particles that can be put into the grinder, as well as the quality of filament. The filament can be used for 3D modeling uh, and, print, uh, and printed items, from jewelry to pencil holders. In the science space, Jace uh, is working to expand our aquaponics system. Other students are learning to use advanced science and engineering while learning about things like the nitrogen cycle, pollutants, invasive species, uh, and invasive species in the process. These are just some examples of the amazing work being done by our students. We 
We're appreciative, appreciate all of our amazing staff at Gibson Eck for continuing to offer student support and encouragement as our students continue to grow and change. Of course, this would not be possible without your continuing support of our model, our staff, and all of our students. Thank you from all of us from Gibson Eck. Oh, thank you. We appreciate that. Um, that's, that's okay. Um, we do, we appreciate your input and um, we are very supportive of our uh, Gibson Eck High School. It's funny, it is one of those things that has uh, levy dollars in it that we talk about as part of our um, levy proposal. But thank you to both of you for sharing. Um, you're welcome to stay throughout our meeting and you're welcome to join in in the conversation at any point. You don't have to keep your video on now, but if you did want to um, join in during any of our agenda items, just raise your hand and somebody will help me see it or turn on your video um, and then I'll be able to know uh, and call on you so you can join in with the board. But I know you guys can't necessarily stay on for our entire meeting, so we understand that. All right. Well, thank you both very much. I appreciate it. All right. We are on to public input. Uh, this agenda item is for community input on items not on the board's regular agenda. If you have input relating to a specific agenda item, please hold your comments until I request input during that particular item. I know I do have somebody signed up for the levy and just wanted them to understand that I'll call on them during the levy time. And so, um, oh, so as a rule, the board will not respond to public input. It is an opportunity for you to give input to the board. I ask that you clearly state your name and school attendance area. Limit your comments to two minutes and we'll be using a timer and you will see the timer um, buzz when your time is up. Um, the board neither endorses nor censors any opinions expressed in public input. Uh, please keep all comments civil and respectful. Uh, no comments or applause from the audience. Please feel free to wave your hands to show support of a speaker. And we will go ahead and get started. So up first is Gordon. And if you'd go to the microphone there, and then as I said, state your name and attendance area. And we have the time. Uh, you can, yes, please leave it on. Yeah, let's make sure the microphone's on. Hi, uh, my name is Gordon and my child's in the Maywood Mill School area up in the Renton Islands. And so uh, I am a homo sapien. Um, that's how I identify. And I am um, here to comment on the February 15th meeting for input regarding superintendent search. And so the meeting is specifically says, the title on the webpage says, meeting for parents, guardians of color. And I'm here to say that I am deeply offended that you used the word color, and I am deeply offended that that got past any web censors. Um, it is discrimination to say that there is a specific meeting for um, people of color, or you could have used something else. I believe people of color is the politically correct term to use, but to use that is really in poor is poor and discriminatory. So can a white person not go to this meeting? Your uh, spokesperson has uh, responded to the uh, Rants article in the Seattle Times and said, no, it's not. But when you ask people to look and you read the title of this, um, this meeting, it is self-selecting. And so that is really um, unfortunate that in this day and age, we're still you're segregating and you're saying, hey, only these people come to this one. Or so I don't know if this one, if you're going to have interpreters or not for people of that uh, English is not their uh, first language. But I would really ask that you will remove that term for the meeting. So just let it be open for anyone so that whoever reads this on your web page would say it is uh, open for anyone. Uh, yes, thank you. thank you for those who respect our um, our meeting and shake the hands. Um, as I said, it's, it's not really a dialogue, it is input, but I do want to say a few words. Um, I'm sorry for anybody who feels that that was an indication of segregation. 
Um, it was really an intent from the board to be able to hear from uh, our historically marginalized families. We wanted to be able to have an environment where they could share freely and honestly and feel vulnerable. And so we have heard from those families before, and we understand that sometimes the environment isn't comfortable. So having them surrounded by other people similar to them makes it easier. So our intent was to create a more welcoming an environment and to be more inclusive versus to exclude anyone. Um, we did change our language on the wording. We listened to some people that have given us feedback. All of the meetings are open to any families to attend. And we invite you to either attend one or more of the focus group meetings or fill out the survey. But our intent is to be expansive and inclusive. So I will go ahead and select the next person. And this is Peter McDonald-Dougal. Uh, thank you. And if you'll come up and give your uh, name and attendance area. I'm Peter McDougall and my attendance area is Issaquah High School. Uh, I am here to object to the wording of this email that was sent to my family uh, about this meeting that's coming up for the selection process of the superintendent. Um, the, the thought process that goes into putting the word color in it and where we're supposed to self-select based on how we look, which meeting we would go to and attend, I think is just absurd. Uh, offensive and probably illegal. Uh, I, I dusted off the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, I didn't read the whole thing, but I didn't have to. The language is in there. Uh, that's against the Civil Rights Act, what you did, or whoever wrote that email or structured those. Um, and if that's not enough, Washington State has its own civil rights legislation. Uh, just if you need more, support it. The wording is quite clear. Um, and I would say, you know, I, I get wanting to be inclusive and all that. If you're wondering how to structure these meetings so that you're inclusive, first and last, consult the Civil Rights Act. Uh, that'll prevent any of this problem that's going on. Um, I, I'm fully aware that the community, you know, can have different opinions, but I think overall, uh, this inclusive and educated community of Issaquah that I live in resoundingly rejects this type of language and this type of tone and tenor how do I know that? No one that ran for re-election this year, when I had your campaign materials, would ever put anything like this into your campaign materials. You would not be re-elected or elected. If you say we're gonna segregate meetings based on how you look, you wouldn't even get past the ballot. I mean, come on, this has to stop. Thank you for your input. Next up is Wendy Giora. Board members and superintendent, we are all here because we care about this school district and its community. Let me begin with a few definitions. Racism, prejudice or discrimination directed against a person or people based on their membership in a particular racial or ethnic group. Discrimination, the practice of unfairly treating a person or group differently from other people or groups of people. The law prohibits discrimination per the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Likewise, separate but equal meetings are also illegal, Plessy versus Ferguson. Oh, yeah. Recently, I was almost elected to this school board. When I received the Issaquah E-News promoting a separate meeting for parents of color and parents of students of color, I breathed a sigh of relief that I was not a part of this school board. I would not want anyone to think I could be part of such a blatant discrimination. By holding a separate meeting for people of color, it is the same as saying people of color are not welcome to attend the other meetings. So we have created a separate one just for them. We are an integrated community, all wanting the same thing, to hire the person best qualified for the job as superintendent, the one who will care about raising up all of our students. Why are you trying to divide and separate us by color? Really, is this the example you want to set for our students? Shame on all of you. 
per the law, Keller should have no part in selecting our new superintendent or any decision made by this board. Thank you. Theme going on here. <laughs> Superintendent, just want to thank you for your service. Get your name into oh, the so microphone is, so we have it in the record. My name is Swen Nader, and thank I live you. in Issaquah. I'm uh, the husband of Wendy Gila. So, thank you so much for your really hard work, great work. This for school board. My name is Swen Nader, and I live in Issaquah. I've worked at Costco headquarters for over 26 years. And my wife, Wendy, ran for school board last year. I read that ISD is hosting meetings with parents to discuss the hiring of a new superintendent. I think it's wonderful that you are seeking parent input. However, I read we, are, we will also provide an additional meeting for parents and guardians of color and parents and guardians uh, with students of color on February 15th, two days before the meetings with parents and guardians. A local radio show heard about this and asked, Alicia Engels, ISD spokesman, why the segregated meetings? Alicia replied, all parents are welcome to attend any of the four parent meetings. They are not segregated. But Ms. Engels' words do not match the heading of the February 15th meeting, which implies the meeting is reserved for parents of color. And because the ISD did not provide a rationale for this meeting, we are left to make our own conclusions. And I'm not even going to go there. Now, you may say that that's not the intent, but we all know appearance is everything. In fact, it has been said appearance is truth. John Wooden, my college basketball coach and one of the greatest teachers of, of our time, when asked about teaching, often quoted this anonymous poem. No written word, no spoken plea can teach our youth what they should be, nor all the books on all the shelves. It's what the teachers are themselves. Thank you for your input. But you know, I'm children going, learn by me, watching please. what the adults Everybody do. Everybody else has respected what the they two are minute learning timer. By watching you, this ends up. You Sven, try to please, justify. please respect so please the two minute timer. Thank be be responsible responsible you very much for your input. I'm going to call the next person that the to the children microphone. Children are watching you, and you're setting your example of segregation. The next person to be that. called up is Tanya Goodman. My name is Tanya Goodman, Creekside Elementary. Please excuse the hat and the sunglasses. They are medical necessities, not a fashion statement. Over these long months, you've heard a lot about masks, vaccines, funding, and other nuanced comments. On January 24th, each of you received my public disclosure request, which contained the following. Requests for all the documentation, warning labels, manufacturer information, proof of informed consent, proof of FDA authorization, ingredients, and double-blind placebo tests for efficacy of every vaccine product that the state mandated the teachers to have in order to be employed. Requests for all the isolation tests as they met the Fry and Daubert standards in Washington state. Requests for a copy of the governor's emergency proclamation with the governor's seal on it. Good luck finding that one. No one's seen it yet. Requests for all funding sources. All communications from anyone who promised funds or threatened to withhold funds, all communication from any entity with regard to COVID mandates. In the records request, it contained a list of 10 laws that the schools are breaking, federal and state, and a request for proof of any statute that overrides those laws. This is a brief summary of my request. My sentiment is shared by others. Yesterday, y'all received a beautifully uh, cheerful package that was full of the same requests from others in our community grandparents, parents, and concerned citizens for children. <clears throat> I took a beating in an accident, hence the medical attire I mentioned. It is extremely painful for me to be here and comment, extremely. But like many parents, we have to draw a line at some point Oh, how much is gonna to be tolerated. When my little guy cannot lift his mask to take a drink of water in the classroom, 
because the sweet teacher is so scared and wants to control the spread, we've got some problems. I see the timer's about to go off here. So I will say this, as physically painful for me as it is, I will remain present, pleasant, and committed to working collaboratively. Thank you very much for your input. All right, I have one more name here in the room or two. And then I see there are four names on the Zoom. And so I've captured those names. So I'm going to finish up with the two that are in here in the room. And then I'm going to go to the four that I have captured on Zoom. And then we'll close up our public comments and move on to our next agenda item. So next up is Mark Bowers. Good evening, board members. Thank you for the opportunity to present before you today. It would be helpful if you started by stating your name and attendance area. It sure. just helps to put it into the record. I'm Mark Bowers uh, from the Issaquah School District. Um, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to speak, and I will try to keep my comments within the two-minute range. Um, my concern is about the curriculum in this school district. Um, Issaquah is a vibrant and diverse community. We're a generous and affluent community. We are capable of great impact locally and on the world stage. In order to prepare our children for success in today's challenging world, we must prepare them to be confident and self-reliant. Our curriculum must emphasize the values common to all Americans, the values that equip them to compete in a challenging world. Uh, we must refocus uh, on the trades and the professions. This requires curriculum that encourages unity, not division. How all function together. Our students must be trained in practical and useful skills like balancing a checkbook, how to vote, how to prepare for the workplace. We need to focus on the things that make America great, and we are great. Our unabridged history, social studies, civics, math, and science are the things that we should keep our focus sharply on. In other words, we must refocus on matters that unite us and prepare us to work together and succeed in the local, state, national, and global levels. <clears throat> As a 12-year Issaquah school parent, I do not feel my daughter was prepared to compete on the world stage. However, she went on to uh, gain an athletic scholarship, a four-year degree at the University of Hawaii. I ask that you take these matters into consideration as you guide our curriculum. Thank you very much for your input. Thank I appreciate you. it. All right, our last one in the room. Oh, let's see. Barbara Holly. And is this on an item not on the agenda? Uh, it, uh, it, is it related to the levies? No, okay, then go ahead. Probably it's not related to an agenda item. And at the beginning, state your name and attendance area, and there's a two minute timer. My name is Barbara Holly. I live in Issaquah School District. I'm a mother and a grandmother of children that are in this district. On February 7th, I was shocked to read in your ISD bulletin that you announced a separate meeting regarding the selection of a new superintendent for parents of children of color and parents of color. Absolutely shocked. I don't think you're familiar with RCW 4960030. You should read it carefully. Freedom from Discrimination Declaration of Civil Rights. It's a valuable thing for children to learn and clearly the board members. I don't know which one of you proposed such a meeting, but none of you stood up to say, I don't think that's a good idea. The right to be free from discrimination because of race, creed, color, national origin, citizenship, or immigration status, sex, honorably discharged, veteran or military status, sexual orientation, or the presence of any sensory, mental, physical disability, or the use of a trained dog guide or service animal by a person with a disability is recognized and is and declared to be a civil right. You have, by putting that in your bulletin, you have 
<laughs> you're not compliant with state school policy, state law, federal law against discrimination. I can't for the life of me understand that you would have done such a thing. In all my years of living in Issaquah, of over 45 years, I've never seen anything like this in my entire life. We do not raise children to recognize color. We raise children to recognize the character and the content of your soul and your character. Every one of us as parents tries to raise responsible children. And yet you put something like this in here and you do not teach those values to children in the schoolroom, along with the basic mathematics, language, history, then right. you are definitely Thank you very failing. much for your input. I appreciate it. And that's the ones, yep, do the hands. Thanks folks. All right, I have four people who are on our Zoom. And once we finish with those four, we're gonna continue with our agenda. So first up on our Zoom, is Courtney Eldridge. And if you would turn on your video and your microphone just during this part, and again, for you, to, you, you on Zoom, please make sure you state your name in attendance area. I know sometimes the name on Zoom isn't quite right. So I don't know, Stephen, if they need help getting- Yeah, it's, oh, I don't almost. know if you can hear me, but it's not it's letting me uh, start the video. <laughs> Actually, it's hard to hear her if you can. Yeah, I don't know if there's anything we can do to have a little more volume. Oh, there we go. Um, okay. Can you hear we me okay now? Okay. You can go ahead and give your input. Okay. So there's actually two of us. Um, my son is um, going to speak first, um, and then I'm going to speak. Is that okay? Well, sh um, sure. You have two minutes. So he has two minutes, and I have two minutes? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. So okay. <laughs> we'll start with one of you and okay. speak and you have two Perfect. minutes and then yeah. we'll go ahead and start a new timer when yeah. the second person speaks. Perfect. Sounds good. Okay. Caden, All so right. gonna... My name is Caden Eldridge. I am an eighth grader at Isquam Middle School. Thank you for allowing me the time to address the school board. I'm worried about the safety of my fellow students about at Isquam Middle School. In the fall, all of us just came out of quarantine and we didn't really remember our rules and expectations, but we are expected to know all of these things right off the bat. We did not. I think a small percent of students chose to do things they knew they shouldn't do and wouldn't have done before a year of quarantine. I think the problem was after students began doing these things, they realized there wasn't any punishment, which made things worse. An example of this is at IMS right now, every single girl's bathroom is closed because some of the female student body at IMS were skipping class and vandalizing the bathrooms with minimal punishment. We have a lot more fights at school and sometimes good kids get pulled into the fights. Last week, a girl pulled a knife out of her backpack and attempted to attack another student. I don't know if we need more adults or stricter punishments, but I'm asking you to help me and my fellow students. Thank you for your input. We appreciate hearing from you. All right, Courtney. Thanks, guys. Um, my name is Courtney Eldridge, obviously. I'm a mother of four boys, two currently attend ISD schools, one's graduate of Isquah High. I serve as the Isquah Middle PTSA president, um, and it's my role in this position to advocate for every student to reach their full potential supporting staff, students, and families. And so today I am here advocating for IMS. The IMS feeder pattern has a higher than average at risk population. And in September, Issaquah Middle School was identified by the school board as being a school with a significant need in need of additional resources or FTE. In the fall, the IMS students returned to socialization and sports and extracurriculars and teachers actually attached to bodies. Um, IMS students also returned um, emotionally unsettled and unable to conform to normally accepted behavior larger than normal classroom sizes. At IMS, core class average is about 32 students and many are at 36. They have new anxieties, technology addictions, and woefully inadequate social emotional supports. Small incidents escalate quickly because students can no longer emotionally regulate to resolve basic conflicts. Staff will return to twice as much standardized testing to measure learning loss and repeated reassurances from ISD that everything is back to normal, while witnessing behaviors from students that are anything but normal. The lift, as they say, has been heavy and is simply getting heavier with a severe lack of staffing. A student misbehavior is now labeled a forgotten learning behavior that needs to be reinforced. Who then supports, reteaches, and reinforces these forgotten learning behaviors? I would encourage each of you to please look into the data of the other middle schools in ISD because I don't believe IMS is alone in our concerns. Here are some statistics from IMS. 
We have one principal, one assistant principal, who's also a COVID supervisor, two counselors, and one Swedish counselor for referrals. IMS has 810 students. 75 students are on 504 plans, but this number continues to rise substantially this year as students are rapidly being diagnosed with anxiety and depression. Thank you, Courtney, uh, for your input. We appreciate hearing about IMS. Next up is Catherine Stuckel. I might be saying the last name wrong, but if you could go ahead and turn on your video and audio. Thank you. Hi. Can you hear me okay? We can. Go ahead and state your, well, state your name so you put it into the record and we'll go from there. Hi, my name is Catherine Stickle. I live in the Issaquah School District. My husband's son and I moved to Issaquah in 1998 after researching the area's best districts for inclusiveness, especially for children with disabilities. My son exited Issaquah School District nine years ago. However, after receiving the Issaquah School District's email about the February 15th parent input meeting for the new superintendent, I must speak out. I am both saddened and angered that this once excellent school district has shrunk so low from where they were. Segregation was outlawed in the 1960s, segregating parent meetings by the color of their skin to give input on a new superintendent is the ultimate form of segregation and discrimination. It is wrong, bottom line. If you do not cancel this February 15th meeting, then any, every one of you will be held accountable for the damage caused by embracing racism and holding segregated meetings for parents based on the color of their skin and the color of their children's. Shame on you. You are creating divisiveness amongst the great community of parents in our district. And what kind of a message do you think you are sending to our community? And even more importantly, what kind of an example are you setting and teaching the children? That they too shall be divided because of the color of their skin or other differences because you're segregating their parents based on that? Don't you believe we all as a whole entire community want the best qualified person for the job of the superintendent of the district? I do. Can you see anything positive to be gained as a result of trying to separate and divide parents? I can't. I am requesting that you cancel the February 15th meeting and hold meetings only for the entire community, not separate factions of it. I'm also calling on all the mom and papa bears up the, out there, parents, to rise up against the school board's brazen act of racism and segregation. And remember this the next time they vote for school board members. Thank, Thank you, you very much time. for your input. Folks, yeah, just go with the wave of the hands. That would help us move our meeting along. Next up is um, John iPhone. So if John comes on to make sure he states it, there we go, name and attendance area. Hi, my name is John <laughs> Whipple and my son attends Endeavor Elementary School. And um, I, I came to also show support against the meeting with segregation. Um, I found it very concerning. I've never attended any meeting like this in the past and never thought I would, but I felt I had to speak out. Um, I hope you'll reconsider, and I, I'm really heartened to see other other people in our community speaking out against this. I, I, I applaud them. Um, it, it, it's not okay to separate people based on race. Thank you. Thank you for your input. And then last up uh, on the Zoom is Santa Mingo. I know that's not your your. It's 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 Christy Santa Domingo. Thank you. <laughs> Yes. Okay. So um, give me a second. So hi, I'm Christy Santa Domingo. I'm an IMS science teacher, equity lead at my school, seventh grade team leader, and a parent of two kids at Beaver Lake Middle School. And I'm speaking today to advocate for more supports for IMS in the form of a 1.0 FT PBSES person, an additional counselor, an additional admin. Um, I love my um, admin, they're amazing, but I don't know if I would say their workload is sustainable at this time, but that's my personal opinion. Um, I have been hearing for seven years that IMS has more need than other middle schools. This is not a new thing. This year, that means that we have a 0.5 PBS, yes, FTE, two counselors, two admin, just like all the other middle schools. But I'd like you to please consider the equity in that. Um, we would like what we need in order for our student population to th thrive. So for example, according to the King County Housing Authority, there are four link low income housing in Issaquah, three of these four feed into IMS. 
As compared to other middle schools, I've been informed we have the highest number of IEPs with a third of these students on behavior intervention plans. And finally, please compare the mobility rates. That's the number of students who come and go. Um, last month alone in January, we had 18 new students, many of these coming from many schools in their life, which could indicate instability. And we wanna be there for our students. Mental health is a priority. And please give us the resources we need so that we can be the amazing school community that we can be. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much for your input. I think that got through everybody on my list. And again, to the item in our e-news about our uh, focus groups related to our superintendent search, all the parent meetings are open to anyone that would like to attend any of them. Again, our effort was to make a inviting uh, meeting environment for our historically marginalized families who we have heard from and have sometimes found it challenging to share in these environments. So again, meetings are open to all families and you're able to attend any of them. All right, then we are going to move on with our meeting agenda and we are now at the approval of our consent agenda. I move the consent agenda be approved as presented. Second. All right, our consent agenda is a meeting management tool. The board has reviewed all the items within of the consent agenda and we've had it for days to review. And so this is an opportunity for us to re uh, review, approve all the items all in one fell swoop. So all those in favor of approval of the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, so the consent agenda is approved. Thank and that you. is done. All right. So. Uh, we established the regular agenda. Do you have any changes not related to the rescheduling because Harlan's not here yet? I do not. Okay. <laughs> so because Harlan is still working his way to our meeting, we're going to make a few adjustments in an effort to um, have this, the um, items related to the levies um, pushed down a little bit in our agenda so he has a chance to get here. So bear with us as we move around a little bit differently. Um, we're going to go ahead, do the summary of the work study, which will be very short, report out on the legislative conference. And then I would like us to go ahead and do the superintendent search update and then um, monitoring of EL-16. Oh, all right. So sorry, I'm looking at my phone, but Harlan has logged back on and is in a listen only mode until he arrives. So we're going to still continue with where I had said we're going to reschedule a little bit until Harlan gets here and we'll go right to those levy items. All right, having said that, Diane, you'll just have to keep track of the order if that's important to you. <laughs> All right, so the first item up is the summary of the work study. In general, it's an, a topic that's not on our agenda and we go through a bit of a summary of it, but since it is related to our levies, I think we should just talk about the levies all at once again when we get to that item. So we'll finish with this one. All right, next up, is a report out on the legislative conference. The legislative conference was, what was it? Sunday, January 31st-ish date? 30th, 30th yeah. thank you. Um, and it was a, a virtual conference held by a combination of WASA, which is the Washington State School Directors Association, which is association all the um, school directors are in, WASA, which is the Washington Association of Superintendents, School Administrators, School Administrators thank you. And then WASBO, which has to do with the business office. Yeah. So the three together had a um, legislative conference. It gave us an opportunity to hear from the folks in all three of the organizations related to works that are going on right now with our legislators. And so this will be a chance for us to share out. Um, I think only a few of us uh, were able to attend, but for those that would uh, that did attend, we can share out. I did have a page I wanted to share, and let's see if I can get it up as my part of the um, report out. On it. Give me one second while I try to bring it up because I just find it fascinating, and it kind of leads into our um, levy discussion. The way the state funds for our counselors our um, uh, psychologists and such. And so hold on, I'm almost there. I know I had it open to the page and then I lost it. Okay, I've got it. So I'm gonna try to share. Let's see. 
share screen. This one. I don't think that's it. That's my opinion. <laughs> All right. Steven, I'm sharing. It... Okay, there I'm sharing. All right. So to me, uh, so TJ Kelly, I think was his name from OSPI, went through and was talking about um, budgeting and funding. And this is the one that always gets me. So the school level staffing related to school nurses, take for example. So at a high school level, it takes 6,250 students to get one nurse. That's all of our high school students. So that's for all of our high schools, the state funds one nurse. And then for the middle school, it takes 7,200 students, which is more than we have in all of our middle schools, if I'm right. And so we don't even get one whole nurse for all six of our middle schools. And then at the elementary level, uh, 5,263 students, and we probably have just over that. So maybe we get one and a, a quarter nurses. So, okay, oh, double that amount. So that's two nurses, right? So now we're at maybe three and a quarter or even less, less than three nurses. And that just is amazing to me. And if you look at it, you know, related to social workers, psychologists, counselors, you know, this just partly drives some of the needs we have to provide these resources ourselves through our levies. But anyway, that was my big um, aha moment I wanted to share because it's just so frustrating that that is the level of funding that we get out of our um, state. And Jake just told me we have 3.19 nurses that are paid for by the state. And yet I believe we have a nurse in almost every school, yeah. a nurse in every school. And so all of that Which comes is 20, just to do the math. <laughs> yes. 26 nurses. You, I can't tell. Excuse me. Yeah, there is. Uh, I believe that's around the number, Director Mulling. Some of them are part time. Yeah. So the, the number is a little greater than the FTE. So you might have two bodies that cover right. one yes. position. So but still, you're but 26 right. We have 26 FOE. schools. The vast majority are funded out of our local levies. Yes. Yeah. So that's all right. So now I will open it up for anybody else that would like to share, and I'll stop sharing my little screen. Well, I can talk a little bit. They uh, had a number of legislators come in and speak with us, or actually they seem to be sort of tape recorded interviews. Uh, Senator Wellman, Senator Hawkins, uh, Representative Tamiko Santos, Representative Ibarra. Um, and they talked a lot, um, actually to build on a theme, they talked a lot about how the legislature was looking at potentially giving districts more funding for counselors and for nurses and for mental health people. So um, that was encouraging. Now we have to see if they will um, really follow through with that. There was some discussion about um, ESSER funds and the way that those were allocated. Senator Wellman um, pointed out that there was an issue with that, which was appropriate since many of the impacted districts are in her district. Um, and then, uh, Oh, I guess it was in the hot topics conversation, which wasn't um, the legislators. Somebody pointed out that um, many legislators think that districts are flush with federal dollars. That's a quote. And uh, therefore, if we don't need any more and we don't need um, hold harmless on enrollment and other things because we are so flush with those levy dollars. But they did point out that you can't hire staff with one time dollars because you get the, even the districts who got as a lot of ESSER money, you get it once. That doesn't mean you can have a person from year to year to year. So the better solution would be for them to fund more counselors and more mental health and whatever. Exactly. And I'll throw it to Marty because I think you were there as well. Yeah. I was, I was also at, um, I think it was three of the legislator meetings that happened throughout the week. So we didn't have legislation day, we had legislation week. Um, and many of those conversations were around those items as well. So it was interesting how uh, much of the priorities that WASDA, WASA and WASBO had very much aligned with some of the work that the district is doing. And I think it's because, frankly, because of the advocacy work of East King County schools um, that have been focused in on that. And we've been talking about that with our legislators, we've been meeting 
uh, with them periodically throughout the year so that um, some of these are no surprises. Um, I think that some of that work is, is important around um, what the ESSER dollars are, uh, having co those conversations, giving them information from us was really important. So I'd like to thank staff that shared. I, th I think we still would we'd like an updated one, but I at least had data saying that last, at least for the 2000, um, 2001, 2002 school year and part of 2000 when the epidemic hit, we lost revenues and, and then had expenditures to the tune of about $42 million. Whereas the ESSER funds we received, and those are one-time expenditures, right? We're not going to continue to expend, but the one the the ESSER dollars we received totaling seven million dollars still is just astounding. When I tell people in other states how much, and they're like, "Which one is that?" I'm like, "Oh no, that's all three ESSER dollars combined." And they're like, "That's how big's your district?" I'm like, "Well, nineteen thousand. And they just are flabbergasted. Even the Secretary of State's chief of staff was flabbergasted by that. So. So I think our advocacy work has helped. I think it is understanding that there are some districts that got, that got a huge amount of ESSER dollars, you know, to the tune of 5,000 per student when we were looking at $340 per student in Issaquah. So I think that um, some of that information is getting through and we hope, we'll see, we'll see if it matters. And, and it is about some of this is about one-time expenditures that we continue to have. My concern is that things like the learning loss is going to take us years to really mitigate. We're not going to be able to do it. I think there is this expectation that kids are back to normal. They're not. They've, they have not learned all the stuff that they didn't learn during, this, during the year they, they were remote or the time that they weren't in school at all. So it's going to take us years, and I think that's why those allocation of dollars are really important. Well, and I think just to go back to public input, when we heard um, some of the people from Issaquah Middle saying, we have student behaviors that we've never seen before. That's a part of it. And they're saying, we need more administrative support. And I'm really sympathetic to that. And we're running a deficit budget and we didn't get any ESSER money. So it's, it's really complicated. And I don't think, I think it's really a difficult thing for legislators to wrap their heads around. Right, and to extend that is where we do supplement and enrich like counselors and such, it's coming out of our levy dollars, mm -hmm. which yeah. we've been talking a lot about. And so. there were stu students from Mercer Island and they were talking about that, just behavioral issues. It is across the country. When mm -hmm. I talk to my colleagues um, in other states, it's running the, the gamut, especially in middle school is where I think it's hit the hardest. So definitely the input that we've heard from families is like those learned behaviors. I'm trying to remember forgotten learning behavior I had not heard that term before, I agree. I think that there's a lot that kids kind of forgot. And some of them moved into middle school without, you know, suddenly they're eighth graders. And like, well, I was hardly a sixth grader when I left this place last. So I think there's a lot of learning to do and that's why we need those resources. Did you have anything you wanted to add? I think you all have, it really hit the items well. I will say uh, we are closely following um, three pieces of legislation that are, um, you know, in the works right now. Um, earlier, we spoke to the hold harmless legislations. Um, there is also a bill um, to do some state funded backfill for districts like the ISD that received such a low amount of uh, ESSER dollars. And then a, a bill that would change the um, apportionment funding for counselors, uh, school psychologists, um, and nurses to try to bring that more into a line with, frankly, what we're all doing. We're just doing it uh, out of our local dollars, um, which it's interesting because they fund three nurses. Apparently, our other 23 nurses are enrichment. And as I've said before, and you're going to hear me say it again later tonight, I don't think that our community views a school nurse's enrichment. I think they view it as an expectation. So, um, you know, it's a session that has only a month left. So uh, I would encourage folks to advocate um, on behalf of legislation that will benefit not just the ISD, but many districts across the state. And then lastly, I will say, 
the fact that they're looking at mental health supports and more counseling. I, I do feel a little bit of pride in that because we were out doing that long before they took, took up that, that march. I'm thankful that we have the staff that we do. Thank you to the voters for our previous levies that have allowed us to put nurses and um, health, health cover our health rooms in every in all of our buildings, uh, provide the mental health counselors that were referenced earlier tonight, and um, the the services such as our positive behavioral intervention support coaches as well. I I'm thrilled that they want more, and that's what we heard from one of our schools tonight. And then lastly, just um, to Director Moraldo's point, as a former middle school principal, we should not be surprised that the impact of remote learning and, and isolation hit middle school harder than other levels. That historically is an area where we experience behavioral challenges, just given the nature of human beings and adolescents and, and all of that. Um, and so you might recall earlier in the year, we, we had a flare up, if, uh, I'll, that my term, um, at Cougar Mountain Middle School, at Beaver Lake Middle School, and now we're hearing from Issaquah Middle School. So I will say I'm really proud of the staffs when that happens. They do get in there and they work on the problem. It's not easy, but you don't continue to hear about those problems typically because we are able to address it. And of course, we're looking at ways that we can support our schools but um, and, and situations like IMS. Um, and uh, but it is challenging, of course, when we're running deficit budgets as well. So but overall, um, I would encourage folks to keep a close eye on some of the legislation that I think, if passed um, and becomes law, will definitely benefit our Issaquah students. Thank you. I did just want to say really quickly, the other thing that I was talking about with any legislator that I had a chance to was that looking at the prototypical model, um, school model, I'm glad that they're doing that for the current nurses and counselors, et cetera, but they actually need to do it back in the classroom because some of the numbers that I saw, it was a reminder of what we have for a high school, a normal high school funding, normal middle school funding. And we need to really consider, are those what we want for a prototypical model across the state? Now, I mean, if you're a smaller district, you never worry about those numbers, but I think for us larger districts, we need to have a conversation about that. All right. Well, the Oh, for um for this item. Yeah, let me see. Does someone have um thank you? Does somebody oh yeah, at that point our public comment was done, but if somebody has um public input on this particular agenda item, they could raise their hand. But normally this is just this is really just a report out. So all right. Um we are ready to move on. So I'm glad we all had an opportunity to, um, for those of us that were able to attend, it was interesting. All right, we are going to move on to superintendent search. Thank you, I had to get down <laughs> far enough. I'm glad I have so many helpers today. Um, okay, well, as you know, we have stakeholder meetings are scheduled for next week. We have, um, Diane has done a great deal of work in scheduling the meetings for different groups across the district, including you know staff and the, the union groups. I don't have my whole list up, um, community groups, um, service groups. And so all those meetings are getting going. We have our parent groups. Uh, we have four parent group meetings of which any parent is, a, able to attend any of the meetings. All the meetings are done by Zoom. And it was also shared that there is a survey, Survey Monkey survey that anyone can take. And it's really asking the same question. So if people cannot attend any of the um, particular stakeholder meetings, it's fine, they can do the survey. The stakeholder meetings just gives a little bit more of a chance for a conversation with our um, search firm consultant. Um, we did put out the group as the board had wanted a group that would be able to hear from our families of color and be able to have them uh, be in a group meeting that would be comfortable for them. We advertised it that way. Um, and I understand that that has made the, um, a few people in the community unhappy. 
but it was our method of reaching out to um, historically marginalized families. And we have heard from our families before about the challenges um, to having their voice heard. And so it was in response to that. Um, so those meetings are set up. Um, March 10th at our meeting then, we will have um, Steve Lauder, our consultant at our meeting, and he will share the feedback from the stakeholder group with us. And we'll be able to have a conversation with him about that. Uh, we also have a brochure about our district that goes out as part of our um, uh, posting about our district. I'll, uh, it's now been, uh, I think we've finalized it, right, Diane? We got down to the last part of it. And so I will share that out with all of you, but it has some nice uh, pictures of students and tells about our district and lets um, any potential superintendents know a bit about our district and our community. Um, the applications close in March. Um, we have already established our dates to select our finalists on March 16th, and then our interviews with the board and coming to the community March 21st, 22nd, 23rd, and then we'll take it from there for our selection. So that's about where we are. If, um, does anybody have any questions, comments, Sydney? Yeah, I have, a, I have a comment and um, I think it might be helpful. I don't know where we would, if if we were tracking anything on the search overall on the website, just the general mm -hmm. dates and timelines. Yeah. But I think that might be helpful. I think it would also be helpful to share the full list of stakeholder groups that people are talking to. I think we've gotten, you know, clearly a reaction to a single meeting and there are many meetings scheduled. And I think it'd be helpful for people to know that our goal as a board is to speak to many of many different groups who have different differing vantage points, different concerns, different issues that we want to be aware of as we go through this process. Um, I think it's unfortunate we've gotten um, the reaction to a single meeting, but I think maybe with everything, feedback is a gift. And so maybe the opportunity is to provide the full list of the search, the dates, and uh, the broad range of stakeholders of all sorts, both community members who have no students in the school, et cetera, um, to come in and join the conversation. I, I think that might be helpful. And that's a, that's a great point because we did um, come up with a list of at least 10 or... <laughs> 18, oh my goodness. Just be clear, 18 separate meetings. How we got there, but there are 18 separate <laughs> meetings uh, designed to elicit input from different groups of people that are all a part of the workings of our school district and or in our community that are all part of um, our collective school system. So that's a, that's a really good point. And I don't know that we have anything up on our, our website and we really should to show where we are in this process, or maybe we do and I haven't seen it. I, I have not been focused on that, but that's a great idea. Well, it, it's clear from our feedback that folks would like to know more. I'm yeah. also super excited that there's energy around providing this feedback. So yeah. I hope that this broad group of folks who are here tonight and on Zoom definitely join and, and join into the search process. I think that's the, also the upside. But I think we just have to be maybe, well, I know we've talked about it. We've spent yeah. a lot of time on who we're inviting in. So let's make that transparent as well. Yeah, I, definitely true. You know, it's one thing that, you know, we all talk about it here, so we all know it, but it's getting it out to the rest. Marnie? Well, so this is a, this is a kind of a process or procedural question. Are these, these are meetings where we're inviting members of certain groups. Are they public meetings, meaning anybody at any time? Because, right, it's not a meeting of the board. The board it it's a, not a board it, meeting. Correct. Which would be open to the public. It's a, essentially, it's small focus groups being done by the district, similar to like we have a levy committee that um, people can come and, you know, that's, I guess, well, that's a, we, we open those to the public, but technically, would they be? These I are. don't know. Yeah, so yeah, these are. These it's wouldn't like, it's be because, uh, well, one, the board's not there, so they're not under the Open Public Meeting Act, right. and some of them are, you know, work. We have groups that are meeting with the teachers union and the other union groups and the, the teachers, administrators. And, those, and so, I, so I guess for me, that is, that is a, a, a key piece is that we're inviting people to give us input, uh, community groups. So if you were not a member of Kiwanis, you might not have known that we had a meeting with 
the members of Kiwanis mm -hmm. and the and the different rotaries or whatever it is. So I think that's important. I think it is for me. I don't even know where to go to find when all the meetings are if I wanted to be able to talk about it. So I think that's important for us to communicate that information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a really good point. I know I took it upon myself because I attend the uh, PTSA council meetings and I asked uh, their president, would they like a brief update on the superintendent search on a monthly basis? And they were like, oh my goodness, yes, that would be awesome. And I, I laid out the whole process from start to finish because I hadn't talked to them before. And I was thinking about this we have not done this in 15 years. I barely remember the last time we did it. So I'm sure for the vast majority of our community, this is a new thing. It is also the single most important thing that the school board does. So I totally agree with Sydney. One, obviously we want to be transparent, but two, it should be out there, you know, in a fairly prominent place mm -hmm. on the website. Hey, this is what the board is doing. It's the most important mm -hmm. thing they do. This is how they do it. These are all your opportunities to participate. Um, you know, I think people need to yeah, know. And I think, I think people are really interested as evidenced by the amount of public input we had. Right, and we'll want them to know as we move forward too, because we'll have the days where our uh, candidates are here and we'll have an opportunity to have like a um, public forum a and other meetings where you know again there may be some where it's with the administrators or uh with different groups but they'll also be the public forum piece so and, we want people to know and there's one scheduled for uh families with students with special yes special period. needs correct mm -hmm. yeah and i just want to be really clear because you were talking about who are these meetings open to and that many of them are for specific groups all of the parent meetings are group open to any and all of the parents. So no, you can't go to the IEA meeting, no. but you can go to any of the parent meetings. Yes. So we're not segregating, yeah. discriminating. But I think what, I love what to address is, but I think it's important to reiterate what Ann said. We have folks in our community who we consistently hear from who do not feel that their voices are heard, who do not believe that they have an opportunity lost in the sea of our broader community to have their experiences heard and validated. And it is 100% the view of this collective body that that's important as we go forward. So I don't want anyone to be confused that we're backing off of the importance mm -hmm. of centering on these different voices. I am certainly not backing off on yeah. the importance of centering on all the different voices. Parents of, of children that require special services, incredibly important. I want to hear from them and I want their voices centered in that time, not a distraction because others feel, have an emotion about that. So I think what I think is super important again is I want to harness the energy clearly drawn by this topic and make sure people are channeling that into the feedback process. Mm -hmm. Excited to have them there, but let's center on voices so that we can really hear what people need. Excellent. And to those that aren't able to make any of the, the Zoom meetings, please do the survey because that is the other way to get the feedback back. Because, and we wanna, you know, the, the superintendent uh, search firm will help us bring all of that feedback together to help the board center on what does our community want in our next superintendent. So key to it. Did you have anything to add? Okay, all right. <laughs> ah. Maybe a first. Oh yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, this one's truly just uh, the board on this one. So it's definitely ours. All right. So we finished up that one. And now I think we'll go to EL 16. I know Harlan. Um, can, can I make a suggestion that's yeah. going to be a little um, yeah. dis, discontinuity, whatever the adjective of that would be? Um, that we go ahead and start EL 16, but when Harlan oh. gets here, maybe we break, go to the levees and come back just because we do have a lot of people in the audience that came for the levy thing. And I don't wanna keep them up too long past their bedtime if we can avoid it. I um, wonder how long, we might get through EL, through EL 16. Well, we might, but I'm just saying if, if we start and he walks in, I would sort of like the shift. Yeah, I know he's on his way. So um, I, I agree with that. If everybody's okay with that, um, 
the, we can get through the levy. Okay, let's My, get going. Okay, you know, let's do EL 16. <laughs> yeah. Oh, motion, motion. Uh, I move the board accept the annual internal monitoring report for EL 16 equity as presented. Second. Would you like me to yes. get started, President? Yeah, you can get started yeah. and. Um, well, um, first of all, I want to thank um, Executive Director Elena Sividasan and her entire team for the gr great work that they have done this, um, this past year. And I'll remind us that we are uh, monitoring the 2021 school year, not the current school year, but the, the previous school year. Um, I just, again, I, I want to um, acknowledge and thank them for the incredible work they did last year as we managed through remote learning slash hybrid learning and helping our families access critical information to support their students. One frustration for us as it relates to our equity, equity work, and I, I guess, or for me, I, I, and, I, and I believe Elena shares this frustration, um, is that our equity work, um, we were forced into and have been forced into a sort of crisis management, not just in equity, but in all of what we do, because frankly, we've been living through a bit of a crisis the last two years. Um, and so that has slowed the implementation of some of the things that we had hoped to be able to do in this particular area of equity. One example of this that you see addressed in the monitoring is the decision made to delay asking each of our departments to set equity goals as part of their annual work plan. We had to shift this priority. Um, we shifted our priorities to getting our schools fully open to in-person learning while implementing strict COVID mitigation pro protocols that consume a tremendous amount of staff time. We actually heard some of that in public input tonight. I will note, um, I think we have done all this work in terms of getting our schools open and keeping them open as well or better than any public school system in our region. And it's been extremely important and beneficial to our students and families that we've been able to do that. Like previous monitoring reports, we have attempted to capture the impact of the COVID pandemic and the forced move towards remote and hybrid learning um, and how that has impacted our students, staff, and families. Um, I do want to highlight some of the really incredible work that this small but mighty department has been doing in collaboration with all of our other departments and staff as well. Um, they have identified barriers with online learning when we were again last year when we were in online and hybrid learning and the actions taken to address these issues in support of our students. This report um, you'll see has numerous links um, that go into Excel spreadsheets, which also contain links um, that help catalog all of our efforts and activities in, um, that we implemented to help the system address the goals and outcomes outlined in EL 16 equity. Much of that work you'll see was related to how we could support families um, as we headed into remote learning, as remote learning, as we started to learn the impact of remote learning and, and engagement, um, the transition into hybrid learning. But there's also a tremendous amount of work that you can see as, and as you've gone through the report um, about outreach to um, families that uh, maybe English is not their first language, families that are new to our, our region, new to our country often, and um, that outreach through our community uh, partner, through our community liaisons, and all of those efforts. Uh, a tremendous amount of professional development has been provided to staff and to even to community members in, in this area as well. So again, there's a lot in there. Um, the, our equity department has provided support to our culturally and linguistically diverse students and families in an effort to help them better access the ISD Live remote learning platform. I, I don't even like having to take my mind back to that space, but um, I, as we go back to that space, um, you know, our staff did an incredible job shifting from the way we have taught and done school for over a hundred years into a, a, this new um, remote learning. And going back two years, you'll recall when we were first forced into remote learn, learning, it, it, was, it was very, very clunky. 
And one of the things we heard from the community and the students at the end of that year was we need more live streaming, we need more interacting uh, mm -hmm. interactions. And our teachers stepped up to that, our system stepped up to it. Then hence we created ISD Live. But you can imagine that was a lot of change, a lot of complications um, for anyone. Now, try to imagine being new to the country, maybe not having the full grasp of English and trying to figure all that out. I'm sure a lot of families were probably scared and I'm not sure how they were gonna do it. And our equity team, our folks stepped up, reached out and helped those families and helped their students therefore access their education and help with engagement. Everything from helping us get computers distributed that we needed to, Wi-Fi hotspots into the right hands of students and families that needed them, literally partnering with uh, our amazing partners like the Issaquah Schools Foundation who are providing desks in homes so students would have a good place to work. So all of that work is a result of the work that um, our equity department did. And they, they don't do it alone. They work closely with teaching and learning services, with our other directors, with our building leaders, and as I said, with community service groups, our PTAs, our Issaquah Schools Foundation. So I'm just really immensely proud of that. And I, I think long-term, we will see that our students, um, particularly those, as I mentioned, um, culturally or linguistically diverse students will have um, had a better, richer experience during that, I'm gonna say terrible time, because for me, I, I, I just believe in what we do in person. Um, but they had a better experience because of all this work that they did. Um, and so again, I, just to highlight a few of the things that were in this report as we updated it, um, you know, I mentioned the professional development that they provide to staff and community on topics related to equity and diversity. Our, our department also worked, as I said, closely with community-based organizations such as the Garage, the Teen Center, um, the City of Issaquah's Equity and Inclusion Community Group, again, the Issaquah Schools Foundation and our ISD PTAs. And then finally, there's a tremendous amount of information within this report. So I wanna give the board an opportunity to make comments or ask questions. Executive Director Sivadasan and I are here to try to address any of it. I mean, I, I know at one point today, I think I was five clicks deep into a part on the report, the link in the actual report to the Excel spreadsheet, to the link in the Excel spreadsheet, which actually opened another link. And, and I, I recognize that can be somewhat complex if you're just a community member, but I also hope you understand if we didn't do that, we'd be bringing you a, a 50 page book, a thick document. And our goal is to try to be a little more streamlined than that. So, um, so again, there's a lot in there. I know the board has had the report for a while. And so we're prepared to, again, take any comments or questions that you might have. Okay, I will throw it out to the board to ask any questions or make comments. I have one just really quick thing. And you actually answered the question. But um, when I was reading this, I had no idea what a CLD parent was. You answered it. It was yeah, what? culturally and linguistically oh, diverse. Yes. Um, since these do go out on the website and people might read them, I, I don't think it was ever explained in there. And I would never in a million years have come up with that. So, so we might need to make an, uh, an adjustment before well, we publish to actually put it in, in there. there. Maybe, maybe the first time. Yeah. I, I right. thought the same thing. I didn't know what that meant. And I didn't even connect it when he said it, that that would be CLD. Yeah. So, okay. Full confession. Yeah. I had to ask Elena as well what okay. she meant by that. Um, and that, of course, we've discussed this before, is the problem uh, when we get into our own education speak. Right. It, Sometimes that uh, we go to these acronyms because obviously that's a long thing to write out. It is. But um, that's what we mean by that. Yeah. But it's, I mean, it's it's a really, um, it's a rich phrase, right? Culturally and linguistic diverse families. I, I like it. It's interesting. It's, it's um it tells you exactly what you're talking about, but I just did not know what CLD mm -hmm. meant. So. Yeah. And I, and I will tell you, I, I've highlighted other things in the report, but I figured I would yeah. just wait to hear what questions the board had as well, because there's really some amazing things that they've done. 
It's been a difficult year. Yeah. It, That's for it, sure. And again, so 2021 ways. was really difficult. This year has been presented a, a different set of challenges, no doubt. But I'm so thankful that our students are in person every day um, because that aids uh, in our ability to better serve them. Mm -hmm. All right. Other questions from the board? Sydney. This is funny. So I guess it's the evidence that made me question the, the section and the interpretation. So the section I'm looking at is five, which is promote hiring practices to attract highly skilled and diverse workforce, which I've read many times in the past. But it wasn't until I actually looked at the evidence that I guess my question is, the, the evidence is about recruiting activity, not about actual hiring. And so are, are, we, are we tracking the most important thing? I mean, yes, recruiting activity leads to hiring, but I have no way of knowing if we've moved the needle on actually having um, increased diversity in staff. So how should I think about that, I guess is my question. Um, yeah, and I know we included um, Director Mullings, the uh, civil rights report um, on appli applicants, right. but, um, I know that that in in each year annually the OSPI report card uh, will will um, we have to report out the percentage of our staff that are um, uh, uh, you know broken out disaggregated. Disaggregating. Yes, thank you. Um, disaggregated. I know at one time you know it's a tough. I'm going to just tell you it's a tough needle to move, particularly in uh, the elementary teaching ranks because we know that the vast majority of um, certificated teachers coming out of the university system are um, still female and white. And at, when we began this work several years ago, it, we were disheartened to learn that um, the classes that were in college at that time were actually more white than they had previously been. This is at the university level. So it has been a bit of a challenge to move the needle in that area. I don't have the data at my fingertips. I apologize. Um, I, and I know um, that we did, we did update the human resources portion of this. Um, I believe, and I'm just, I, can, I guess I can only speak anecdotally at this time, that the system has become somewhat more diverse, um, but not dramatically so. We are still a predominantly white staff. Right, but and and I see the oh, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, and, and, but about that report, that report is for since since the 2012 date, right? So the difficulty with that is, I don't know if it's improving over time because it's just everything cumulative. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Are we getting better at the percentage of recruits that are more diverse? Yeah. Well, I mean, there was, as you know, there were tremendous efforts. I mean, we are our. our um, when we were traveling um, to different parts of the country where we knew there was more diversity in the candidate pool. We did have some very limited success with that, however, because unfortunately, we are one of the highest cost of housing places in the nation. And even we, we had candidates who accepted jobs from us only later in the summer to say, um, I have been researching housing and I'm not going to be able to leave Texas now and come there or leave Central Valley and come there. And, and that was disappointing for us. Um, and then, of course, when you're in a cut mode, as we were last year, you're not spending a lot of time on recruiting new and new teachers at that point. Uh, Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources, uh, Donna Hood, I see has moseyed up towards the podium. And, have I missed anything there, Donna, or what can you fill in for us? Yeah, no, I just wanted to um, speak to Director Moraldo's point. This, this is, in fact, data that is new to me, uh, and I learned from my team that I could pull this. I don't believe I can break it down year over year, but I will continue to experiment. Um, this actually comes out of our HRM portal where applicants can choose to fill out that optional field, but don't have to. So I found it interesting and thought it might be a, a way to at least provide some baseline. And then from here, I could potentially maybe calculate more annually what the increase is in the total number of applicants in each of these areas. 
Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. And, and Assistant Superintendent Hood, do you know, and I apologize, I don't mean to put yeah. you on the spot no, okay. here, um, but, you know, annually, I know OSPI is part of the OSPI report card. They put the diversity uh, disaggregated uh, staff numbers, because I know this is something the state is looking at as well. And I just, I, I, I don't know how that, our numbers have moved over the last few years. I honestly don't know yet either. I believe that, so one of my directors pulls that data for our student information systems. It's a, it's a pretty comprehensive report is my understanding. And each of us um, has some components to contribute. So Director Camerata has recently pulled some of that data for her into what is we call the CRDC report. And so I believe that is what then goes to OSPI, but I will learn more. And if there's more useful or valuable data that I can provide here, I would be happy to. Um, I'm just kind of learning how to capture it. Right, I think that would be good because I realized that the item is about promoting hiring practices versus the end result. But part of that is because this is in an EL and the, the way that needed to be crafted because we weren't trying to set him up for failure mm -hmm. If he couldn't move the needle. Mm. So we wanted to ensure that you were doing the things necessary to attempt to be moving the needle, hence the promote. But maybe, I mean, there's nothing, this is, we can't add the data in there that says what is the outcomes of the promotion of um, the hiring practices that you're still describing. So that could be a piece of data, in, not necessarily this year, but for the next one. And then that we can build upon yeah. that. Um, going forward. Uh, and I should yeah. note too, there the, the HR department has done a number of other changes. Um, we have um, implemented questions in our interviews related to um, equity and, and a potential candidate's understanding of equity and, and how that plays out in a public school classroom. Um, we have um, relied upon some of our staff who are from uh, different ethnic, non-white ethnicities, if you will, to um, go out and, and help us in recruiting efforts so that, they, that folks can see themselves sometimes in the people that are actually working in the ISD. Um, and so, and reaching out to them, and the board has done some of this too, reaching out to our, our staff, our non-white staff, and getting input from them on the experience that they're having in the district so that we can, you know, I mean, I've had many, many conversations like this over the years and, and people have been really honest with me in, in sharing things, sometimes not even related about the school system, but about the community um, and not maybe finding uh, places of worship that they're comfortable with. Uh, just, um, you know, we are a community in transition and, uh, but we are desperately trying to convince people this is a, a great place to work. And um, if you are um, a, per a person of color or you're a white person, we do um, highlight our belief that we need to be a more equitably, equitable system. And so again, we are asking these questions as we interview folks too. So I know it's a, a lot of work. And I, I noticed Director Gallinger just uh, arrived. I, I hope you had safe travels, Director Gallinger. Uh, and, and thank you for the work that I know you're out there doing. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm going to see if there are any more questions. If we're about done, then we might be able to take a vote on this and move this item off before we go to the levy. So, but I, but I, okay. I just had, um, <clears throat> I just had one question about high, high cap and then. Okay, I think, go ahead and do that because I really would, if we can clean this up in the yeah. next five yeah. minutes, then we'll move on to the levy. Okay. Yeah. So um, I was curious because there was a, a discussion about uh, matrix scoring as opposed to a straight uh, cutoff line. So I was interested in a little bit more information around that and then how that's translating into the diversity of our self-contained program because the data, disaggregated data was for all of high cap. So I don't know how much of that uh, was in uh, Merlin specifically. I'd love to know if we do have any uh, Latino or African American or uh, Native American students in those because the numbers there were really, really, really small. Yes, yeah. And I know that um, in those programs that has been a trouble spot in our system and many public school systems as well. And I uh, appreciate the efforts that um, 
Executive Director Mundell and her predecessor, Assistant Superintendent Bongard, had made to try to create a more equitable system in identifying our high cap learners. And one of the things I can say early on, and then I'm going to let Executive Director Mundell speak to the matrix, you know, we made a decision early on to test all students in second grade in our system and um, to, as, a, as an effort to not, you know, we, there was a time when we did an invitation testing or even um, if you wanted to test and we just knew we were missing populations within our system. So we moved to the testing of all students for help and identification. Um, and Executive Director Mundell, if you could share a little bit about the matrix scoring and kind of mm -hmm. the efforts we've made to try to get a uh, populate, you know, give everybody a fair chance at the programs. Sure. Good evening, Susan Mundell, Executive Director of Elementary Ed. Um, I do not have the Merlin numbers disaggregated from the total number of highly capable, but we can easily find that and we'll do that for you. Um, the matrix scoring is a change from um, the scoring we used to have, which is we use multiple objective measures and we had strict cut scores for each for each test and the students had to reach each of those cut scores. The matrix score is calculated differently, allowing for there to be higher scores on some tests, lower scores on others, and so that it gives students an opportunity to shine and be, um, you know, maybe much higher in one, a little lower in another, and um, it just allows more flexibility in the um, requirements to qualify. And it's very detailed and we have a, an appendix with all the details if you're interested in how it's um, calculated. I have a meeting at the end of this month with the um, OSPI state highly capable um, uh, advisory group. So that would be really, really okay, we're great. Happy to share that. all that with you. Definitely. And I don't know if you wanna meet offline, that would be fine. Okay, super, thank you. That's, and I'll just make a comment because we do, we have for years done more than most districts in the mm -hmm. state and we continue to have the same problem. Yeah. And so I know that the highly capable team at OSPI really wants to dig in. So if we're finding, if we can find that is it's made any movement to be able to go to a matrix model as opposed to the, the strict cutoff, mm -hmm. I think that would be great data to be, to be gathering. Mm -hmm. How long have we been doing that for? I think it's been four or five years I was going to say four or five actually. years, yeah. I yeah. think, yeah. yeah. That, that we've used that. I, I will say, I think one of the problems we still have that is, is a challenge for us, and I know you um, know this, um, Director Moraldo, because you had a student at one time, and um, I know Director Gallinger has in the program as well, is that we don't provide transportation. So I think we kind of have to look at the, the, the problem a couple of ways. Who have we identified is, um, that would be eligible for the program and disaggregate that group and who actually is in the program. Because I do believe we, we still have some barriers to access. Um, and also, you know, the program is limited in just a, uh, a couple of our uh, buildings and regions of our district. And as you know, we're a, a fairly large district and we have a lot of um, traffic congestion as well. And, oh, and I, I forgot Director Moore as well too, but you were a longtime Merlin mother as well and family. And uh, so I know people have been generous in carpooling and things like that. But I I I think I think we're we're again, we need to look at who have we identified as eligible and who actually is participating. And we do have um, highly capable services in all the buildings. It's just those Merlin program in the two. Yeah, not the self-contained. Mm -hmm. we, we have the yeah. SAGE program, yeah. Which I think is another reason to look at the overall numbers as well mm -hmm. because of the kids who are taking participating mm -hmm. in uh, that we've identified as eligible for highly mm -hmm. capable services. Yep. All right, good. That sounds like you guys have a little bit of work to do yeah. mm -hmm. together. Is, Harlan, do you have anything on EL-16? Sure. I just wanted to hear from uh, Executive Director Svidasen on some, how, like how some of the uh, monthly educator of color meetings, have gone, like what's the impact been? Yeah. You know, because, I, you know, certainly following up on what uh, Dr. Mullings was saying, 
it's not just about the recruiting and hiring, but the retention is an important part, especially if you're coming from across the country. Uh, and I think it speaks to, you know, I know that there was frustrated community members about why we did a specific carve out for our intentional stakeholder groups. But what we've heard and consistently hear, even, even thinking from our staff is, we need to create safe spaces, That's right? Because we don't know what biases we bring and we want to have open dialogue. So I would just be curious about what that impact is and, and sort of what learnings you've learned and how that's impacted, you know, even like the books that you talk about blind spot, like how many people participated. So if you would just share a little bit, I would appreciate it. Yeah. Executive Director Sivit Austin. So a few things that have been really helpful that have um, come out of the educator of color group is one just for the staff to have a cohort of um, individuals that look like them or have had a lived experience like them, or they can just sort of share without having to really explain um, themselves um, just what, what it's like to um, be a part of our district, what it's like to teach here, maybe some of the, um, the things that they're facing, whether they be positive um, or some challenges. I think um, a couple of just specific examples of that would be some of the feedback that we've gotten is sometimes our staff don't always know uh, like the rules of engagement, maybe with like an administrator or, um, or other colleagues because they're um, from a different culture or um, maybe the, the values that we sort of, that we operate on within our school system are very like white American cultural values that may not be necessarily um, known by all of our families and what those definitions are. So we have, um, those are some of the conversations that my, I might have with principals or I might have with human resources is just how, when we are onboarding new staff, how do we help principals and staff know like what the rules of engagement should be and how to explain that so that um, staff can engage with their, um, uh, with other staff or other administrators in a way that feels um, uh, welcoming and they also know how to advocate for themselves or how to understand feedback that's coming to them. I think other pieces that have come up are just some of the uh, microaggressions they might experience uh, teaching within um, within our district, um, either maybe from staff or from the community. And so then we are able to take that feedback and then put on professional development that addresses microaggressions. Um, specifically last year, we worked with Dr. Caprice Hollins with Cultures Connecting, and she did professional development in every building focused on microaggressions, what to do if you commit them, what to do if you see them happening. Um, so those are just some examples of things that we have learned from that group that we try to um, address as a system to make it a more welcoming environment for our staff of color. Are, are, are you still getting good numbers of participation uh, amongst our staff in those, those discussions? Yes, I would say uh, I would have to talk with, um, or I'd have to look at the numbers, but it is uh, usually around uh, 30, like 20 or 30 that we'll get of staff participating on a monthly basis. And sometimes there are not just educators of color. Sometimes we'll have um, white staff join the group as well that are um, interested in being a part of the group. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Is there real quick, any public input on this item? And if I'm not seeing any, then we will go ahead and take a vote. All those in favor of approval of EL 16, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, EL 16 is passed and we are moving on. Thank you. And we look forward to uh, moving out of, as I referred to it as crisis management mode, as we transition out of the pandemic and to be able to really reinvigorate some of that work that we, the work that we want to be doing. All right. I mean, we had to do the work yes. that we've done and it was critically important, but there's other work that we would like to do, get back up on the front burner. Thank you. Excellent. 
Now we are um, uh, back up towards the top of the agenda on resolution 1178, our education program and operations levy. And I will ask for a motion to start this. Okay. I move the board adopt resolution, resolution 1178, authorizing a four year 2023 to 2026 educational programs and operations levy. This proposition authorizes the district to levy the following excess taxes on all taxable property within the district to maintain current educational program funding and support the district's general fund program and daily operations expenses, teaching, classroom materials, technology, extracurricular activities, buildings, and transportation. Um, in collection year 2023, the approximate levy rate per thousand dollar of assessed value would be $1.43. The levy amount would be 61 million. 2024, approximate levy rate of $1.43, levy amount of 64 million. 2025, levy rate of $1.42, levy amount of 67 million. And in 2026, approximate levy rate of $1.42, levy amount of 70 million. Second. Excellent. All right, that was very long. Thank you. It was Susie. very long. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very long um, and very specific. <laughs> that's, that's right. Very specific. All right. So we were able to have a work study session. Um, and well, first, we, we, we have already discussed these at our last board meeting and then uh, and had a, a work study during that board meeting. Now, at this uh, meeting date, we had almost an hour work study session. We were able to go through more details about what is in the education program and operations levy that is related to um, uh, additional compensation or additional teacher responsibilities. I don't have the exact title. And it detailed out um, the components of that, which included time responsibility and incentive, which is TRI um, and other compensation and totaled that up. So we were able to get that detail. Uh, we also talked about the changes in the EPO percentage year over year um, since uh, 1999 to today, and that gave us that information. And then we also had a bit of a conversation about um, the tax rate and how that has changed over time. And sorry, I was looking for one more page. Um, yes, in and just really in general. <laughs> The complexity of how um, our property taxes are calculated from the calculation of the amount of money that we uh, have asked our voters to authorize to how that tax rate is computed. And so we had a chance to talk about all that. Now we have a choice here. Do we want to start by asking for public input or do we want to, they've already made a presentation over what is in this because we're on really our second round of conversation about it. Do we want to delve into our questions and then go into um, public comment? We're, it's kind of different here because we've talked about this so many times. So I'm kind of throwing it out to the group. You can get public comment. If nobody objects, then I can do that. All right. So let's start with anybody who would like to do public comment. And if I can ask, this is only about the EPNO levy. We will, again, as a separate line item, go ahead and talk about the capital levy. So anybody that wants to talk about the capital levy, just hold on. All right, so I knew we had one person signed up, um, Rachel Often. I'm not sure I always say your last name right, but you'll help me when you go up. And again, just like other kinds of public comment, um, please state your name and attendance area. We do have a two minute timer. And then for anybody else, you can kind of think about queuing up. And if there is anybody on Zoom, I'll come to you after we go through the people in the room. So Rachel. Hi, my name is Rachel Offont. I'm a parent to an eighth grader at Cougar Mountain Middle School and two, st two students at Isqua High School. These past two months, I served on my second levy committee I'm also a former ISD employee, having lost my job as a school counselor at Beaver Lake Middle School last year when the position was cut. Tonight, I wear all of these hats when speaking. I'm here to speak on the importance of unanimous approval of the levy packages to be placed on our April ballot. As a member of the levy team, we dissected the details and asked thoughtful questions, prompting the district to evaluate each detail carefully. 
I firmly stand by our committee recommendation for this levy package, and I'm asking you to do the same. As a quick example, let's talk about the EPNO levy. There are critical programs currently funded with levy dollars, such as a seven period high school day, Gibson Act and our Spanish immersion program that will not cease to exist if the levy fails. So if not funded, money from these programs will be moved from other budget areas, ultimately resulting in even more cuts to staffing. As a counselor and parent, I can tell you firsthand how detrimental our cuts to counselors and deans at the middle school was last year. Relationships, trust, and connections are not built overnight, and those cuts had rippling impacts through every level of our district and came at a time where our students and families needed this support the most. We simply cannot afford more cuts at this time, particularly around mental health, a theme that came up at every levy committee meeting. A levy failure will force the district into RIF decisions. Working in education policy and leadership is an impossible task, now more than ever. No decision will ever please 100% of people 100% of the time. My ask of you tonight is this, there's not a perfect solution to funding education, so please follow your true north for our kids and our community. Yes, state funding and McCleary should cover the basic cost of education, but when the state continues to push forward unfunded mandates, we are forced to utilize levies to fund the education and services that our students deserve. Your collective action as a team sends a clear message to the community about your priorities and anything less than full board support will have a critical impact on the public's impression of whether or not to vote for this levy. Thank you. I really appreciate you all. Thank you very much for your input. I appreciate it. Is there anybody else in here? I like the hand waving. You guys are good. Um, is there anybody else in the room that would like to give public input? All right. Is there anyone on Zoom uh, that would like to give public input? All right. I don't see anyone. All right. All right. Now we're back to the board to be able to um, ask any other questions of, to help them make their decision on this. Uh, so first, thank you for rearranging the agenda. I apologize that I was not able to be here until this time. Um, it's been a pretty crazy time. Uh, I've spent the past couple weeks meeting with staff. So thank you, Ron, to you and your team and all the data that Jake, you've been providing even now as we're going back and forth. Um, so I think what would help me is if we uh, put up the chart that is EPO modeling 23 to 26 uh, up on our screen so we can see it and all know what we're talking about. And that way the public knows what we're talking about. So from my perspective, uh, I well, couldn't- Hold on, just let me make sure. Martin, do you know what he wants up? Okay, so, all right, Mark, oops, sorry about that. Martin's working on getting yeah. it up, so, so go ahead. Uh, so I couldn't agree more that um, I think we all want the same thing. Like, I know we want what's best for our students and for our families and for our teachers and all the supports that they need. Uh, I want a full authority levy and I want the community to get behind it. Where I think we devi deviate is in the means and how we get there. And so for me, I am very concerned about the sticker shock of the numbers. And I believe that we, our community is certainly astute enough to know uh, when something is being told to them in an authentic, straightforward way. And, and I just think that we can really improve in how we communicate and how we share. And so one of the things I did in, in doing this, and I'll share this with you guys because I was working on this last night to bring in like the levy results from our other, our, our surrounding districts, right? Every, almost every community around us has had a levy. And, you know, some people have made comments about the, the four or five year, the change, percent change. And so I went and looked at that for our surrounding districts. And you see Mercer Island, Bellevue, North Shore, Riverview is a claw in like Washington. I ordered them in order of rank order from the least amount of change from this year, 2022, till their 2026. And these numbers are pulled off of the voter pamphlets. So both the rates and the dollar amounts. And then uh, you see the percent change over five years. So Mercer Island between 2022, this current year, and where they'll end in 2026 is a, a negative 6.3% change in five years. Bellevue is a 1.2% change over five years. 
North Shore is a 14.3% change over five years. Uh, Riverview is a 21.9% change over five years. We're forecast to be a 22.9% change over five years, according to what was just uh, read. And then the question was a 31.7. And that's how they're rank ordered, just purely based on from smallest to largest. But I think what was most interesting to me is you look at the bold number above by each name is the actual percent yes, according to uh, as of last night. And uh, you see it went from 72% approval to by the time we get to Riverview at a 21.9% ask, their yes vote was 48.72%. So for me, I want this to pass and I want this to pass the first time. And so I really do think that the amount we ask does make a difference. And I do think two or $3 million potentially could. So if you look at that chart right there. So I'm sorry, Harlan, I'm a little curious at why these are the selected districts when we had more significantly more districts in the state. Cause these are, our, these are our East King County. These are the ones that we always talk to and, and partner with. So I only included Riverview just cause of, you know, what, what okay. the situation I guess are. maybe I disagree with that premise, but go ahead. <laughs> So when I look at this chart here and I see uh, the enrollment assumption uh, for this current year and then looking forward uh, and I look at the projected student enrollment as of 2 3 at the bottom, I see that we have a disconnect between the, the, the enrollment that we're projecting and the enrollment that we're uh, budgeting from a levy standpoint. And I can understand some of that. I then look and see the CPI assumption, which are also pretty big. So I feel like we, we are both being uh, super uh, aggressive or conservative, however word you wanna, wanna use um, on both the uh, inflationary measure as well as the enrollment measure. And I would be fine with one or the other. And I would be fine even getting halfway there with the enrollment. Uh, but I think that we need to go either based on the enrollment or not. And this is where we differ, like that ghost money for the hold harmless. I, I don't believe that we should be collecting money from our local taxpayers for students that aren't in our schools. And that's where we can just disagree. And that's, that's okay. Uh, I do believe that uh, the ESSER money is in a more important and more equitable way to support schools across the state of Washington. And I, I, I hope that that comes through. I do understand the concern like, well, what if that doesn't come through? I, I totally get that. So I think for me, I would be more comfortable with something that was uh, more middle road, but that I personally still believe that will allow us to have the full levy authority capacity, but would be something that would be more better received by our community. And that's really what I hope the focus of the conversation is, is getting to some compromised numbers that we can all support. So can I clarify what you're asking? Are you asking for an update to the projection model or are you asking for an update to the actual content of the levy package? No, I, I am in full agreement with the content of the levy package. We have vetted that with our community. That has been very clear. I think everything in that is is fine. I'm not actually questioning that. And I am also not questioning that I want a full authority levy. So those are not those okay, things. Okay, good, because those weren't clear. So uh, I let off with that. Uh, until five, four minutes ago, those weren't clear. And the part I just asked, which is what change are you asking for? You didn't, you yep. didn't state. So sure, row, row nine. And so your request is to either represent less students or lower inflation. Either or. Yes. Okay. Right. Oh, Marnie, I, I would I would not accept lower inflation at all. I think inflation is going to be much worse than we know over the next few years. And again, if it doesn't happen, we don't collect the dollars. And I think that's something we need to be very clear of. So um, I think those are pretty conservative given some of the stuff that we've seen happening in our nation uh, due to the pandemic and and the supposed going back to normal that hasn't happened. So I would, I would definitely not want to move those, the CPI assumption because we are going to have, that's, that's not something we control. 
those numbers are going to be there regardless. So I think making sure that those are really looking at expectations of what's been happening um, are really, really important. I think and, the other thing about your sheet, though, is how many of those districts were at their levy capacity in 2022? Because uh, part of why there's a big jump for us is we're not at, we're not going to collect that capacity, are we? Well, uh, well I just confirmed with uh, my colleagues in Mercer Island and Bellevue over text that they were at full authority in 21 and 22. And then we, I know LDUB was under 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 levied authority, so they have the yeah. jump up like we do with 30 percent because they were basically levying the same thing. So right. Dr. Gallinger, his numbers are correct, but they were already at full authority. I would expect less growth from them if they were. Right, right. just and, like once we make the move to go from the 22 to 23 and get back to that um, full authority levy collection, then it's much more stable or-, or, or um, The amounts move 13.8% in the first year. Yeah, and then the four or 5% in the years after. I, and I do, I, I do respect Dr. Gallinger's point of view. We are actually talking, he, he wants to talk about how we're, how we're calculating full authority, which is a, it's an interesting conversation and one that is, has plagued me for many, many years of my career. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no. So for for me, what I, I agree, I would I wouldn't want to change like inflationary number either. Like if if it was my druthers, what I would love to see is strike the middle ground between what you have put currently in row nine and what you have projected. I'm going to go to Suzanne, and then I want a moment too. Okay, I have um, an issue with these numbers because something funky is going on between 22 and 23. So if you look at Bellevue, Bellevue goes from 83 to 70, and then they go back to 84. So if we forget about 22 and look at the growth from 23 to 26, um, they're at 20%. If you look at Issaquah, again, something funky happens between 22 and 23 because we go from not full authority to full authority. If you look at our growth from 23 to 26, it's 14.75 which is much less than Bellevue. I didn't do that calculation for everybody else. Those were the two that jumped out at me, but I don't think you can just say, you know, this is a five-year thing, therefore that's the number. Because, you know, Bellevue's got a big growth from 23 to 26. I do not know why they dropped in 20, from 22. Um, I do know why we have a big jump in 23. It's because we're going from full authority. And given that we didn't, get the ESSER dollars, and given that we are currently running a 11, 14, $17 million deficit budget, I don't have a problem with that jump. And I think our other growth from 61 to 70 is not unreasonable. And again, if forget, forget if we get um, enrollment stabilization or not, that's kind of a separate issue, but based on Right, there, there's only three things at play. There's, we cannot collect more than the 2,500 per student plus the inflationary measure. So there's inflation at play, there's enrollment at play. No matter what we forecast in the number, we can only collect 2,500 times inflation times enrollment. So, but I wanna build in the capacity to our, our dollar numbers so that if those kids do come back or, to Marnie's point, if inflation is even higher than what we think, we have the capacity to serve our students in the kind of system they want to be in. Right. And I, I would, uh, I'll go off of that and agree. I'm really concerned about inflation. So as much as you want to lower the student count, I want to raise the inflation rate. And in the end, we may end up exactly where we are now. And because, because of the different factors and the unknown that we have to live through over four years, if the inflation in 23 is seven, seven and a half percent, that ripples across all the future years as well. And so to the point of, I guess to me, my philosophy is to build in the capacity that will allow us to collect the dollars for all of our students that come and hedge against the inflation that is an incredible unknown going forward. And I don't have a problem given how poorly we were funded with ESSER dollars 
for a pandemic that affected our students and we had to respond with public health measures just like any other district, but we got far less money to manage that. So if one way to compensate for that is the legislature legally changing and allowing us in 23 or maybe even 24 to collect using our student enrollment at 1920, I'm okay with that. I think projections are projections. And to your point, Anne, to monkey with one number and the other number, at some point we, we pay people who all know a whole lot about school funding to pick a model, to pick a, um, an indice and stick to it. So for me, I'm wildly uncomfortable changing either because I've sat through multiple meetings and multiple sessions of why these are the indices we're picking. Do I like them? Do I think they'll be hard to swallow? Potentially, but to say we're gonna just now pick different indices for me is not tenable. And back to these numbers, Riverview is the only district in the area that had a non-passage. It's it is. And then Renton, Snoqualmie, well, congratulations Seattle. Congratulations to them. So, I mean, I, I'm really struggling with this one, but I, like picking a net new indice for me is incredibly troubling. I understand that the numbers may be problematic, but I, I, that for me in either direction is problematic. And I want to throw one other thing out there because we did have a member of the levy committee come out and speak, which thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, I watched almost all of those levy meetings. I listened to the questions. I listened to the people go back and forth about should it be this, should it be that? Why do we have this in it? Why do we have that in it? There was a lot of very thoughtful discussion and debate. We had 40 some people in the room. And if we just arbitrarily change the numbers, it's like, why did we bother? And to add on, because I was able to listen to many, if not, but not all of the levy committee meetings, if anything, the levy committee wanted to add more services. They, they do. For like, they came back and not only said, okay, we finally understand why we can't just add and get more. We, there are limits to what we'll be able to collect. And as we've all said, we can only collect what's legally allowed, but still they came back with the recommendation that said implement this, but could you please put a note in there? If you get any additional funding, please put it towards mental health counselors. That was the recommendation so, to me, yes. So to the ex so I, so I, I wanna feel comfortable that we've built in the capacity that would allow us to fulfill what we have in that list. And if we, if for some reason there did end up being more, those mental health counselors could be an important element. If I, um, if I could, I certainly, and, and I appreciate the concern um, that Dr. Gallinger expressed about, we want to, we want to win this the first time. And uh, I, I have to admit that um, politics is a hard thing for me to kind of predict right now. I will say, however, I thought Tuesday night was interesting because these passage percentages fall right in line with what these districts have done historically pre-pandemic. Mercer Island was frequently in the 70s when they passed levy issues. They're right back there again. Bellevue has uh, been in the 60s historically. Um, but one concern that I do have is, we, I know for a fact that some of these districts ran levies well in excess of what their capacity based on their current enrollment would be. Bellevue's almost the exact same size as us. And they are a per pupil district, just like we are, but you see large numbers in there. And we also know that the legislature is considering a hold harmless enrollment bill. Um, I don't know if that will pass or not, or what version of it will pass. If it does pass there, and we change this methodology, they're gonna collect more money than us. Go back to the pre-McCleary days. That was a problem for us. We were at a competitive disadvantage. We had a conversation a few minutes ago about recruitment and retention and hiring. And uh, whether we like it or not, we, we try to be collaborative with our neighbors, but we are competing for the same uh, candidate pools of teachers and administrators and the like. And I don't wanna be put at a disadvantage with uh, my surrounding neighbors. They, were, they uh, positioned themselves in a way to collect more money 
and we position ourselves in a way that doesn't allow us to do that. So that's a concern I have. And then the last thing I will say about this methodology, which I do support, and I, I really want to, I want to thank the board first and foremost. This is almost the first I've spoke about this tonight. But if you look in my notes, I have all the same questions and statements that I heard you all make, and it was kind of joyful for me to hear just how informed and plugged in you are. And then secondly, to my staff who has, and, and thank you, Dr. Gallinger, for acknowledging that, they, they, we appreciate the questions and try our darndest to get you and whoever needs the information to make an informed decision. So there was a lot of work that's been happening in the past two weeks since our last meeting to try to paint the picture and explain it because it is so complex. It's one of the, always been one of the challenges with levy elections in Washington state. We've, we've always had, whether it was pre-McCleary or post-McCleary, a complex web of school funding. And when we're sitting there talking about how you look at your property tax statement and what portion comes from the state and what comes from local and everything like that. Lastly, and maybe this is more of a personal matter because of my, where I'm headed, um, I'm deeply concerned about not setting us up for success down the road. So, you know, this is a four-year, my recommendation is for a four-year package. I want to make sure that this organization has the resources it needs to meet what I believe are the expectations of the community, not just next year, but during the life of this, this um, levy. And it's just a really hard time to predict right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I, and I think I can, I'll just chime in real quick first, Marnie, um, and then I'll go to you. The, the, the difference it would look like if we ratcheted down to our current enrollment numbers um, to where, what we're asking for now is about a $5 million spread that would eliminate our ability to collect any additional dollars if the levy enrollment stabilization is passed. And um, I was able to learn that, um, for example, Bellevue, who ran their levy, had that capacity compared to their current enrollment at $16 million. I was actually just going to ask that question. If we're the same size as Bellevue, yeah. how are they? At seventy million, and we're at sixty-one. How are they at eighty-three? Yeah, and we're I, at I can't. I can't imagine they're eighty-three, but part of their seventy is because they have built in the capacity to both contain, you know, be able to benefit from the um, enrollment stabilization and return of students, because so, we all know that could happen. So, is or their, inflation is their ask way higher than what they can get based on the twenty-five hundred dollars per kid? I will not opine, opine directly. I was going to say, I won't opine directly on my colleagues' assumptions. Uh, yes, they, they are lobbying and hoping that they will get a carve out yep. like Seattle in order to have a, a $3,500 per student uh, levy. Oh, wow. That's oh. news to me. So they had aggressive and they assumptions. They had previously lobbied. That, 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 that's, that's, well. that's, that's not, not new information. No, yeah. But I, I didn't recall that in this conversation. No, I, yeah. I did not realize But that's that. where they sit there. That's where their authority looks so large, Dr. Gallagher's point, is they they would like to continue to lobby based on their, they have authority for a higher levy, just like Seattle, because we talked earlier in the work study session, you know, McCleary is all about um, equalizing state funding until Seattle decided to get $1,000 more a kid. Right, um, right. And so, they're building in way more capacity than, than we, we are. are. And they passed at 60%. Right. And how could they ever be? Is this what these school districts are actually collecting? So Bellevue actually collected $83 million in 2022? No, that's why they ratcheted it down, in my opinion. They, they ratcheted okay, down so, based so on so enrollment. You're not, you're not showing us e equal numbers for that starting. I'm year. only showing you what's out of the voter pamphlet. I purely pulled it out of the voter pamphlet. Just like, I think for, so for me, uh, our voters aren't going to be voting based on a rollback. Our voters are going to be voting based on the, the four numbers that they see. And that's what they see and will assume that we will collect. And that's a fair assumption for them to make. Right. And, and that is a part of what we'll have to help educate our community about. Marnie? Well, I was going to say, that's, that's some of it, is that this is complicated. I mean, I got into uh, the school board stuff because of how complicated spent, yeah, the, the, the math was. Um, and I did note the same thing that that in Bellevue's ask, their ask at the beginning is our ask at the end. Um, 
what I'm hearing from, well, I, what I think I'm hearing is that you are uncomfortable with the, essentially the ghost money, assuming that we have students that we don't have. Correct. Uh, I'm uncomfortable. So if the state wants to give us money and like, so extra dollar money that I think we deserve, which if that were to come through, that'd be $20 million that, that we deserve. I'm uncomfortable with levying that on our local taxpayers to pay for students that we don't have. Well, I, I believe that the state will find it easier letting us levy our own community than paying for it out of their dollars, which by the way, levies our own community. Our community pays those, the, that portion of their taxes that go to the school that comes from the state goes into the state coffers and only a portion of it comes back to us. I mean, our levy dollars, frankly, are funding half of, you know, Eastern Washington. So I, I think that's, that's important to know that not all of those school tax dollars are coming into the Issaquah coffers. So for me, it's, it, regardless of where it comes from, it's going to be our taxpayer paying for it. Right. It, so whether it's the right. state or whether it's here. And so for me, I point. sit back and go, I need to know that I have enough for what we're going to do. The reason, the reason the, le the legislature is letting us, again, kind of what they did with McCleary is they raised, they wanted us to be able to raise taxes, right? So they took our, what we said and said, oh, well, well all of this is basic. Ed, if you want more, raise taxes, because they don't like doing that. Um, and I think it's their way of saying, well, you raise the taxes if you want to fund for the inequities of the ESSER dollars, which I went through. I asked Jake that for this. So how much would we have lost if the state did not provide the enrollment stabilization for, their, for the state apportionment? $9 million. So we'd be $9 million more in the hole. Uh, what if we lost it for the enrollment stabilization, stabilization this year? Would have been an additional $4.4 .4 million. And how much would we have lost if the state didn't provide the COVID release to get, relief to get us up to the $500? That's another $3 million. There's, there's money that we've gotten to help with some of those mitigations, but it certainly doesn't equal the $42 million that we lost, either through revenue that we didn't collect or stuff that we spent since March of 2020. And I know there's more because that just ended at last school year. I don't have the newest dollars for that. So for me, those calculations helped me actually make up some one-time money that I lost. I would like to see it to go towards learning loss, specifically around special ed. What kills me is the other page when we start talking about how much of the states, how much of special ed comes out of levy dollars. None should come out of levy dollars. And the money that's there is for compliance only. And this is, I'm, I'm passionate about this. We need to move beyond a, a, a compliance model in special education, or we will never move the dial in this district. We will never get the success that we want to see in students if we don't start doing something fundamentally different with our special needs students. And if this gets us some money to do that, to go beyond compliance, I am all in. But remember, it doesn't change the amount you'd collect. Like, so we are, the, what, what is proposed well, in front of us is, what is proposed in front of us is the list that is fully funded at a full authority levy. So it, it's not like there's more dollars coming into our district. Just but there will be less so. if I don't ask for the money and then we have the right to collect it. I'm going to go to Sydney because she's got her hand up. I do. <laughs> there is no historical pattern that indicates that the state will show up and fund this in the way you're suggesting. Now, it's one thing to say they should. It's one thing to say that they might or they are considering. But with no pre-McCleary or post-McCleary um, example, because that's why we sit here, Issaquah had problems before, Issaquah had problems after, with zero historical example to state that the state will actually show up and do this. It is our accountability to make sure we do that. Because what we're saying is, we will cut your programs, we will cut what's, what's most important to this community. And I think that would be outrageous, absolutely outrageous to say, I will sit here today, make up additional indices that make it a lower number to collect less than I know the community already needs with some assumption that magically the legislator shows up when there is no case to be made. When we look at neighboring districts, even, on, even though I bristle at the list, when I look at our, our neighbor right next door that is going even far and above what they can legally collect in their levy, it's, it's unconscionable. It would be, it would be, we would be remiss 
to sit here and not get the maximum for the students in this district. And I will add, if it magically happened, and that I agree with you, but if it magically happened and the state decided to give us a large number of ESSER dollars and we got all this more money, right. we can always choose when it's time to authorize this levy collection and say, wow, we got way more money from the state than we ever thought we would. Well, we don't have to collect as much from our levy. And as I recall, we did have that conversation we did. several years back of when we did have more money than we thought we would. Um, yes, but did. I also want to say, um, and again, I'm looking out to the out years and, and I'm, I'm less focused on this ghost enrollment thing because it's weird. I don't know if the state is going to do it or not, but I am concerned about 2026 is a long ways away. We don't know what the pandemic is going to do. Maybe somebody's going to invent a COVID pill and life is going to be wonderful and all the kids come back and I can read the emails now. You knew this growth could happen. Why did you not plan for it? Why did you not build capacity into the levy so that you could provide the counselors and the nurses and the support services for the 23,000 kids in your district, right? It could happen. I don't know if it will. I don't have a crystal ball. It could happen. I want to have the capacity in the levy if it does, and if it doesn't, we won't collect it. We legally can't collect it, and it's okay. I don't think people look at their ballots and say, wow, it's 67 million in 2025. I really believe it should be 65 million. I'm voting no. I just, I don't think that's how 90% of voters operate. I think most of the voters, well, I mean, and if you think about it, many voters don't have children in our schools, but as a community, they have high regard and value for the quality schools that we have. And this levy is about maintaining the programs that we have implemented that, that help our community really embrace and love our schools. So I wanna maintain what we currently have and I wanna give us the best shot at collecting the funds that would do that as do i it's for me this conversation for me is not about collecting dollars it's about collecting votes mm -hmm. right so i'm not questioning the desire for collecting every dollar that our students should get that's not at all what i'm having a conversation about i'm having a conversation about how do we strategically position ourselves so we collect every vote that we can because i think we're going to need every single vote this year we saw uh to what what our superintendent said, what was different about Issaquah than any other district around us post McClurdy, we dropped in ways that no other district in East King County dropped. And it was substantial. And I think that's where we're positioning ourselves. And I want us to approach this from a position of strength. Mm -hmm. Marnie? I recall in the past two elections post McClurdy, yes, the voters were like at in the 50s, we also on both of those occasions did the same exercise we're doing now. We reduced the amount that the levy committee brought to us to say, let's save every vote. And that's why we're in this hole where we get this huge jump from this year to next is because we did this before. And so what we're asking is this time, let's go ahead with the assumption. And, and we made that decision, not knowing a pandemic was coming our way and what a luxury it would be if we had that extra 23 million over those four years. I think. For me, I know that there are 35% of people that are gonna vote no for sure. They voted for somebody who believes the earth is flat. So I really don't think that you, you know that, it's gonna happen. So the, the fact that whether or not this it might squeak, it might not, it might be, are they listening to say, yes, they're gonna be supporting our children. They see what's happening. We can't hire more um, counselors right now, and they're asking for it. We can't hire more uh, school security officers. We might need it right now. So I guess for me, it's a matter of, I already see places where we're not able to purchase things, we, things we're not able to do for our students because we didn't know. And we tried to appease a group of, of, 
of voters that aren't going to be appeased no matter what you tell them. Sydney? Yeah, I, I think we've had a good spirited conversation. Why don't we, if Harlan, your concern is around what you'd rather model, let's do it. What would you suggest? Uh, well, first of all, before we get there, I wanted to say uh, I, I need to hear from our CFO because uh, I've heard this bantered around now multiple times about how we're not at, like we're under collecting our authority. And now taking hold harmless aside, this year in 2022, based on our current students, are we collecting our full authority of our levy of $54 million? Well, we can check real quick. Martin, would you put that 19, 2000, 20,000 up there in the- like, that's, what, that's what I'm asking. Yeah. Dr. Gallinger and I, we believe we're both correct in one fashion or another. Yeah, because I was going to chime in here too. So, so if you use this year's current enrollment, I believe we wouldn't collect all of the money. I think that's where he's going to end up. But when we passed this levy and took it to our voters or, you know, we, we pushed it out to our voters, we expected our enrollment to be that 20,872. We were projecting that is where we were. The only reason we're not there now is because we're in the middle of a pandemic and we had an enrollment decline. So to me, I think the fair number is to leave the current en or the enrollment we had in 1920 and say with that enrollment is what we probably would have had going into this year, we would not have been able to collect at the full authorization on the dollars per student. So we, we have this analysis in our package. Isn't that what you're asking the levy history post McCleary? That says no, we're- No, 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 I'm asking it. So yeah. when, when this, what, is it, what does it say? 50, yeah. Martin, that's like 52. Would be our authority. So our authority, if we used our levy pre House Bill fourteen seventy six, which we talked about during the budget process, drives what four million dollars over four point four million over a two year period, and we split that over two cycles. Because so, Dr. Gallinger is correct. If we did not have a hold harmless, we would be at full authority. So I just want to anchor our conversation. I just want I, what I don't want is I, I want to. This is where I know this is complex, and I get that. But I want our district to, to say things that are true, not things that are confusing to voters. And to say we, we are under collecting our levy isn't a true statement. And to say that, that we don't have a tax increase. So if you look here, right, by both rate and amount. So in our 2022 levy, our stated, again, this is all estimate, but our stated estimate for tax rate, because they're always estimates, yep. was it all or 36? We're moving, and what we're requesting for voters is we're guessing is what? About 43. About 43. That is an increase. Or if you go by the dollar amount of from 54 million to 61 million. So I'm okay with it being an increase. I'm not opposed to it. What I am opposed to is for us not speaking honestly and transparently. That's what I'm looking for. And so when I don't get that part of it, it makes me not trust the assumptions behind them. Well, I, and so I think there we're going to have to differ because I think they're being honest and transparent about the numbers that they have provided to us. So I think you're, you have, that's your opinion and you can own that one, but I think they have been honest and transparent about the information and provided it to us so that we can see it for ourselves. I, I think in this case, um, truthfully, there are two ways to communicate the number. The statutory authority would include House Bill 1476. Our original authority, the statutory authority, our original authority would be what Harlan's number was. But both, I mean, both numbers are technically correct. It's just how you, how you ask the question and how the data was displayed. But when we go to the Levy Development Committee and say, we're doing this, this is our springboard proposal, and then there's no tax increase here, like, that's, I don't think they ever said there was no tax didn't increase. Say that. They ever said stable it's a, tax rate. And so put up the tax rate chart, or the one that goes we, over. And I think years. it's the total we also, tax rate. Yes, we think we were clear. talking about tax all rate. three measures combined, and we always refer to stable. Um, I don't believe we ever said that this was going to be a, a declining. It's, the, well, it's all the, four. The it's all four taxi measures, to be clear. Or all, yeah, that's right, because we still have yeah. bonds in oh, there. Right, well. right. And how much anybody's taxes changes depends both on the rate and the change in their assessed value of their property, especially against the overall of the district. So, so that's why we never speak to actual tax increases, because we cannot know that part. 
we don't know the rates, right? And that, that's what we don't know. But we don't know the, rates either, but the, we don't the, know the assessed are. value either. But, but we do. Individual. But we do know the overall dollar amount. And if you were to go to the tax, uh, the, the, the column ones, you see that our what we're total collecting today in 2022 versus what we're projecting to collect in 2026 right, is, exactly. a, is a wildly different number. No, it's the. Well, and there's always see... two ways to talk about taxes, aggregate amount or rate. And there's never been agreement from any elected body that I've ever served, you being the only one, uh, on how to communicate that effectively during campaigns. Sometimes we've had lower aggregate amounts. During the recession, we actually had lower aggregate amount of taxes. And then we often go back to rate when we have uh, growing assessed valuations, um, because that is the way that people often look at their tax bill. They don't often look at the tax bill. Oh, this the district's levying me 75 million. They want to know what the fuck per thousand is for the 380. So we communicated in different ways over the years. I've gone down the aggregate route. Um, and then we often our tax messages about combined rate total, mm -hmm. um, all four measures. And I'm saying there's three potentially on the ballot. One was passed in 16 and 12 and et cetera. The bonds were still paying debt, um, but it's combined rate. And you know, have heard me many times here at the dais, the goal is to be as boring as possible on the yep. tax rate. Boring. Stable, Stable. flat. But to directly answer Sydney's question, if we went back to that initial chart, it would, uh, I would love to see what the numbers would look like if we, if we shot the middle. So if row nine had an enrollment assumption that was half of what uh, you have projected, like if you match like, so whatever the bottom number is and the top number is divided by two and add, like that. So I think it's roughly like 800 students. So if you change that, add. Martin can do that. I, I can't, Cause I can't see it. So I don't know what the difference yeah. is between the two. Yeah. So something just, just ballpark it. That, that's what I would be looking for. So like to, to 20,000 flat yeah, as sure. opposed to. Sure. I would say though, that I know, as far as I know, there's still more housing being built between now and 2025. Right. But we'll, and we'll have a structural, uh, challenge to overcome currently if we have kindergarten classes of 1200 entering and we have graduating classes of 1500 exiting we're already at every given year we're at minus 300 over the next several years so it's not just like so the growth now is going to have to be dramatic for us to hit 21,000 students right now just because of the hole that we're in after the pandemic we're, we're it's just structurally different and I think that we will get there, but I bet we aren't going to get there till 2030. What we, where I thought we were going to be in 2023 is now probably a decade later. And so, again, I, I'm not saying I want us to collect every single penny, but I want us to be able to collect every single vote too. I, and it's not about just to vote for this levy. It's about building that trust. Like we've heard over and over from this community about be transparent, rebuild trust, because we know we're probably going to have at least one more bond out there. And we, we want to show this one and to all those volunteers and all those parents out there that this one is going to pass over 60%. Like that's our target for this. So then we can confidently go out for a bond. I would point out, we did go over 60% on our last levy. We did, but, but immediately pre McCurry, we were 53. We were. And then then we went back to yeah. We also had a we an op-ed like from our points. legislators against our levy in that year. Yeah, which I would hope that they wouldn't do this time. Yeah. Um, but I don't see. I don't know. I don't know that I agree. I remember two years in a row. I can't, I don't have the data right in front of me, but it it's it's data we've been given where we had five hundred students a year, year over year, two years in a row. So I don't know that I agree that in the out years, after we're remo removing masks from children which will, that will come at some point when we feel safer, when families feel safer, when inflation is so bad, they can't afford their private school. Like they did back in 2011, those kids come back. And I think we'll get to that 21,000 uh, way sooner than 2030. Sydney, I saw you had your hand up. I, 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 oh. I see that we're live updating, but I can't see that far. So I'll log in the zoom myself. I guess my concern is, oh, yeah. And that I think is the concern of many people is that the numbers are based on an indice. We know what it is. Oh, Stephen so, will do it. No, don't. Stephen will do it. So I, I, like, I don't know what this is. Divide by two, split the middle. Like I'm trying to buy a piece of property, but what is it based on? Like, what is it pertaining to? What is the? What is it based on for me 
I, this just is illogical. So I'm going to go to flat 20,000 because it looks better. So we can do it. And it's frankly not that far off. I'm just not understanding what we're trying to accomplish. And when someone asks me, what is that enrollment based on? What do I say? Uh, you say that we're overestimating our enrollment. I disagree. I disagree that we're overestimating. I think that we did an estimate based on factors that we can demonstrate. Overestimating is an opinion. Right. And and well, there are we're projecting already that, down there. Like we already see. So we we see what enrollment we're projecting. So what, what is this based on? 20,000. Based on what? And there is a rationale for the 20,872. You may not like the rationale for the other number, but what is the rationale for this one? Uh, it's finding a middle ground is what the rationale is. Not That's not a mathematic rationale that we, we base budgets on. I think it's actually, I, if I can, it's a, more of a political. I mean, I, I think what I heard Dr. Gallinger say at the beginning was he thought that if that number, and, and you see what it did, it moved it from 71 million to 70 million, that if the number is smaller, that that would incur more votes. I don't know that I, I don't know that I agree with that assumption. Um, I, I I mean, it's possible. It's hard to say. Like I said earlier, the political barometer I think has been kind of thrown cattywampus um, post pandemic. But I mean, if our community is like any of the communities around us, they are over levying and uh, based off of hold harmless and other enrollment projections, or in the case of one of our neighbors, a belief that they might get a big legislative bump up at some point and their communities are still supporting it. And I believe our community will support it as well. Um, it's incumbent upon us to make the case and um, we have a wonderful Volunteers for Issaquah Schools um, campaign committee that has, I mean, we had a tough close race in 18. That's the only close race we've had in the 21 years I've been here. We've passed, we've never failed a levy in the time that I've been here or a bond. Um, I do, I have to say, I, I'm a little troubled sometimes by uh, some of the criticism of how this is put together and some of the questioning um, uh, of our fiduciary um, responsibilities. I would point out we've not had an audit finding from the state of Washington in 19 consecutive years. Um, people have accused us of not being transparent, but yet I go back and I look at the materials and the messages we send out, and I've had to send out some pretty Un uncomfortable messages. We haven't even talked about the capital levy yet, but we do it. And so I, I, I mean, we just, I think we're, we, we, and here we are, we're having this conversation tonight and, and I appreciate the conversation. I do agree. There's, there's a different way you could look at it. But as I said earlier, my concerns are, I want to make sure we, we are doing everything we can to ensure our success in those out years and that we can remain competitive in the labor market. All right, I have Suzanne and then Marnie have their hands up. Okay, um, I had three things and I've already oh, forgotten one of them. Get it back. Um, first thing I wanna say is I agree with everything Marnie said about five minutes ago. Oops, I thought she laid it out really, really well. Uh, the second thing is I totally disagree with this concept because we don't know we don't know what's gonna happen in the out years in 25 and 26. And I would much rather build capacity that we don't need and collect less than to not build the capacity, end up needing it because we do have growth and then being told we were totally irresponsible, which in my opinion, we would have been. Um, I agree with what Ann said earlier. I don't even know if those inflation numbers are high enough. I see our neighbors building in way more capacity than we're building in. And I'm not saying, ooh, let's go out and grab every last dollar the state lets us ask our taxpayers for. But I'm saying we know what programs we want this to fund. We've added up the numbers. We don't know what enrollment will be. And we don't know what inflation will be. We have to build in that capacity to not do it would be irresponsible. And, and I just think we have to build it. If we don't collect it, we don't collect it. We tell our voters we were overly optimistic and you know you don't have to pay as much money. But to try to save every dime 
there's too big a risk of being wrong. And if we're wrong, we can't fund the counselors, we can't fund the mental health, we can't fund the PBSES, we can't fund the learning recovery. And we're hearing over and over again in our public input, this is what people want, this is what people need. Why aren't we hiring more people? But we're running a budget deficit. I would love it if the state gave us ESSER money and we could tax our taxpayers less. Um, I'm not holding my breath. Mm -hmm. So I just, I don't want to split the difference. I want to go with the numbers we had. I wouldn't be upset if those numbers were higher, except that that would lose the stable tax rate argument. Mm -hmm. And I do want, I do want to say to our voters that we did everything we could to keep the tax rate stable. I understand we can't promise them that their actual taxes will go up or down. We don't know that. We do our best to model it. But I just, I think it's irresponsible not to plan for growth or inflation. I want, I want the ask to potentially be bigger than what we need. Marnie? So I think the other side of the coin on this is the the actual costs. And this is what the levy committee spent their time doing, saying what things do we want to actually purchase? Um, now I'm assuming, I, well, I don't know. I, I, well, I should assume that the numbers that we are, have on this page um, actually reflect the 20,000 plus nearly 21,000 students, I'm assuming. Because my question would be, how do I get to paying $64,853,000 worth of expenses when I'm collecting, what is it, $57,58 million for that year? You but I don't know if these assumptions are based on those same numbers. Okay. So, mm -hmm. I, I guess a few things. No, I, Does, oh, go wait ahead. Marnie, you still going? The calculation of the numbers on the other sheet, are those calculations based on 19,000 students, 20,000 students, 21,000 students, when you try to figure out what's the additional teacher responsibility time or what's the school nurses, nursing support or- Current budget, most of those items, unless we extrapolate them forward a few years. Most of those items are current costs. And just extrapolated with mm -hmm. so like an see, inflation? So if there was a four-year look, you would see escalation in some of the labor pots, uh, et cetera. But for the most, what you're seeing on that list is what we are paying currently for those items. And then in the out years, I guess for me, it's and in the out years, the is out it simply years, an inflationary yep. percentage? Mm -hmm. Many of those have like percentage? a three or 4% increase. I, I think that the hard part right now is there's, there's a few ways you can, you can deal with unknowns. You can, be, you can lean towards conservatism, <laughs> which I've done many times on the financial side, or you can lean towards risk management or kind of a forward-looking prophylactic uh, look. Here's what I want to say that's before you. You have a 15 to $17 million deficit right now. How do you plan to make that up? You don't have to answer the question. Just want to think about that. 20,000 enrollment, as, the, as the, the, the doc just proposed, that drives about $11.3 million less over four years. I believe something like that we talked about. Um, so you have to think about to yourself. We un and we can argue about what under levying means, because I think there are some semantics there that probably need to be clearer. But we were 23 million under over a four year cycle last time, which we showed you under our authority. Now, I think that it was still prudent to under levy in the first two years of the cycle. But your CFO and your superintendent both times brought you full authority recommendations. Just a reminder of what we did. Those were our professional recommendations, but there's always politics are politics. So you have a large deficit. You have a huge amount of pent up. There's just a lot of demand for support right now that we can't fulfill, um, which you know is heartbreaking. And then we have inflation and then unknown enrollment patterns. So all of those would lead me to believe that you need a levy, the superintendent's recommendation. Even that could be a bit light. Um, but those things, I, I don't have answers for you right now, but remember you, you were in the hole. If we were, if we were to break even, I might be over on the dock side a little bit about the ratchet down because we, we know what our costs are, but we are in the hole about what uh, a quarter of a levy collection, right? 25%, 15 million out of a 60. So you're not starting from a place where you have a lot of freedom. You're starting from a deficit position that you need to then either 
fill by making reductions, which nobody wants to do, or you need to acquire new revenue. Those are your only two options. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, and, that's my advice. And from this one, it looks like with a nominal 4% 4, 4 3% growth year over year, we get further and further in the hole if we don't collect, mm -hmm. I mean, well, on here, we got further and further in the hole until the last year. Correct. And so for me, that in and of itself, if we reduce what we're actually authorizing to be collected, we're guaranteed we're in the hole even more and all the way even into the fourth year. Because I think these expenditure costs, we're still going to have to have conversations about not being able to do everything on here. Because I think it's going to be more than 4%, 3%, 3%, 3%. Right. Um, we, we have in talking with our labor groups and stuff, I've made it clear. It's really, in order to dig out of this hole, it isn't just these levies. We've, we've shown we couldn't do it with just these. It's a combination of legislative support and levies that will help us from having to continue to reduce staff at a time when all you're getting from your your employees and many in your community is a request for more staff. And as Ann pointed out, the committee said, also, if you can do anything more in the mental health um, side, we would want you to do that. So, I mean, I, we have to attack this problem at all fronts from the levy and from the legislative side. We need both to come in. Then why don't you keep the numbers as they are, but add to the resolution uh, a specific language that says if we receive the ESSER dollars, then we won't collect the hold harmless money. Well, mm -hmm. for one reason, this um, this is becoming our last opportunity. This is our last scheduled meeting before this um, resolution needs to go out to King County, and I don't feel it's prudent of us to be on the fly changing a resolution that goes through legal counsel to be prepared for us. Well, and I, I guess I'd also want to know the, the current bill as it's proposed would take us to um, $1,500 of ESSER floor. That would be 1,000, about $19 million in our case. That's assuming that it, that floor holds. I already know that there've been legislators who have proposed a, a lower floor of 1,000, 1,200. There's a lot of unknowns that I think are still in that. And to Director Moore's point, we're not going to know probably the results of that until March 10th. And you have to be registered for your April election prior to that. So there is some risk there. Oh, and you won't even know about, you know, the whole Dharma stuff for, I mean, even beyond that. I don't, and, I don't think necessary. we will. So I don't, but the point of the resolution is to show, to be able to say to our taxpayers, hey, so we're telling you we are going to, we, we need every penny and we're going to sure we do that. But if we get excess dollars, we're committing to you to not collect them. Well, you do what have heard, that opportunity each year. I know we have it each year. I have been here six years and that's not something that we see happens. So I think if we codified it, that would bring me to a comfort level mm -hmm. where I would, I would be fine with these assumptions. Marnie. I'm still going back to the fact that even if we collect it, we're still in the hole. I mean, we're still, so it, it's going to fill up some of the hole we've lost, or maybe it fills up all of it. But if you add up how much over the next four years of a hole we're digging deeper, I, I think that those monies just keeps us from digging that hole so deep. I, I don't understand why I would change, reduce how much I'm collecting because I'm still concerned about the hole we're digging beyond to this year. And to oh, me, I, I, both. I think Harlan makes a great point. And we have the entire explanatory statement of the ballot measure to do that in. So I think that's a, a wonderful point to make a longer treatment of the greater explanation of the circumstance and our intent. Mm. So I, I think that's a great point. I, I would, um, the explanation, explanatory statement is not something we have a lot of leeway in what is said. So I, I don't, yeah. I, I don't know that we can do that. I, this is new for us to yeah. be in the voters guide and to have the explanatory statement. Let's find out. So let's see. We, we have a draft explanatory, explanatory statement from council uh, prepped for uh, you all. We do have some leeway about content, not as much on uh, length. So, and much more confining on your ballot measure, obviously. That is a 
legal instrument that binds you um, and your, uh, as you make a uh, ballot measure to the public. The explanatory statement, we have three in draft already. Um, we could circulate that back out to the board if we wanna see if we can encapsulate uh, the point by Dr. Gallinger. Uh, that would be an option. And that is mm -hmm. not due to the 25th. Because, because why this matters is remember, so as we go to the ballot, as our ballots are dropped, we're going to have this legislative clarity. So what we don't want is the messaging coming out from Olympia of like, look at we're pushing $20 million to the class school Fair district. Point. And now is is asking for X. Yeah. So point. I'm fine I with compromising either way. But the point is, is we don't need both. And it will still allow us to collect every penny. Like I'm all for full authority money. So I'm not asking for us to cut back on that. And you're right, there are structurally things that we may have to look at differently in how we do funding. I do believe that based on everything that we've seen and heard, that there is going to be roughly $3 million to Issaquah for the counseling nurses as they adjust the formulas. So I think that is going to provide capacity for us. And I'm all for, like, we have mental health counselors because of what this board has pushed, mm -hmm. just to be very clear. So. I think there's unanimity in what we want to support students and teachers. I don't think that's in question tonight. I I love that, Harlan. And there's a lot of words in this one from Bellevue. Mm -hmm. I got it. Like, so, there's a lot of words yeah. available so, to um, us here. Jake, the uh, explanatory statements, tell me about them. Because is this something... I, so when I've asked before, it's not something that the board actually author has to vote on. No, can, no. Can I, interrupt? I, I don't actually care about the explanatory statement. That, that can stay clean in the ballot measure. We can just have it in there. That way, if we get asked the question. But the ballot measure is back to changing the resolution, which we do not have the time at this point being here where these start, the final issues are being raised. We have to make a decision about putting this forward so that we can get it to King County in time. Sorry. And so I'm, I've I'm, said that from the beginning, too, as far as our timeline. I just want to be clear that when I look at the ballot measure, the ballot measure in total is made up of parts. Yes. Those parts are the resolution, the explanatory statement, the, and then all the other statements involved. So the explanatory statement is, is what makes up, part of what makes up the ballot measure in total. The resolution is just one component of that. So on the, it, it's right here in the main page, no place else. And just to give an example, again, I happen to have Bellevue's up. They're very clear on programming, but they're also clear on exact um, levy collection and what it's subjected to. So that is already included here. And I think is a great basis for what Harlan's suggesting. So I, I just don't, I, the ballot measure is a compilation of those two pieces. And we could, agree to vote on something that the board president and their superintendent Jake go and codify with the intent. And to Ron's point, I think I would say, I would put an, um, probably an amount rather than, cause you're right, if, if they came back with 500 vested dollars, that's not sufficient for me. Yeah. It's the assumption of they're gonna, they're gonna give us $20 million, which would fill our hole. It would overfill our hole. Yeah. But I don't wanna be, I don't wanna be accused of by this community of saying, you're taking more money, and now you're taking our money and you don't ever stop taking money. Right. So I'm that, not clear uh, exactly yeah. on what type of language you want and where you want this. And, uh, so I think you, in, in, our, in our typical rollback language, if you, if you would put our, oh, put yeah. our resolution up on there, right? So we, we have specific rollback language in, our, in every resolution, mm -hmm. right? You would, you would clarify in that rollback language yeah. that so, but you're should the state about... deliver... Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Should the state deliver what we want to say, Esther? I don't, we probably take a different word for it. $20 million dollars in pandemic of... relief. Any, any dollars that are in excess of X amount, we can choose that whether it's 20 million or whatnot, we will not collect from our local levy, but like you, the rollback dollars. But what you're talking about would go directly into this resolution. That has been already been vetted by. It, it, you're going to. You would still have time to go through. No, legal. we have to vote on this resolution. We cannot go and change it now. The, yes, the resolution is before us now, and that's what we're voting on. What well, Sydney was saying, and where I thought she was going, was to the extent something could be put into the explanatory statement that is not voted on by the board. Yes, there am is, I am yeah. I not the, the, following this? Right? The actual language Correct. that you see on the ballot is what gets vetted out by our attorney. 
the, and it's very prescriptive in terms of how many words it can be in there and everything. I'm not sure that the explanatory statement is not in we don't solution. vet it out in the same way, do we, Jake? The explanatory statement is only confined by length. So it's not like the, the legal instrument that council creates and we review, that is a legal instrument because as Dr. Gounder says, it says about how, what your levy authority is when under statute you collect rollback. Um, and then it actually has the ballot language in it. The What the voter sees is that box mm -hmm. with the yes vote, it's yeah. the school district board directors by a resolution, blah, 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 has put forward and there will be a yes and no and then dollar amounts. That's what the voter sees along with the pamphlet. So I just voted not too long ago. Pamphlet came come in the ballot this time, which I thought was interesting. Usually they come as a standalone. Um, and then you have your pro cons in the in the pamphlet along with your explanatory and then your ballot, which just has your language and resolution. The resolution itself is not part of the mailing. It's often a, you have to usually go to King County's website to get your full resolution. Who writes the explanatory statement? <laughs> Council has a draft for us. We approve it in the end. Yeah, right. And that wouldn't no, change. Who approves it in the end? We do. Well, administrators. Yeah, administ I just want to be clear when you say we, the, oh, whether yeah, you were we directing it at the board. Yes. We, you, the, the superintendent. The How about that? I'll make it simple. Thank you. Thank you. You do not have to take a board action to approve the explanatory okay, that's, statement. I just wanted to clarify so, that again. So it sounds to me, if I heard uh, Mr. Cooper correctly, and I believe I did, we could change the explanatory statement to reflect the concept of if the state comes through with um, ESSER or COVID support dollars in excess of you, whatever number we're comfortable with, 15 million, 20 million, somewhere in between, um, that could be there. That would be a written document that we would produce publicly that would express that position. Goes to every voter. It would be it, it's le it, it's so a few legal. I, I don't know off the top of my head. I don't know if it'll be legally binding to you all as a body. Uh, if that's an explanatory statement. I don't believe yeah. that. It does say something to the voters. Just to make sure we're clear. Right. Yeah. I don't want you to think it is. It would be. I don't believe it would be legally binding. Probably not legally binding no, on but, this body. Uh, I I believe that this system be has always acted with integrity. Yes. One hundred percent. But I always like to separate legality from practicality. If yeah. I can. So Harlan, are you talking about just the rollback in the first year? Well, it'd be, it depends on what the hold harmless uh, uh, language is, like what it gets approved, right? The Senate has one year, the House has two years. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be a, a hard sell to get the one year, uh, much less two years, but it would be the, the total amount, which for us, we're talking four or $5 million. So we're not even, like we would be far more. I, mean, I, I, I think one way to do it would be that you say that if you, if you receive state funds in excess of your current operating deficit, that's one measure. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's one. That's a concept. That, that is a number. That is, that is a language. I, Cause I, I'll, I'll jump in. Right. Cause that, that is uh, what concerns cause me Cause I am my, my biggest concern is that how do we that we have up? holes? Well, we have holes yeah. that go all the way through. I can't say without my glasses, 2025. So I, I wouldn't feel comfortable otherwise saying, oh, I'm not going to accept the additional dollars from the state or I'm just going to supplant them. I think for me, the hole continues on for quite some time. And so I want to make sure I, I like that language of if we have excess, then what our, our expected expenditures are. Then I'm fine with that. At, at any point, that would just be a rule. That would be a Marnie rule. If you ever came to me and said, we're collecting more money than we have budgeted to spend, we'd have a conversation. Right. But that and that the through the vehicle to say that is the explanatory statement. Is that, that is, what this body, this group is saying? That is a vehicle. Well, we don't have time to change the resolution. I know that's yeah. what I am yes. trying to say. It's the resolution itself is the thing that has already I, gone through legal We have counsel. in the past. We have put this language in the resolution at one point in the past. Yeah. There were most of you weren't here, Marnie was. Um, we have done it, um, but we have more time. I, in I, this case, I would encourage the body, the, what I want to have the exact language that uh, Dr. Gallinger and the board is thinking about, because if we do get additional proceeds for nurses and psychs, it's an example, mm -hmm. Well, we've been backfilling them since the existence of the school district. So, but that money, again, could go to deficits, expanding program, or not, basically not reducing. Student sports. 
So, and see, this is why I'm not I, I'm not know. comfortable because I'm not clear what language we're talking about. And the only thing I've heard that I might even think about supporting would be Marnie's thing of if the state came up with enough money to offset our current deficit. That one I might I might go with. But this idea that we're going to nickel and dime every little thing and oh we get three million for nurses, we're going to roll it back. I just think that's way too complicated. No, it, you it's not. It's the, it's purely the the COVID pandemic relief dollars. And which we we know as ESSER. And so we could either refer to that, but I think I would be more general. And it's really, I would be fine if you even called out the House bill or Senate bill that it's in, right? I mean, so it's talking about this legislation. It's because of the timing, right? The whole issue is timing. And because the legislative session is going to end near the same time as we're going out to the voters, and we just want to have that clarity that we're not going out for hey because it's it will be everyone can you know like oh look, we got 20 million dollars from the state but you're talking about offsetting esser dollars you're not talking nothing about, else you're not talking about um just the lost hold harmless oh wait no, no i'm not talking about hold harmless no that's that's the point is like it's either it's either or is what my intent is the, the, See, the I think statement this is it's, too it's just too complicated to come up I, with this. I don't. So let's okay. relax a second. Yeah. Take a breath. Because I think Harlan offers us a moment to come together on this topic. And so I think we're, we're allowing the worry of time to get us off a good solution. We have, I think we can be clear, we have devices available to us to communicate our intent to all voters on this ballot. And our it's, at least in my mind, what I believe I, our collective intent is not to over collect in a way that is inappropriate and that there may be other funding available to us. We, we have components of this submission of the ballot that are due immediately and that require the board to act. And we have components that do not, that are available to us. And I think, we have many examples of where, and just looking at the one I'm at, where they're saying the same thing, right? The collection is subject to legal limits and other adjustments potentially from the state. I think we have both time and the will to get that right here. So I just don't want to get over rushed about what is in the, the what's, whatever the top part is called, which does have a different timeline and focus on, we have a vehicle available to communicate just that and not miss that opportunity. Yeah. No, I understand that we have the vehicle. I think where we're not in agreement is on what we would potentially roll back. Correct, and, and, and we have time to do that based on the timeline Jake just said of... Well, no, the board has to make the decision. The board has to make the decision now of what of how, how we would phrase what we put in that statement. I mean. No, no, this is what I'm saying. I think we're mixing two issues. If we can be in agreement on what is in the, what is in the suggested language on the resolution and we can come back and we can, we can agree that we will leverage the explanatory statement in order to communicate additional information, that does not change or alter what we need to do now in a timely fashion. That's why I'm worried we're getting excited right. about the time. Well, what, what we need to do now in a timely fashion is the passage of the actual resolution language, which authorizes the district to send that ballot measure to King County to place on the April 26th. What goes into the explanatory statement? We have more time on that part. So we could we could pass something that's or so the, a passage of the resolution really needs to be clean. But then we could also pass something that, in, that if we're talking about passing something, or depends whether we're talking about actually passing something or a head nodding agreement to a phrasing that we're going to try to put into the explanatory statement. So, and that's the part I'm unclear you, on. Right. Technically, you are time bound on the The 25th is when you have to have everything in the county. Right. No matter what. No matter what. We have to have the resolution, the explanatory, the pro con. That's it. So your time bound is the same, but to your point, you don't have a meeting scheduled between now and the 25th, right. I'm aware of. No, you there are, are no more meetings. So the, the board, 
nor does the right. writing of the explanatory statement require us to have a meeting. Right. That's, that's what that's I was getting there. That's my point. The language I was getting that would there. go into it. So the board could take action on the resolution. And then I, I do think it takes some, it would need the appropriate language. Well, I need to do some mathematics as well on right. the explanatory statement because the last thing you want to do is harm the school district financially when there's, you can see, there's demands for staffing, there's demands for wages, um, but we're still in decline in enrollment. Um, so we'd have to be very careful about how it's written. But if it wants to be conveyed to the voters that if the district was receiving ESSER funds or ESSER supplanting funds or whatever you want to call it. Additional in state revenue. In excess, well, additional state revenue makes me nervous. No, I would there's do that. a COLA. Yeah, call it out. Don't it do works. that, Superintendent. That. No, no. Because <laughs> there's a cost of living <laughs> adjustment. There's DRS adjustments. There's, there's, there's things that are going to make the, the budget higher. There's also inflation just generally on their MSOCs and things like that. So if it, if it is a compromise about ESSER or hold harmless, even that hold harmless gets me a little nervous because some of those are can be really big, right? So I just need to figure out if it's enrollment hold harmless. And then there's levy hold harmless based on enrollment. And then there is ESSER hold the floor. So there's three, three vehicles, last I checked. I, I'm still trying to figure out why, if we're getting money from the state, we'd give it back, essentially. Well, this is not getting money from the state. This well, is no. getting money from our community. No, so no. You, you say, if we get this money from our state, we don't want this other money over here designated for something else. I that that's the part I don't understand. Right. I still see a hole. Right. It that no continues sense. on into per, perpetuity. So even if I get 15 million from the state now or 15 million from this or 20 million from the state now, I still have a levy that I'm asking for that is going to be in the hole. Because our levy is intended to serve students. And when we're collecting dollars on students that aren't there, I just don't believe that's right. So, that, so that's where we disagree because I think that that is how they're telling us, by the way, here's some additional money for additional supports because we don't know how to give it to you any other way. Right, because we know what we're giving you is inadequate. So we're going we're gonna to give you a lever that would allow you to do it yourself. And we know that you would otherwise hit a cliff if we really didn't have the reserves right now, if we ran out of our reserves, we'd be severely cutting programs. And so I- Aren't you two agreeing right now? I'm sorry. No, no we're absolutely so. not no. agreeing. I, I, I think I'm that fine. we should be collecting the ghost money and he thinks we shouldn't. That's essentially what the disagreement is. I mean, the ghost money just to the board and all the community understands the uh, change an alteration of the levy formula has been going on for 30 or 40 years. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. So we so had PPI, easier. which is per people inflator. I had as if I-728 was there, right. as if I-732 was there. I think I was part of all that. That was the original, Those the original ghost money. money. Ghost money. Right. Um, so the, the inflation and deflation of uh, the levy base by the legislature is a very common thing. And it's often done at the request of local school districts who have either levies authorized or yeah. they think their voters are going to approve it. I mean, but just so you know, it's this is nothing new. All of those previous uh, things we were involved in and they all received legislative approval. Well, they also drove billions of dollars of money to K-12 across And that the was state. also done in austere environments versus now our state legislature has the biggest surplus yeah. that they've ever had. So we're not in an austere environment right now where they're going to go ahead and open out the levy authority like they have in the past to say like, oh, you're right, Marnie, like uh, you, we can't fill the hole, but you can go ahead and fill it yourself. That, that's not the environment we're in right now. But sometimes, well, I will say this, that I have had, I got a call from Ross Hunter one session when he was in the ledge and he's like, oh, things are looking good. What do you want the PPI to be? Um, the per people inflator. And because they had money, remember, because every time they raise the lo local levy lid, then LEA has to kick in. So if right. they, back then, if you messed with a local levy, they had to, Put the LEA. So on good times, Harlan, I have had phone calls where like, hey, so it you now in austere times, post global financial crisis, that was a, that was hey state, I'm not putting anything. Locals, you're on your own, and I'll see you in a few years. I mean, this, we all, we'll we'll we raise your levy authority. Or your authority now that go was out the and gift get it. they gave us. Well, and this is this is where nomenclature matters. We keep calling this the ghost money because it's it's easy conceptually to wrap your head around that we're getting money as though students were there because we lost them. We didn't literally lose them, but I mean, they left in the pandemic. 
the fact of the matter is more to Marnie's point, this is the legislature's way of giving districts more money to help them deal with the fiscal crisis that they're in. So I think we have to get away from this. Oh, we're collecting money on students that are not there. We're collecting money that the state is allowing us to collect because they know we're in trouble and they know we need it. And you can call it a lot of different things, but it's the state's way of saying, here, you guys need more money. This is a way you can collect it. Now, yes, I understand there's a difference because it's a local ask versus the state saying, oh, here's some money. But to Marnie's point, the taxpayers are paying for that either way. And the fact of the matter is our local taxpayers are paying a whole lot of money for dollars that don't go to Issaquah. And isn't it nice, you know, that now they're paying for some that do. So I said, I just, I have issues with the nomenclature. Um, I think if the state is willing to give us pandemic relief money, we should say thank you very much and take it. Right, but this this is money is coming out of our local taxpayers. So that's the difference. Uh, the state wants to give us all the money they want. Right, well, but even when the state wants to give us, it, does, it comes from local taxpayers as well. At least this way, we know that the local dollars are staying here locally. And Sydney has her hand up. So the state's not giving us money. So I think this is all a new point. They're not. There is no historical reason why this is going to happen. So to so what I heard on the what I heard us discussing was let's go with our max authority and and include a statement that says if for some reason the state goes against all historical um, processes and gives us that money back we're not going to take it out of the levy. What's wrong with that? To me, I think that's a completely logical statement. One, it's not going to happen, but let's say it did. What would be wrong with that if we get made whole someone else, someplace else? So I, I am about being committed to solving the problem we have with the way we have to do it and not getting hemmed up in some mythical future that isn't going to happen. And if including a statement that would indicate that we're going to do exactly what we're going to do, which is not take money we shouldn't take, gets us there, then God bless it. Like we're, we're getting locked up in, in like an unnecessary conversation. We're not getting these extra dollars we've asked. We've asked. It's not coming. So let's just go forward and get, get her done. Hmm. It's our way to get there. I, I have a very hard time figuring out how we're going to phrase that in something that it, it phrase that into the explanatory statement that is something that the entire board agrees to when it's not something that the board takes action on. May I read to you what Bellevue says? Sure. Like there's language sure. here. What do they say? <laughs> the exact levy collection will be subject to legal limits at the time of the levy and the rates will be adjusted based on the actual amount certified and assessed value. Like it, there's no, there's not that much more we have to say. The actual levied amount will be based on the actual what, granted value. Like we're overthinking this at this point. Right. And I would say that language is probably already in our draft explanatory yeah. statement. And I can read it to you if you give me a second. Then let's, man, what if. Yeah. I, I, I will say that the, what's missing from that Bellevue statement, though, is that, that they would actually. Well, but yeah. they have no, they have no intent to roll back. Yeah, I don't believe that. Uh, that but they the do. sentence is the same legal limits. And, and the overall but, no difference. But I think it is different than what Hartman yeah, saying. I, I He's so, saying yeah. uh, I, not the, the, to accept dollars from the levy if we get those dollars from the state and it's supplanting. So essentially, we're going to say, well, we'll take it from the state and then we won't collect it over here. So we know that it's just that amount and there's not going to be. So so that's why I'm like, and the hole we dig ourselves in, in 2023 and 2024, will still be there. Okay. Okay. There's Sydney, no money coming point, from us. Sydney, to your point, Harlan is including <clears throat> the, the bill for enrollment hold harmless as one of the things he would want to roll back. Yes? The only thing that I would want to roll back. You would not roll back if they gave us twenty million dollars in ESSER money. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's what. Okay, the, the, see, the, the, the new here. Are, this is two different things. Yeah, these are we, we don't are, have clear definitions. Those two are. Things. 
those two are the what's connected. So if we get twenty million dollars from the state, we don't need to collect the extra three million dollars for the students that don't currently go to our schools. And, and that's what I disagree with, because that three million dollars can can go into things that right now we're saying we can't do. We can't send Merlin kids on a bus to the school that they apply to or that they get into. I mean, there's, there are things that we choose not to do. We don't extend our special ed day, uh, days out in perpetuity, right? For special ed students to go beyond the school year. Those are things that if I had $3 million, what would I do, that, do it with to get us to recovery? And recovery for our special ed students is a great way to get recovery. So if that's where I'm not in agreement. I think if the state's allowing us to collect the dollars, we should collect them and put it in the best interest of students. So I don't disagree with that, except those are one-time dollars. So there's no way our district superintendent is gonna propose to us adding a new program with one-time dollars. It's not gonna happen. But we can fill our deficit with one-time dollars because we- Which is what I'm wanting to, that, that's my point. We can fill our deficit with one-time dollars. That's where the $20 million fills our deficit of 17. We're forecast to spend down right, seventeen million dollars. Yes. So then, where well, would we fill the next year and the next year? This is not happening. Like this, we're having an entire red hearing discussion about something that is not going to happen. No, but the the um the the levy hold harmless. Oh, levy hold. oh yes. I'm sorry. It's, I'm tired. Yep. The enrollment hold harmless very well can happen. It, it has already and wait, happened and, once. And, and wait, and not not in not enrollment hold harmless in terms of how much the state funds us in our apportionment, but only within our oh, levy. The levy. So let's I'm be sorry. very clear because those words are getting all yeah. mixed yes, up. You are correct. Thank you for that. Okay. And what are, uh, and I'm not sure where you were in the Bellevue one, but like, for example, in the draft explanatory statement we have, it does say the exact levy collection will be subject to the legal limits at the time of the levy and the rate shall be adjusted based upon the actual amount certified and the assessed value of the property within the district at the time of the levy. I don't know if that's the kind of thing you were well, reading in the Bellevue it, one. I, I think let's be is. clear. The same lawyers are betting all yeah, of this yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, right. So that goes to the part about we do not collect beyond the legal limit based on whatever the legislative laws and rules are at the time of that collection. Well, sure. Not what Harlan. That's saying. not what Harlan's saying. I mean, Harlan. Yes, I'm saying that if we get twenty thousand, so sorry, twenty million. So we're we're down seventeen million this year. So if we get twenty million dollars this year. I'm saying that we don't need to collect dollars, which are probably gonna be $3 million. And if I were to forecast, we'll get one more year of levy enrollment hold harmless dollars. I will be surprised if it would be two years because that's probably not gonna get through the Senate. So we're talking about $3 million potentially. So, I mean, one way they could go, the legislatures could go is not do enrollment hold harmless, and just do an increased ESSER floor, uh, state-funded ESSER floor, which gets rid of the problem of which is what students or anything like that and would drive a substantial amount of money to a district like ours as well. I mean, and that that's where I know districts like, like Washington are advocating for is that position as well. Because hold harmless doesn't help all districts. Hold harmless doesn't help like Washington because they didn't have the enrollment decline right. or North Shore. So hold harmless is not being widely supported across a lot of the school districts that didn't have the enrollment decline that Issaquah had. So the ESSER dollar funding is what's being pushed more than the hold harmless because so many districts did not have the decline. I know that right. to be true in our region. I don't know about statewide because you do have a lot of districts even in more conservative parts of the states that were impacted by declining enrollment. So. That I didn't think that was going to happen either. I'm kind of surprised that it, that the enrollment hold harmless still has the legs that it does down there. Because I honestly, from what we were hearing early on before yeah. the session even started, I didn't think it really had a shot. So I'm kind of surprised that it's still there. What I don't have a good barometer on is the uh, appetite to fund the state backfill for ESSER dollars for because that's a lot fewer districts that really benefit from that. 
Right. Yeah, but the one where all the populace lives. And so yeah, well, that's, that's true. not where the legislators are. It's not, no, it, not it, is, all of them. it is where the it's where yeah. the overwhelming majority of the legislature live is is the metro area. So is the statement included sufficient? Sorry, what was it? Is the statement currently included sufficient? No, it would I it would, you would add in a clause that said uh whatever Anne read and then specifically calling out ESSER or COVID pandemic related funding in excess of our 20, deficit? Twenty million dollars. Why twenty? I mean, again, this is an arbitrary yeah. number. Because I don't want because our our what is our deficit? It's bigger. I don't I don't want it. I don't want to limit to it. It's truly like it's the like it's twenty million is what it is for me. Because if what if our deficit was bigger, I would I would I would want it to collect a more than that. So you're saying if this tw magic twenty million comes from the ESSER dollars, then you want to convert our levy calculation to our actual enrollment that year and roll back any difference to, and that's only true if we even get the legislation that allows us to count from our 1920 school year. I agree. And it's only true if we get the $20 million from the state, which as Sydney said, she doesn't believe is going to happen. So, so I think that in, in doing this compromise language, you're, you're having the opportunity for a unanimous vote. And so I guess that's what's before you to decide. Would it be 20 million or greater? So if we got 20 million or right. greater, so if we got 18 million. It doesn't count. Okay. That's why I want to go on that. So yeah. we very clear to the voters if we put 20 million, we 18 million, then it's fine. Yeah. All right, so you're saying, I'm, I'm paraphrasing because I'm really having trouble wrapping my head around it, so bear with me. If we receive 20 million or more, in okay, clear. well, yeah, this is the part I don't get in pandemic related relief. So you're assuming that that could be ESSER making whole dollars, but what other things might that be? Just that 20 million or more, then we would do what? We would From roll back, we would roll back the, 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 the levy hold the, the student enrollment if, part of the levy? If we had had any passage of the legislature to allow us to count more students than we actually have, we would roll that back. Because that, that isn't right. automatic right. because exactly. we don't even know that they're going to give it to us. And who's crafting this language? You and Jake? Well, no, I heard oh. you. Who's crafting this language? <laughs> Well, I can show I'm you sorry, what I've I'm tried really to draft down here right point. now. I think yeah. Superintendent Thiele was going to draft on a yellow pad. <laughs> yeah, well, he's working on it right now, but you'll see a lot of scratch. I mean, and out obviously, too. it's got to go past a lawyer. I get Additional that. Additional COVID would be, stake. It's it a would be. Question. It would likely be Ron and I. And I would obviously run a draft by Harlan first because so it captures his, his intent. Because we've you've been you've been uh, digesting this for quite a while. Um, is one one thing I was thinking about is exactly what you said, Susan. And let's say the the um, COVID relief or ESSER funding, we will have to use the right adjective, this descriptor, um, is in excess of, we use Dr. Gallinger's 20 million, um, then we would revert to actual student enrollment for levy collection. That would be one, one way to do it. And that, and that, what is the dollar impact of that? Well, if our deficit's 17 and we get 20, we'd be plus three, which would basically would be the rollback amount of the levy. That's how okay, I would so No, but I'm sorry, what what amount of no, I'd say that's a single year though. We might yeah. want to be specific. And that's a one year, one time. Well, it affect two fiscal years, one calendar year. It might be two depending on it might be two depending on the legislation. Uh, well, it depends oh, on the next year. How are you impacting how are you impacting the next year? So is that assuming that our deficit still hasn't, um, we still don't have a structural deficit? I guess, I just don't know how it would relate to the second year. I don't think you can make a claim on years two through four. I mean, that's hard. I, I don't know, because your, your one-time COVID money is not, it, it's gone. Yeah, it'll only be one time. It's a right. one year, what I'm hearing Okay, is, so it's a, a three million, a one year, $3 million offset to a $20 million gain. Yeah. Do you think you can craft 
I'm not crazy about it, but that, I can live with it. That language into that explanatory statement? Anytime. And I guess I would rather it not be, I, I mean, it's up to the board, but I'd rather not be in our explanatory statement. We have time. I would rather that just go into the resolution language. No, we don't have time to change the resolution. Because the board has to approve the resolution. Yeah. You, no we'd have to have, have have a have a have a have a have a special meeting of the board. Meeting. Nope. It is nearly impossible to get this board together and to find a time that all five of us and the staff can be here is nearly impossible because clearly I haven't been able to have all five of us here for entire meetings for the last two meetings. I think we can have intent and we can say this is our intent and we can, if it can, if it can be put into the explanatory statement, I suppose I can go along with this to get to a full yes, but this is the resolution before us now. I think it's a great way to split the difference. So I want to hear from staff. Where does this go? The what? And we we're just talking about this for the the first year because that's when they all. Uh, I think Dr. Gallons are over the green. This year. COVID money yeah. is not going. And so it's not so, going to be around. So year. just playing around. You can all throw rocks at me. <laughs> Uh, if the ISD receives additional state COVID relief revenue of 20 million or more, we will revert back to actual enrollment numbers to calculate our 2023 EPNO amounts. Correct. It would be our intent to. So we're getting to our, our intent to. Okay. Can you say that one more time, Ron? I got about yeah. half of it. I said, if the ISD receives, and this would be in the statement, if the ISD receives additional state COVID relief revenue of 20 million or more, it, our, this may be where the intent thing is, yeah. our intent will be to revert back to actual enrollment numbers to calculate our 2023 EPNO amounts. 2023 levy, yeah. Yeah, and it would be in the explanatory statement for that one anyway, our 2023 levy amounts. And we all know that only even applies if the legislature passes. A bunch a, of things have to happen to make that happen. So it isn't something that we can guarantee we can do because we don't know we got it. No. If we don't get enrollment, hold harmless. If we don't okay, get S, to that if, point, if they do set an ESSER floor of seven fifty, and we don't, because remember we've already received five hundred. So I just want to be clear, uh, they're going to in the fifteen hundred floor. They're already saying we got five hundred of it. So if they only raised it by a few hundred dollars, like they did to us last year, yeah, we'd only get a few million. None of this would apply. Then that's where my twenty million comes from. Yeah, thousand. so. Times twenty thousand. I, I mean, I think to Sydney's earlier point, I think the getting twenty million is pretty. That's pretty lofty. But if it happened, and here's my one thing that I heard um, Director Gallinger say that does cause me nervousness because it it harkens back to twenty eighteen. If they did something like that um, and put a big ESSER floor amount out there. Given that they're politicians, they're going to want to claim like they did in uh, 2018. We fixed public education. Look how great we are. And I do fear that if they said, look, we gave all this money out to districts. They don't need to collect all this levy amount. That I don't like that narrative because that really, I believe, is what really hurt us in 2018 was that narrative that and it confused people. They thought, well, you fixed it. So why are you asking me for a levy? Two years later, we pointed out, well, they didn't really fix it because if you want these things, you need a levy. And then 62% of our community supported that levy. So I, I, I understand and, and I too would like to have a 5-0 vote. So that's why I'm willing to entertain this whole conversation. I think it's, it's worthwhile. And I know Marnie's got a oh, question, Marnie, Anne. Sorry. So I'd say, you know, I think now for me, the biggest issue is I want to make sure that the public has assurances. And I think one of the things we can do is after the legislature is over, prior to the community voting, we can take an actual resolution once we know what the outcome is from the state as a way of saying that 
by that resolution, we already state it's more than just an intent that we will, you know, because we'll know by then, most likely. Yeah, the, the, the session will. So end. it might be our first April well, we meeting. To, uh, so we have a meeting, you know, March 10th. I don't know March if we know by then, but. 24th. I'm just saying it out loud. And then we have one like April 5th or 6th or something like that. Yeah. So I think I think for me it would be really important for the community here. I I would would really push for an actual resolution once the legislature uh, ends and we have some information prior because I think that will help the campaign. Okay, and and what and, would the resolution be in the absence of it? So let's say we that we get five million dollars in ESSER dollars and none of this applies. Then none of it nothing. applies, and you don't do one. It's only if it uh, applies so that we can take an actual resolution. I, I see an advantage in what you're proposing, Director Muller, because it, it has the force of an actual re resolution. My question, I guess, would be to Dr. Gallinger, if if you if the promise of doing that after the session closes would be enough to nudge you in the direction well, of a vote for this. And still do the language things that we want to be doing. That's, that's on top of. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. right. Okay, I see what you're saying. So put it in the explanatory right. statement, but then don't just leave it there. If in fact if the legislature know. comes out and does it, you pass a resolution right. at your second meeting in March. Okay. I was going to say we could, in that case, you could construct a resolution that wouldn't be a levy rollback resolution, right? Because you don't have authority until November. Right. Yeah. So it's right. not so the official, that thing. You, yeah. That is the official. Yeah. You could, a resolution of intent. You, yes. but, I mean, you would know that if there, let's say to heart, let's say it was a 20 million or let's say it was 22 and you knew you had to roll back 2 million. As, mm. then, then you you could do an aggregate number in your levy uh, in March, but you can't, you won't yeah. have the authority identified. So if the inflation comes in higher, because remember it's 12, the preceding 12 months prior to the September. So that CPI number won't be finalized until September of next year or this year for our 23 levy. You know what I mean? So the inflationary numbers aren't going to be real until well after the legislative session is done. You're saying we, we wouldn't be able to compute how much we could roll back. And again, that's only assuming we got the state legislature to also pass the bill that says we can count our 1920 enrollment for the calculation of 20. You could direct in March, you could direct staff to reduce the calculated authority by Two million if it was a twenty. No, why is it in? It, it, but it's an amount driven by the number of students. Assuming right. and only assuming if the state passes the bill that allowed us in the first place to right. count those. That's students. true too. Okay, right. I don't want to make any guarantee that something's being rolled back when we didn't get the law changed that would allow us to collect for the nineteen twenty right. enrollment. Correct, and then the conversation is a moot point. It's a moot point. So right. two things have to happen. We have to get more than $20 million in one-time ESSER, old harmless type dollars. Yep. And the legislature has to pass the bill that allows districts to use their 1920, because that's higher for us, amount in the levy collection dollars. So right. Those two must happen before. And then at that point, we would roll back the difference between the 1920 enrollment times the levy dollars per student with our actual students. Yeah, so correct, your, your actual authority will be in November of the uh, coming year, the following year, I mean. Um, but you could do a, a spring resolution as Marnie said, but it, it, it won't be as. It's, an, it's our intent. It's your, it would be when your the intent and then time you, comes to you would execute that in it. November as you would normally. Right. When you I mean, have your, have your if authority. that much money comes in, we would, it seems yeah. very logical that we would want to do that. All right. Okay. I'm and sure just, a lot of districts have given back their extra I do want to be clear money. that $20 million in <laughs> one-time state revenue just basically break even. Yeah. And I know yeah. it sounds fanciful, but. No, I know. Yeah, that's what it is. So, yeah, can I just say that you guys draft this language. Yes, run it by Harlan, but oh, I would no, like all it of us. run by the board president. Oh, well, every, yeah. I think the I, entire board yeah. needs to see the language yeah, and absolutely. provide feedback okay. to um, to the to uh, Ron and I. Um, okay, about fine. That. That's fine. I know. So, having said all that. No, because the motion no. is about the resolution. The motion is to pass the resolution. 
Yeah. So. I know yeah, this I'm is why this is what I brought up in the first too. part is I'm struggling with where to insert it. Because Does Harlan need to amend the no, motion to pass the resolution pending yeah. the insertion of language into the no. um, this has to our resolution has to be clean for this part. I'd I, say it's a second motion to uh but do you have oh. to table the first motion you could first? Do, to no, direct no. staff. No. Oh, that's to, a good question. That's not to right. direct staff to amend the explanatory statement. Yeah, but we have to vote on. We yeah. have to either yeah, take vote one on the at a time. Yeah, or table the first motion. No, I didn't, I didn't. Okay. All right, then if we're vote up. Just hold on one second. All right. So uh, it sounds like we are ready to take a vote. Does anybody object on uh, resolution? Hold on, I gotta get back up to the number. Resolution 1178 for our education program and operations levy. All those in favor of approval of resolution 1178 say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, so all five have voted aye to approve the EPNO levy as we have it in a resolution before us. Thank you. Now, if someone would like to make a motion about language, um, about the explanatory statement, I would entertain that. It's very scary because we don't have it I written know, before. I know, don't have it written down. <laughs> so is it, I move the board direct the president and the superintendent to devise language, explanatory language related to the EPNO levy. Um, to well, I don't know the exact direction. I know. How about I just end it there? Um, I want to, to say as discussed, but I'm not sure that that's appropriate. To reflect the board's uh, desire to. Reduce our 2023 levy collection based on student enrollment, uh, enrollment should the state deliver in excess of $20 million of COVID pandemic relief funding. Yes, that's my motion. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I second that. Okay, so I have something like. Yeah. I got most of it. Okay, you might have done, been better. Um, I know. Okay, so I'm a, uh, the board direct the president and superintendent to devise explanatory language for the EPNO levy to reflect the board's desire to reduce the 2023 levy collection to be based on student enrollment. Should the state deliver in excess of 20 million in COVID relief? I got lost at the very end. If there was any COVID I think relief it's, money. Oh, COVID pandemic relief money. Okay. And I think it's actual student enrollment. I think so happens. too. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. I remember that's what I said. <laughs> yes. So Marnie said, I move the board, <laughs> direct the president and superintendent to devise explanatory language for the EPNO levy to reflect the board's desire to reduce the 2023 levy collection to be based on actual student enrollment should the state deliver in excess of 20 million in COVID pandemic relief. Money? Okay, monies. Funding. Funding. Yeah, funding. Okay. Okay. Funding. Okay, that's what I heard. <laughs> it's a com <laughs> it's a complex uh, motion. Wait until we try to actually write this explanatory statement. Yeah, it'll be really complex. Good times. Yeah. Okay. I um, think I have that. Is there any discussion about this one? All right. 
then, then, all right, we're ready to take a vote. So those in favor of the motion, as I have already repeated it, please say aye. 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 And opposed? All right, so again, it's a unanimous vote and everyone voted yes. Madam President, and can we, we have... take a five minute break? Yes, I think it's a good idea. Discussion? Because yeah. thank I you think for... that one's gonna go longer. Okay. <laughs> So thank you everybody though for hanging in there us. and assigning some really complex homework. <laughs> All right, let's take a
We are back. Thank you, everybody, for letting us take a, a short break after all that really good work we got done on um, that item. Okay, everybody. So now, sorry. Now I know it's yes. Um, we are on to the next item, which is our resolution one one seven nine replacement capital levy capital projects levy, and we will start with another motion. I move. The board approved resolution 1179, authorizing levies for technology modernization. The levy funds educational technology, one-to-one -one student learning devices, critical repairs, school remodeling, completion of high school number four, and updating for safety, security, and efficiency, and authorizes the following excess levies on all taxable property within the district. In 2023, the approximate levy rate per thousand dollars of assessed value is 73 cents. The levy amount is 31,472,000. 2024, 81 cents is the levy rate, and the levy amount is 35,957,000. In 2025, 78 cents per thousand. The levy amount is 36,561,000. In 2026, the levy rate, approximate levy rate is 75 cents. The levy amount is 37,320,000. Second. Excellent, thank you. So we have our motion on the floor. I know we decided last time to go ahead and hear public input first. Is that good with the board if I do that since we've already been presented with the information? So, and we've, um, so I would like to see if there is anyone first in the room that is interested in making public comment. Okay, all right. Is there anyone on the Zoom? And I see one hand raised. So I see Dave Osmer. And so Dave, if you could turn on your video and your audio, and uh, because I gave my spiel about public comment so long ago, it's just uh, please state your name in the area of the district you live in. <clears throat> and then you have um, two minutes to make comment. And we have a timer going that even though you're on Zoom, you'll hear the beeper beeper. So, all right, Dave, we'll take your public input. Thank you. Um, my name is Dave Osmer. I'm a resident property owner in the Issaquah School District. The wording of this resolution is incredibly misleading. It is, it is almost like you purposefully worded it to make it as difficult as possible for the voting public to understand it, as well as to disguise the mismanagement of the, pro, of the high school four project from day one. The wording disguises the fact that these funds include $44 million in new dollars required to help fill a $78 million overrun of the budget for this ill-conceived project. It further disguises that the remaining 34 million of this gap will be made up by using funds which were allocated for the now indefinitely delayed ES-17. If ES-17 is ever needed at all, given the current enrollment trends, this will require another levy request to be funded by the already overtaxed property owners of the district. Unfortunately, I don't have time to address the money this project is wasting on spec spectator amenities for a sports complex, which will only be used at full capacity four or five times a year, while perfectly good facilities for interscholastic competitions exist less than two miles down the road. Finally, the proposition tries to haul, hide all this by combining the 44 million with the requested technology improvements, further obscuring the full impact of the high school four project overrun. These two issues deserve to be separated and stand on their own merits. I will happily support a standalone technology levy, combine it with the construction overrun, and you will not get my vote, nor that of a lot of other disgruntled taxpayers who I know. Thank you. Thank you very much for your input. All right, is there anyone else on Zoom that would like to give public input? All right, I don't see anyone. All right, now we have an opportunity for the board to have uh, a continued discussion on 
on the um, capital levy. We, if there's anything you want uh, put up on the screen, I'm not sure where all we want to go with this particular levy discussion. It certainly includes um, both technology and critical repairs and the high school number four. Um, it has been our way for years to combine technology with critical repairs and work that needs to be done on our buildings. It is a little bit different this year with the um, high school number four, but it's a perfectly um, fine way to uh, work on the funding. As Marnie brought up earlier, it allows us to finance that over four years instead of using bonds to finance it over something like 20 years. So it is a, a reasonable mechanism that we have before us to be able to use. So is there anything anyone would like put up of all the documents that we have received related to um, the tech levy? Suzanne, did you have something? Well, I was just gonna point out that um, the one-to-one -one technology um, initiative, if you will, had the um, highest voting percentage of the levy committee. I think if I remember it was 39 to one, it was something to one. Oh, Josh says yes. So um, that was the closest to unanimous that they got on any of their votes. So um, it was really clear from the get-go that that was something that was important to the committee. And um, it was interesting. There was a fair bit of discussion around the high school dollars and you know, should it be separated? Should it stay together? They went back and forth on that. They had a lot of good conversation. Um, and in the end, the, the overwhelming consensus was we desperately need this high school. We've needed it for the last five years. And um, it was important to get that money approved. So um, I think this was, this was the levy that the committee felt really strongly on and was very supportive of. Right to the um, right to the high school we had talked about, um, even at the time we were passing the bond, we would have been happy to have opened it immediately with the enrollment. And actually we did have some enrollment numbers. I don't know if you had want to see that. And Martin, um, in it particular- would be throwing that chart up there. That yeah, was, in um, particular, the um, high school enrollment chart and the um, time over the last, so many years and our numbers. Yeah, from 2015 on. Because our high school enrollment has only gone up um, since the time we passed the bond and needed the high school right then. So the high school is an important part. And She's feeling strong with the Shannon screen. I've got it in one of them. Let's see which one of us gets to it first. You get it? Hey, there awesome. it is. Oh, That's where there it is. Thank you. I know. <laughs> We're a bit tired. I'm just the internet All right. <laughs> Okay, so now we have the um, enrollment trend and make sure we can see the, just roll up a little bit so we can see the years. So that starts with the 15-16 school year in 2016 when we ran the bond. That was when we were developing the proposal. Right, mm -hmm. yes. And so um, our um, high school enrollment has only, okay, Carlin. I mean, there's no question we need the high school. The community was strongly behind running, uh, supporting and funding that fourth high school. This isn't in question for me. Um, I do want to know, because it has come up, can you specifically comment on the quote pad site development for 17? Meaning if you invest and plow $17 million or whatever the cost is into that to this year, what would that cost be if you didn't do that? I mean, you, let's say you don't do any of that. You use that money in high school and then, Four years from now, if we have a student rebound, you go and have to do that. Can you share the cost? Of Describe of that cost and help us understand too so we get the right terminology about this pad ready and what that actually right. means. Because part of it is about investment and, mm -hmm. and we can share that 
important fiduciary responsibility we have to do things that make sense financially. Yeah. If you could share that, it'd be helpful. So to clarify, it's not a pad. Yeah. We are not making a pad. A concrete pad won't we be are there. No, no concrete involved. This is pad ready, meaning you build a, you produce a site that will allow you to come in and put a pad on it. That's why it's called pad ready. Um, and the dollars that are going into that are not into specifically for necessarily for the elementary school. They're sizing all the systems on the site to allow the elementary school to be built in the future. So for water main, for, for, a, for an example, you would wanna make that big enough for the high school and the elementary school. You wouldn't wanna come back in years from now to build the elementary school and, and tear everything up and put a new water line, a larger water line in. That's the same for the sewer, the storm, and various different, all the different electrical, you know, feeds into the site, everything. You're basically sizing the site conditions ready so that you're pad ready. You can come in and build that building from the concrete foundations up. Yep, the building is, and part of that money is in the design already. Because at the time we were planning on building E17. As if I could just add, as Tom and the team have uh, explained to me, first of all, we need to remember this is a single site. This yep. is a approximately 48, 40 acre single site. And what we're really talking about is the excavation work. A lot of the excavation in what, what I term the underground work yep. of the site. And so it's really hard to separate it out and not do it when you're doing the main. And of course, the cost savings is it's that time value of money. You do it today. We've seen what construction um, inflation has been. So um, we've got a site for our 17th elementary. Let's just say that out of the gate too, because that's very important because one of the biggest challenges we've had in building schools in the Sequoia School District is finding appropriate sites to do it. We have that site at the Providence Heights property. Um, it, in order, it, it makes a ton of sense to integrate all that excavation and underground work when you do it initially, because to your earlier um, kind of, I think where you were going, um, Director Gallinger, is it's only going to cost you a lot more to do it in the future. This will be a site that will be ready to essentially start construction. So you're just going to have to worry about the building. Um, we have just had a recent experience as it related to excavation in the land uh, with our Cougar Mountain Middle School. The building has been ready to go for a while, but we still had site work. So site work is a big part of these projects. I, I mean, we all see the pretty building that goes up, but there's a ton of work that happens on those sites before we ever have a concrete yep. truck on it. Yep. So that that was an important learning for me. So yeah, and it would be very difficult to extract out those parts and pieces because they're not parts and pieces. They're sure. integral parts of the site. Sure. So the, uh, then my next question would be then if you are on the site once the high school is there, will you see like where that's going to go versus can the trees still stay there? We've seen lots of emails about those three acres of trees. Is, is there a reason that the trees would have to come out they, today versus if we don't build the school for a decade? That's yeah. a big deal. And Un so, unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, the site is designed to be balanced. That means you, you within reason, you don't take, truck any dirt off of the site and you don't bring any dirt onto the site. And the site the elementary school site is essential for dirt to go into and be be there to build the, you know, to, to be in place for the elementary school to bring that part of the site up to, to be. You, if you didn't, you'd have to, yeah, you'd have to export all of that dirt off. It's very expensive. It's not as, you know, sound to do. You've got all the trucks on the road. Plus you have to find a spot to do that, find that dirt. And that's in the millions of dollars just to haul it off only in the future to be bringing it back. It just still didn't answer my question. Okay. Uh, I you, think you, the answer is the trees 
have to go. The right. trees have to go that's for because you'd be yeah. excavating the. the and that's fine as an answer. I just, I yep. just speak yeah. for yep. clarity. Yep. We need to make sure we answer the question because that helps us because that's the question that we get a lot. Yep. About the why, and yep. that's helpful for us to understand the why. Okay. I mean, I think what you would see when it's all done in the building and the construction of the high school happens that you know that's going to grow back over in yeah, Washington yeah. State. If you turn over land and you just leave it alone. It just grows up in grass yeah. and weeds or whatever. Yeah. I don't know what we would do to kind of cover that area after the fact. Um, but after, as far as yeah. the big trees, if there are big trees in that area, those would, I, I'm uh, going to assume, Tom, those are going to have to come down as part they of the do. excavation. They but, do. But there would still, we still would have the buffers that are part of the plan. Yep. The buffers yep. would be put in. We do all the buffer work and all those things that would, that we promised the neighbors we would do. Yep. Right. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. And 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 there was a that that was a big topic of conversation within the committee as well. Yep. And uh, I know because we at some point we rolled out pad ready. <laughs> yeah. And that got a lot of people yeah. confused. So I yeah. appreciate the opportunity yep. to help uh, clarify that. In fact, I think at some points we even people were not saying pad ready; they were saying pad. Right. And then there was the perception there was going to be a big concrete slab there. But there will not be a big yes. concrete slab. It will slab just there. be we were all some confused. kind of temporary landscaping is what would be in that space yeah. Yeah. until, you know, and if it takes a decade, it who knows how that landscaping would grow up. But yeah. yeah. And this this vests us in the site for land use also for a number of years after the the high school is done. Yeah. Not indefinitely, but for a few years after that. So didn't me. It looks like there's her hand. I do. Oh, yes. Um, I think the other one that comes up is why are we even talking? We did the high school enrollment, but we didn't talk about the elementary. And so one of the reasons why I asked for the enrollment projections from when we initially did the 26 bond to now is we're at the same place. Like we people are, I think what people took away is we were at this enrollment decline. So these schools aren't needed. And I think it's really important to say that in between those two times, we actually peaked well above what we said, the enrollment needs another misnomer, that we don't still have the same level of um, projected enrollment, or at least that it, we're somewhere drastically off. Have we been higher? Absolutely. But um, they're actually coming in just about neck on neck. What we're projecting now into the future is what we were projecting at the, at the bond the original plan for the schools. Right. And so you're referring again to the, the high school enrollment. No, I'm actually Any talking enrollment. about, I'm talking about oh, both. Oh, elementary. Yeah. Because I think, yeah. I think that is the other misnomer. I see. Some magical school in the future for schools you don't, for kids you don't have anymore. Right. And I think it's important to look, if you look at the enrollment projections at the time we did the bond in 2016 to build these buildings, yes. while we have dropped back from our height of enrollment, we haven't dropped back beneath what we put in the bond projection. And I think that's just a very important thing. I think people think, well, there, we don't have those students anymore. Yeah, we had more, but now we are actually back on kind of on projection. And, and the other piece of that is, and we've talked about this in all the years I've been on the board, is that across K-12, we have over 200 portable classrooms. So if we said, gee, maybe we don't want to have quite as many kids in portables as we have now, that in itself would justify probably two elementary schools. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, you know, our schools aren't dramatically over capacity when you include all the portables, but you know, that that's a question. Is that a community value value? Do we want to have a whole lot of kids in portables? Right, but I was going to say at some point though it's a different question of when we build another elementary school, right? Because mm -hmm. that that is something we're not planning to do right now because the most immediate need is at the high school level. Mm -hmm. Marnie, so um, I've I've mentioned this before. I think we need to really take ownership of some of the communication around this, um, and really get a hold of that uh, based on the public comment that we got. Um, we have a spreadsheet, but the spreadsheet's not not communicating anything to anyone. Because in that spreadsheet, we clearly state that we're using dollars from E17, elementary 17, which means if we're using the dollars for that to build the high school, we're not gonna be able to build the elementary. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's in there, but people aren't seeing it. So how we communicate is going to be very, very important, a communicate, com communication mechanism. 
why why have we done these cost overruns? Well, we 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 talked about this bond. We priced out this bond in 2015, and I'm pretty sure that nobody here expects something that you priced out in 2015 is going to cost the same in 2022. And there are reasons that that happened. Some of them from the very organization where people live that are commenting saying we've mismanaged this. I think I take real offense to the word of mismanaging, but how do we communicate that? The public doesn't understand. They just see that we're asking for, for more money. So we have to take ownership of how we communicate this. And I feel like we have not done that yet. Otherwise I would still not be getting an inbox full of why are you, you know, why are you asking for more money for high school for, I need you to take it off because I want to support the tech levy, but I don't want to support the high school, which is, I would not want well, to do that. To that point, we may not be able to convince everybody that right. they uh, are in agreement with this, right? They, so it's, there's well, one, I there's mean, communicating. It doesn't mean people like the answer. Carlin, yep. and then. But Suzanne. I think we do need to have that graph, which shows yep. the enrollment in 2015 and where we are today that expresses the need. Because I think most people, that will resonate with most people. Obviously the people who are not gonna be in favor, they won't be in favor no matter what cute picture you put on there, but it, the need is there and it's worse. And we know it, we're feeling it, we're hearing it from our buildings. So, I mean, there's just no question. I get my back to what it was is like, so what if we don't get a permit in our hands this year? What's the cost going to be? And that's what I worry about is 44 million gonna be enough to do the job that's my fear. Yeah, without having, because people have asked that question. Um, and it, it, that, that is where we get ourselves right back in that same loop again, because every delay costs significant amount of money. So that's why we got to just keep pushing forward to, to get um, the permit in a timely manner. We need to break ground on this project this spring. Um, I know that Tom and the team and, and our engineering firms and architects are doing their darndest to try to get this through the process at the city of Issaquah so that we can accomplish that goal. Um, but, um, and I do want uh, the board to know that um, we do have and will have a, um, a focus letter that will go to every resident in the entire um, Issaquah School District, not just parents that will uh, be, and we'll have that, the data that will be in that prior so that it can be used for levy talks and things like that, that will tell that story that I believe uh, Director Moraldo is talking about as well. Um, and, you know, I, I, could, I can speak to it off the cuff, the six meetings that we've held with the um, Home, Homeowners Association, the legal challenges that the previous owner faced when they were trying to condemn the building from the um, Heritage Society. I mean, there we have an answer. And, and thank you, Director Moraldo, because I take offense in the, the term mismanagement as well. Again, 19 consecutive years without an audit finding. Um, we balance our budgets every year in this school district. And my initial, the initial letter that we sent out when we realized that we had this shortfall explains all of it. And I know it was a very wordy, complex document because it's a very complex problem, but to say we haven't told people that, and as far as the ballot language is concerned, you know that that is very restrictive on what we can do. And we're very limited to the, even the amount of characters that we can use. So we can't tell that whole story on the ballot, but we have told that story. We will continue to tell that story. I have spoke to it in this venue and every venue that I've talked about. We're not hiding from this. It's terrible. I hate the fact that we have to ask for additional money for this project, but it's a reality and we could, we could hide from it. But the truth is our students and our community need that high school. Yeah, I think that's, that's the key is coming back to the needs of our students and our uh, Isquah and Skyline are both overcrowded. They're very large high schools and they weren't structurally designed to house that many students. And so the only way to provide relief is through building another comprehensive high school. Suzanne. Yeah, I had two things on that. Um, one was in addition to everything that Marnie talked about with all the um, 
increases in costs and the unforeseen things that happened during the pandemic, the rules were changed on us. Somewhere in that time frame, the city of Issaquah decided that a project of that size would require structured parking. When we originally designed it and sent it out on the bond, we didn't think we were going to have to build that. Uh, the city of Sammamish is talking about various traffic requirements. We don't know yet where that's going to go, but that's an increased cost that we were not anticipating. And I don't think, you know, I don't think in 2016 we could have anticipated, oh, they're going to need structured parking. Uh, the other piece to um, address some of the input that we're getting um, from the Providence Point community is there seems to be a big push that we should redesign the whole project and eliminate the elementary school because they don't feel we need it. And they feel that we're cramming too many projects onto one 40 acre site. But at the same time, the city of Issaquah is telling us that we should be building urban schools to sit on a smaller footprint and not take up so much acreage. So those are two really competing arguments that are never going to live happily together. And in this case, I'm gonna to have to go with the city that's permitting my project. So, you know, there's there's a lot of moving parts in here. Well, and in, in addition, we have bank, we have a piece of land. There, there, it's very difficult to find any more land that would allow us to build another school someplace else in Issaquah where we have to, well, where we are within the urban growth area, it doesn't have to actually be in the municipality of Issaquah, but it has to be in the urban growth area, which is, what, 30% of our district? It's a it's a, a very small, much smaller part of our 110 square miles that we could actually build a school in and then to go through and acquire it. So we have worked hard over this time to acquire the land that we need to build the schools. And that is one of our sites. And if I might add to, I, I, and I apologize if I, I'm, I'm a little frustrated also by the insinuation that we are, are somehow ignoring um, the concerns of the neighboring community. The neighboring community makes up much less than 1% of the Issaquah School District, but yet we agreed to over $3 million in buffer changes to our site plan as a result of all the conversations that we had with the Providence Point community. And we're taxing everybody from Newcastle to Preston to do that and I believe it's the right thing to do because we do want to be a good neighbor. And I, I want that community to embrace the fact that we are their neighbor. Um, and that, that, I guess, has just been a little bit frustrating to me. Um, I've actually spoken with people in that community who didn't even know that we had met on six occasions with their homeowners association leadership, that we had changed our site plan along the way to accommodate. We, it is not as if we just walked away and said, we're not willing to do anything. We modified the site at a cost to our taxpayers. And um, that's why I get just a little bit frustrated about some of the allegations that I hear being made. Well, and to that point, um, the city, I believe requires 10 foot buffers. I believe on average we're at 60, is that correct? And as Jay yes. said earlier, six acres of a 40 acre site dedicated to buffers and trees. Plus, we looked at those, those pinch points where it was less than 60 feet. And we, not, not I, you, somebody, met with the association and said, okay, what can we do to alleviate these yes. particular pinch points where it isn't 60 feet? So yeah, I think we have been a very good neighbor. We, we went, uh, at the time, President Moraldo and past President uh, Gallinger and myself, we went up into the highest buildings and looked out onto the site to try to determine how we could best address that. And we can't perfectly make everything go away so that they will never see a school or never hear a noise or anything. Um, but I think it was a very good faith effort to, to uh, make modifications to help address some of their concerns. Right, anything? Oh, go ahead, Harlan. If you could pull up the technology spreadsheet. And so it's uh, row number 145, if you guys are following. 
up here. One of the many. <laughs> yeah, one, four, five. And so the question is a two part question. The first part is with our move to Canvas and everything that being the hub of learning and sort of teacher updates and communication, what is the need for or benefit of a teacher website? That's the first part of the question. Because I, I want to know like why why would we be directing students to a teacher website if they have Canvas? And if you're interchanging website for Canvas now, then that's fine as an answer. And then the second part is when I compare that to the levy that we passed that is in our current year, that line item. No, I lost it. Is Uh, so it's 147 and that one is 1 1.8 currently. So what is it that changed that took it from 1.8 this year to 3.1 starting next year? And then again, what is just the, what is the need today? I understand the need a decade ago or whenever this was bargained. I mean, I know that there was a lot of conversation on how keeping that updated and and a lot of the stuff about grading and having that timeliness just in the era of canvas is this a necessity anymore and then why the big jump two answers um the big jump is uh driven predominantly by the uh 40 45 percent increase in the per diem rate for teachers from the last uh levy that is that is the biggest portion of it so the the, the actually the rate the per diem rate itself we're we're underwater in the last year of this levy for how, how cause we didn't assume when we planned the 19 to 22 levy that per diem rates were going to be driven that high. So we, because we planned it in 18, right, right? So you're saying that it isn't actually 1.8 million this year; it's higher. Well, we're spending about two and a half right now, two two three. That's the levy amount is in there as a placeholder, but we are spending more than that on the actual per diem rate, uh, and that is because. As you as you see, salaries went salaries up. went up significantly in that time period since the last levy, um, and then the other question is that web presence uh, is it is likely to come into play, Dr. Gallander, in the next collective bargaining agreement, um, and we'll have something to do with how we move the system forward with our LMS and Canvas, and then us, uh, the Superintendent Hood, and I can provide you more details in exec session on that matter, but. Yeah, and I guess so then my question, follow-up yeah. question would be, yep. as we take away things because you've added this and leveraged this technology, which has made it easier for our teachers, easier for our families, why do we still have a cost to it? Like, can't, as some things go away, can't some costs go away too? That's maybe yeah. rhetorical. I mean, I mean it, it, it's going gonna, it's, it's, it's gonna to change is what I would think would happen. You're correct. I think we are moving away from the old language of maintaining a website. Um, and you're right, at it, it, the secondary level, it's all about maintaining your canvas. Um, but it's a current contractual obligation. It is what we currently do, yeah. So. And it is named as such for transparency's sake. I don't, uh, we could, that money will likely be leveraged towards the same momentum uh, for technological work for cert staff. We just don't know what form it's going to be. Is it going to be web presence? Is it going to be LMS? Is it going to be a combination of? All of it. So, and we have to explore that obviously with IEA. Yeah, because it could be websites for some staff who maybe are non-instructional staff. I mean, we just don't know yet. There, there is some unknown there on that side of it. Yes, but it is a current contractual obligation. Okay. Currently, well, but this is for. I mean, this is not a contractual yeah. obligation because we haven't like we haven't bargained any of these years that these four years are talking right. about. So that's not that's not a contractual obligation. Just for. Yeah, under the current CBA, it is, but you're correct. I mean, right. but whether when we build it could come out of, of the things, CBA. Right. You I would have, have to plan have on to something. Remove that uh, compensation item from the CBA. Who did the bargaining out? Or else it would be a, it is an ongoing obligation until we bargain that item out of the CBA, even though we have a closed agreement or we, we would be bargaining future agreements. I mean, we're going to work under a collective bargaining agreement one way or the other. Correct. 
I know Marnie has her hand up. I think, I think what I'm hearing from you, Jake, is that the terminology used on line 145 may not be accurate because you don't know what it's <clears throat> going to entail exactly. It'll, it'll evolve. So similar to when um, uh, Director Moraldo over the years <clears throat> wanted more timely communication on the web uh, and grading, you know, we use that those funds as part of the web presence uh, to accelerate the communication of staff out to parents. So right. um, you're correct. It, it could take several forms. Um, and I know I'm being, I'm not being cagey on purpose, but it has collective bargaining implications and I'm not really willing to share it. Yeah. Well, and I think one of the things for me is that whatever does go in there that we be, so we may ask for the levy for that. Um, I think my concern is that we're going to end up putting money into the, into something, but not be getting that level of service out of it. So I don't know how much it takes, time it takes. For teachers to be maintaining their website, will it be an equivalent to updating Canvas or Seesaw? I don't know, but I think that is a concern to me that whatever that amount is, is more of an hour, you know, like what is the time commitment there? But I don't know that we can suss it out and that is. Right, because that would be something that we would do during our collective bargaining, <coughs> excuse me, a collective bargaining time. Sydney has her hand up. Yeah, and I don't disagree with any of that conversation <laughs> that we just had, but at the same time, I guess I have two in secondary now. And while the platform is Canvas, I'm still, there's still a build out happening. I mean, there's, there's still a whole maintenance, multiple sites, resources that they're doing that's individual to teacher course, okay. teacher course, um, et cetera. So I, I guess I understand what you're saying. Like the platform may be different and hopefully it's simpler in Canvas, so it's less time, but just thinking about going through my however many 13 or however many classes I have to go through now, there's still a fair amount of content, curation, build out that they're they're doing. So I don't disagree that it should morph, but I guess I guess my experience would say it doesn't fully go away. Yeah, and I'm not expecting it to, but that's why I think clarity on that. And then because then when I see there's these new green lines that's saying we're gonna do now more teacher training on doing that. So, and now we're gonna add more staff to support it. It just seems like we're doing a lot of ads for work that already currently exists today. And that's why I need clarity on that because the, the ad for this is like six and a half million dollars. And so <clears throat> my concerns over this is what is the value it brings to our school district for the ads and a current system that we currently do and we're two years into it and it's not like we've heard like, oh, this isn't working. We need more support around this platform. Jake, I, I um, just ballpark the cost of a training day for eight, a, a seven or eight hour day for certificated staff. Uh, 875,000. Okay, so just under a million dollars. So if you've got a line item that puts three and a half million in a year. That's 20, the equivalent of 25 hours roughly per diem pay. That's what's in the CBA. And then you also have additional green in there as well. Yep. So you, you have another, um, another day. So you, now you're up to about 32 hours. Yeah, I mean, if you took all both of those two line items and just pushed it into one bucket of yeah, teacher training. You've got 20, training. 25, six and seven. So you yeah. got what, 38? And I want to be clear. I'm not advocating we do that or anything like that. I, I recognize the challenge the team has in trying to uh, create a levy proposal that will have enough money in there to accomplish our goals. And we know, and we heard from the board, um, that we need to be very, very intentional about technology integration training so that our staff, so that if in fact we go to this one-to-one -one platform uh, or approach that, that it will be utilized in a way that, that we want. And we, and we talked about, let's say hypothetically, maybe staff need, let, let's say, let's say one-to-one -one is adopted, right? As proposed or in some form. We don't know yet if that's two days of training, one day of training, is it a combination of, you know, sporadic 
uh, training throughout the year. You know, you're doing it two hour chunks. Those are things you work out at the, you know, at the educational program level and then have that conversation with right. teaching staff. And I'm sure the teaching staff yeah. has an opinion on how they think that training should be as well. And those are the, yeah. the subjects of, of talks and of negotiations. Bargaining. Yeah. It's just though, but <clears throat> for one line, line 147, when it has that extra day in there funded, then to me, it's extra money, new money, then I should see extra work or new work. So it wouldn't, mm -hmm. I would not be satisfied if I saw that the, the PD for August included the same number of days and yet we're paying them for a equivalent of an extra day. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I think I, one of the challenges might be, it depends on how the PD is spread out. It may not be so obvious as in one day, as in something that's spread out throughout the year, but you're right to that. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with the right, statement the that um, uh, Director Gallinger made. I mean, if we're, to, I'll, I'll put it in my simple language. If we're asking people to learn something new and implement something new, we should expect to train them and that comes at a cost. Um, but that is, that's new. That's in addition. Yeah, so we, we yeah. have no double per diem days in this district. Yeah. There's I mean, no, I think there's no that, double time. It's, yeah. We pay if, if the staff work in just they get paid for the day. Yeah. And, and I mean, I, I believe we will need that if in fact, you know, we move forward and the, the board adopts a resolution and the voters ultimately approve it. And we, we move to implement the plan. There's definitely going to be a need for significant PD. I, it's hard for me to sit here today and know exactly what form or shape that's going to take, but I don't disagree that it's new and it would be um, in addition to what we're currently asking, or it would replace something that we're currently having them do. Could go either way, I guess. Okay, Sydney. Yeah, I guess now I'm stuck on this idea of, but what is new? No, no. <laughs> well, I... <laughs> I know that the I know that the lines are what's new, but I'm trying to follow the logic, right? We're saying we already have piloted um, at middle, having one to one. We already have the new LMS capabilities rolled out at elementary and high school. So I guess maybe it's a more it's a very basic question, which is, what is the new we're expecting to need the additional PD on? Is it um, because now we're one to one? There's a different. I don't know what. I, that's what I'm yeah. trying to struggle with. Like, what's actually different? Yeah, and, I and guess the question. My my team may have a thought, um, and and I'll. They're they're really more of the experts on this than I am, Director Mullings. But what I will say is, I do not believe, and our teachers are amazing hear me out. And I think the gains that they've made of technology integration over the last two years have been significant. I don't think we're there yet. And again, I think I heard loud and clear from the board that if we're going to go down this path, we want to make sure that you are, that the teachers are going to be given this, the, not just the hard, um, the materials they need, but the training they need to effectively integrate um, this new teaching model. And I, you know, some of them I suspect could already do it and we're probably will be the trainers of the trainers in their buildings. Others will have a, a longer journey to travel. You would, if I was a teacher in our system today, I would need a lot of professional development on how to integrate one-to-one um, -one laptops into my instructional practice because it's just something that I hadn't, didn't have that experience with. Right, and as we go to have this the training is super important because we really want all kids to have a similar experience we we don't want this to be where some um just do it the old way and some do a much um higher level of technology integration with the educational experience so i i really like to see it be consistent similar across the district subject grade levels what what is appropriate for that level and I see uh, Director of Instructional Technology, uh, Diana Eggers. Diana, can you add some color to, well, I, I mean, I saying, shared what I had, but. I was just telling uh, Jake that I thought you were doing a pretty awesome job. Um, the, That's nice of you to say. Yeah, the, the implementation <laughs> of a learning management system is not the, the only piece of effective technology integration in the classroom. 
So what the plan was, um, and, and you've got the PD plan from last week, um, that the, the PD that we're looking at doing, and, and it all is contingent on um, you know, what we're able to bargain and uh, what uh, spaces we already have that we could um, use for the technology PD. But we're looking at whole group PD for staff, time for those teachers then to get together um, and collaborate with one another based on the topic that they hear in that whole group PD. So in August, we're looking at um, introducing, uh, helping teachers uh, develop um, uh, digital citizenship norms for their students. How do they introduce those? Similar to how they would introduce other routines in the classroom. How do they, um, how do they manage the technology? So now they've got a class set at the 3-5 sitting in the room. So how are they going to manage and take advantage of and reduce the time that it takes for a student to get their computer and, and bring it to their desk? So there's that classroom management piece. We're also looking in the August, September timeframe to really raise the level of knowledge um, of all staff around those uh, tier one tools that make um, content more accessible for students. So introducing to them, um, reminding them, introducing uh, the immersive reader experience. So you can have that on in your Edge browser and then a student who may struggle with reading could listen to uh, the text being read to them. So it's introducing those tools so that then when the teacher encounters a student in their room who needs those accessibility tools, they can turn, uh, you know, turn the student on to that tool. Um, so that's kind of the, the August, September time frame. And then there's different topics throughout the year um, that follows that cycle of a whole group training and then some collaboration with your colleagues to discuss how you're going to implement it in the classroom and then reflect on it and refine it for the next time. So this is a cycle that needs to happen in an ongoing manner. You can't do a, you know, a day of training in August and expect teachers to just you know, get it all and move forward with it. Um, we had the elementary STEM adoption recently where we weren't able to purchase the programmable devices that were part of the adoption. But taking some of those devices, adding those, you know, using some of the tech levy money for those, and then working with the teachers on how those programmable devices work in that elementary STEM curriculum. So it's, it's an ongoing piece throughout the levy is bringing teachers awareness and training and knowledge up around how to effectively use lots of tools um, in the classroom to support their content. Yes, yeah. yeah. Oh, he said, do you have to update every time there's a curriculum adoption? So when there is a curriculum adoption, if there is a, a new technology in there, then we need to train people on how to use that. And with most of our um, kind of core content curriculum adoptions, they have an electronic component, an online component, whether it's the textbook, um, you know, it could be the, the textbook, the personalized learning. So Alex now is, is brought in there. We've got iReady. So all of those personalized learning tools, there's training that needs to happen with the teachers to effectively use it uh, with their students and to get the most out of it, right? So they need to know how to read the reports, how to pull the reports, how to take what they see in the reports and um, apply it to what they're doing with students. Thank so, you. I think that was super, super helpful. And maybe from a, a way to com communicate it, <laughs> that would be helpful is almost like a bit of a maturity curve, right? Because mm -hmm. I guess what, where my brain is beginning, I was like, well, what's the new part? But what you're really saying is um, there's levels of maturity to go through mm -hmm. to truly maximize the investment in the in technology and to continue to add on different tools. I love that you talked about the immersive reader, actually. And so what we're doing is kind of moving a dial from today. We have an introduction of the technology, maybe a basic management of content mm -hmm. using the technology, but there's additional um, levels of, of, in, of, I don't know, being able to use the richness that's available to us and making sure that's across every classroom. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, there's a there's a framework that that has been around for years about the the level of technology integration, and it's it's called SAMR. So there's substitution, which I would say our Canvas learning management system it falls kind of on that substitution. So where a teacher used to pass out papers, now they're substituting that passing out of papers through the learning management system. Then there's augmentation, modification, and redefinition. And that redefinition area is where you are now able to do things that you weren't formerly able to do without the technology. So that is a, a progression that would be we would be working with our teachers on going from that substitution augmentation up to redefinition. Mitch Mellish, Executive Director of Teaching and Learning. I, I can't underestimate or uh, understate the, the fact that I, we could take you to classrooms that look like what we aspire all classrooms to be. We have, we have teacher leaders who are integrating technology in some very beautiful ways, and they, they are going to be our leaders and our trainers and our, our ed tech leads for this work as we go forward. Part of our goal is to bring everybody up to that so that it's not the luck of the draw. And one of the biggest barriers of that has been it's hard to train a teacher to use technology if they don't have the technology to use. And that's been a really big barrier for us. So that, that's kind of the, that's a real foundation of this whole thing is to move from hit and miss to a more guaranteed and viable technology integration um, and, to, and to bring everybody up to that, that level that we would like to see. That goes to my point of wanting to have similar experiences across the district so that it's not the luck of the draw, that mm -hmm. this integration is foundational and fundamental to the learning environment for students. Sorry, I want to go back to that spreadsheet because I, I still can't follow it, Jake. So... Line 147, line 145, the $3.1 million for teacher for web presence, right? So that's when I, if I look on the IEA salary schedule, that's web presence. Yep. And so on average for the salary schedule you sent us, it's between $1,500 and $1,600 per teacher. When I do the math here and divide 3.1 million by 1,270 teachers, I get $2,440. Two are you adding the uh, six hours of per diem in there, and then the mandatory benefits run about thirty-five percent? No, I mean, I'm not, I'm just asking. So That's when I we're... when I look at the salary schedule, yeah. so how does that translate from there to, to that? That's why I'm asking. So on the cert salary schedule, there's um, uh, off of memory there are there's the web presence, and then there's also the per diem tech pay. Which I don't think those are broken out on this one. Are they? Yeah, per diem is broken down on this one separately. Correct. No on. On this one, it's broken out separately. Yes, so six hours, and then that's the equivalent of 25 hours of per diem. So, thank you. Um, hold on, let me do some quick math for you. Uh, math at the, math at the dice. <laughs> It's 125,000 an hour, roughly. Yeah. So it, it, <clears throat> to put um, per diem compensation, but one hour of cert time across the system is 125 grand. So when the equivalent is uh, 25 hours, that's what 3.1 and change. And the same thing for the 875. So that's, is an hourly. I know you, those aren't, I'm saying you're not following, but there should be 1270 times 25 hours. At, but you don't know the per diem rate is the problem, right? When you're calculating it. No, I'm only looking at web presence. Yeah. So, so it's, it just should be something like if I can't follow this, right? I mean, so if I can't follow it, then, then who, how do we expect anyone in our community to be able to follow it? That's. Well, it, it is it is difficult to uh, cleanly communicate to the community when you have twelve hundred and seventy cert FTE that are all a different salary schedule. So that's why I told you the for one hour of cert time currently it's one hundred twenty five grand. Yeah, I'm not expecting us to have to not yeah. expecting us to have to communicate this to the community. It's really like I'm just also trying to follow yeah. the dollars, and it's 
about yeah. impossible for me to take this. And that's the whole my thing is like why I wanted the breakdown of try. Yep. I wanted to follow that and, and match that with what the salary schedule is. And so we have a lot of extra time and responsibility come from our EPNO and from our tech levy. And I'm just trying to follow how that funnels into the salary schedule. And it's really, really hard to do. And I think that's like, in the same way, it's hard for us to follow the capital projects dollars in all honesty. And we've, we've brought that up as a board many times because what's brought for us, like for instance, when it's change orders or anything, it doesn't show us what was the 2016 bond goal for that project. And then what have we spent towards that project? Like when I look for Cougar Mountain Middle School, it doesn't show me what the top line should be. What did we bond? What did we think we were going to spend? It's always just saying we're in budget because we've accepted these inflated overruns. And that, so in the same way, it just makes it hard for me to yeah. track and then follow changes. And, and I'm trying. So it's not that I'm not questioning your numbers. So don't take it that no, way. No, I, I wanted to give you how I, how I calculate it. It's just, it's just literally impossible for me to, to see how does what we do on our tech levy and our EPNO levy get to this point. And I feel like I should be able to do that. And it's, it's not possible. Same time, I'm sorry. No, you can fly, okay. I have, well, I don't know. Um, and so I, I was getting into the weeds, so I, I'll get out of the weeds, but I'm just saying that was just a uh, commentary. Like I'm, I'm trying to follow this because obviously we're, we're trying to do these levies to support programs, which programs are teachers. So like, uh, programs are people and I get that. It's just, I want to track. So if we're asking for new money, I want to see that I will then be able to track it where it falls here and to see that you guys then follow through with this next bargain on, well, new money is new responsibility or something. That's all. Well, I agree. And I, I think one thing that we could do to be clear is uh, put the you know common... Uh, pieces of financial data that I use every day to, you know, it changes over time. But for an example, I know exactly how much one day costs because I just added, when I build the budget, I do it day by day based on base salary. And that, that, that data is readily available to me. So to that end, we could uh, provide, you know, again, one hour at a certain time across the system is 125 grand, a seven hour day, you're looking at 875, 25 hours, you're looking at three one. So, you know, my goal for all of you and the, and the community is to make sure those numbers tie, right? So if, if it was 875 and then it was four and a half million dollars, that'd be a big problem. So all the numbers work out to exactly what they cost currently, you know, 125 and a half for one hour. But it is complicated when you have all different, those cells in the salary schedule and everybody's paid. And you can see the more senior you are, the more tech, you're, this is all per diem, uh, the more expensive uh, the cost is to the system. So. It is, it, is, it is a bit difficult to unravel, especially at the individual teacher level and on a salary schedule. Easier on try, because you can, you, know, you can see that 4%. But when it's per diem based, it, 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 I, rightfully so, Doc, it, it is hard. So, so is the, the document you have up right now, Jake, where web presence is line 129, and it's, it, it's a, a veteran teacher um, and when I go over to the far right, it says two thousand and seventy dollars. Is that oh, okay? Now you okay? So I was you're top, uh, you're down at that one. Okay, so twenty one forty two. Yes, top. That would be the top web present superintendent for the highest paid teacher in the system. Okay. So if you're at MA ninety, so now remember, not, yeah. there, there's mandatory benefits on top, and that's twenty five, twenty seven. Let's see. Depends on the year, but it usually runs between twenty five and twenty seven percent. So whatever you're seeing there, so it's going to cost 30. you about twenty six hundred dollars for your top teacher under the current system right. for web presence. Which I know, and Dr. Gallinger's math. If I was him, I'd be like, "What are you doing, Jake?" But the, the reality is, we have a boatload of teachers in that bottom right. Yeah, corner. It's, I, it's a per diem rate. It's not a flat rate that all right. teachers are paid this amount for right. the web presence. Right. So if you're if you're new to us, if you're you're twenty one forty two on the top end. You would be, this is the current salary schedule. This is, oh, that's not. So if you're, if you're a brand new teacher with us, and this is public documents, an IA's website, our website, this is our current salary schedule. So 
So a new teacher, if you um, uh, come to work for the ISD, BA zero, no experience, then your total annual salary is about $65,710 for this coming school year. Now, this salary schedule is detailed on purpose so that hopefully we could all see the components of pay, um, even though they are driven out. But you can see the per diem days are the, your seven days that you have above contract now. So basis for 180 per diem uh, is means daily. So there's seven days worth of pay uh, in that um, column here. That's their hourly rate. Try, which we talked about earlier, was 4% of base. And then web presence, that's 25 hours of their per diem. And then the tech PD is the, that six hours that is hanging out there. That's not a guaranteed portion of the compensation. They have to go to class or request for compensation. That That is the bulk of the pay, except for the retention and commitment that is down on the bottom. Sorry, this is Martin's mouse. I have no idea how to use it. So somewhere between about 1,200 and 20. 400. And plus uh, between 25 and 30% for mandatory benefits on top. So that, that is why when you, particularly since you have, if you have, a, if you have quite a few senior teachers, then they're going to be paid at the higher end. And obviously that we, as we just demonstrated, if you're a newbie, um, brand new profession, great starting salary at 65, seven, if who wants to be a teacher. Um, but you know, you're getting less per hourly, you know, $47 an hour as a starter. So um, I know it's a, you're like, oh, dear Lord. But for the most part, my goal is to be as transparent as possible and keep the numbers consistent for you. So currently, one hour teaching across the district is 125 grand. That sounds like a lot of money, but that's because the system is very large. So it looks like we would be spending, I'm just, I'm really ballparking here now, which is really nervous. And I know it makes you nervous whenever I get my calculator out. But is it, it the Casio? <laughs> No, actually, I'm using the one on my phone. Oh, okay. Uh, but it, so it looks like um, under the current school year, if you were, I just took an average of about 1,900 with benefits and everything included. Looking at the smallest being 12, I, I went with 1,900. I didn't want to overestimate. I multiplied that by the number of, of search staff, and I get about $2.4 million that we would be spending on that web presence. This year. Um, this year. Yeah, a little more than that, but yeah. Okay, so about am I two, in the ballpark of yeah, where so that I said is? We were underwater on the 1.8 from the last the levy, so we, we're right at two and a half, two six. Okay, and so this is a proposal that goes out for four more years. So there, I'm assuming Correct. you would put some escalation in there, just given yes. normal. Is that how you came with the number of 3.15? I did. And we're assuming that that would still be a need going forward in the system. I must, my assumption it may not be for this web presence per our earlier conversation, but my there will be a need there. was when planning that we are going to use those proceeds to facilitate uh, the needed professional development or work by our certificated staff to move one to one forward in the LMS. That's what that was my okay. assumption. More questions. I, I said I would just have a comment. You know, I listened intently to the conversation about one to one last two last board meeting, and um, certainly I want to clarify that I'm not against the concept of one to one. Um, I, I'm not convinced that bring your own device has quote failed in this district, and I can be sold on the need for uniform equipment in order to leverage portability and accessibility and less so equity. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, if we are talking about six and a half million dollars, I could really spend that in a lot of other higher priority things from an equity basis for me personally. Mm -hmm. uh, what I think for me that I'm struggling with right now with this is, uh, I'm, I'm not convinced that this is going to be game changing from a student learning standpoint, and that's why I'm here. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I knew that $6.5 million was gonna 
be this in magical investment that was going to result in magical outcomes? Sure, I'm in, um, but I'm not convinced of that. Uh, so therefore for me, it falls into the want bucket. Mm -hmm. And now to what Suzanne has said, the fact that this was the most highly voted item for the levy development committee is, is powerful to me. I think that I also then have to buffer with what are the needs? And I haven't heard and haven't seen in all of these funding things, how are we intentionally addressing learning loss that we know has developed as a result of the pandemic? And we know that our math scores, for example, have gone down 16 points on average. So I would love to have seen a proposal that would come forth for like, hey, we want to integrate one-to-one -one over this next four-year period. We're going to intentionally take a year to do a lot of teacher training on it because we're essentially two and a half years into doing nothing but computers in our middle schools by virtue of the pandemic. So this, these aren't new things, and yet we're not seeing a lot of leverage change in teaching practices across our middle schools. Uh, but more importantly, uh, technologically based plan, individualized for each student on how they're going to address and close their learning gaps in math particularly, since we use our math programs to already do internal assessments, whether it's iReady in our elementary schools or Savis in our middle schools or Alex in our high schools, like we readily get that assessment data. So for me, I would rather our focus in this first year to have been on, we are going to address learning loss and we're gonna have a developed plan for each student. And it's gonna involve support of these tech specialist teachers who, cause not every student is gonna close their gap by virtue of doing online modules, but they may leverage the technology to do, you have after school clubs where you have a teacher, a certificate staff member in there doing this or, or our flex time in our high schools, or we just have lots of opportunities for where there's our, our homeroom in our middle schools. We have lots of time that's built in to do this. And I think for me, not seeing that uh, in which is an acute need. And I worry that if we don't fill these math gaps, we're gonna have a generation of students that aren't ready for advanced math pathways and advanced science pathways. And so, you know, I, I wish there is a pause on how we're doing this implementation in order to be able to support students in their learning. And I think that's, and to leverage technology, but I don't think that just by virtue of putting a device in someone's hand, it's going to close those gaps. And so I would appreciate a thoughtful approach to implementation that would delay the putting the brick into the hands of students in order to leverage our resources to focus on closing gaps before full implementation. Marnie? Well, I think, I think I would agree with uh, much of that, you know, so according to the spreadsheet we have, we're talking about buying the computers in 2022 for the 2022, 22, 23 school year, but this levy really wouldn't start until 2023. And um, so I think part of me, I very much, I don't think that come September, we would be ready for three through 12 to have laptops in their hands, bringing to school every day in a meaningful way. Now, do I think one-to-one -one needs to be in the levy and that the dollar amounts are probably right? Absolutely. I think you're probably going to end up spending well over what you've budgeted in the first year, getting teachers ready on how do you integrate this into your learning. Now, my son was part of ISF's Start Strong back when they gave him a laptop, but this would have been in 2013 or, or 14, the 2014 year school year they weren't ready at all. So all it really was, was a really heavy electronic notepad for somebody who doesn't type or write. So it really didn't, it, without voice recognition and him being able to talk during class, it was useless because the teacher had no idea how to utilize it as a tool. So I think it's gonna take time to really utilize it as a tool in the classroom because teachers other than middle school this year haven't had that. And so, um, so I agree that I think that we need to fund it in this levy, but I think that the district probably needs to take a step back as to communicating out to families 
when they would anticipate us going to a full one-to-one, -one, because I don't think it can happen in September. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, and that's a good point. If anybody would like to speak to that, I mean, there is, it, it will take time for them to ramp up the skills, but if the students don't already have the devices in their hands as they're learning and implementing, I think that will just slow down because you're, if you're going to learn everything, but then they're not going to have computers for a whole nother year. I just don't see it happening. Is it, is it going to take, uh, is it going to be as effective in September, the integration as it will be in June? Probably not. And this is what I would say, but think about our PBS yes well, over the course of, I mean, we're now in year seven or eight of it, but it, it started, you know, with pilot and then it started with like super users and buildings and, the, and then it grew to eventually what it is today. And, and I, I guess I worry that if we don't take that same approach, we're not going to have the efficacy of these devices. And I, I think that, like I said, I think that this money next year could be better spent in addressing learning last needs across our district. And we can use technology to do that. So right. well, that, I guess that would just going to be a question. It has to be technology I right. mean, related to do it. So is there a plan to use technology to help with the learning loss um, going into next year, the time that this levy is? Yeah, actually, there's. I heard about three things in there that I think could use some clarification. Um, absolutely, that has been everything that we're doing right now is focused on getting students back on their learning pathway. So dealing with learning loss and, and doing that. So our assessment planning, our use of technology, our use of curriculum, our getting uh, interventions, uh, expanding interventions, all of those are about, about learning loss. So absolutely, um, I, don't, I, I don't think technology will magically do it, but I think technology can play a role in it. I do wanna be clear that um, the, the plan is for one-to-one -to, -one to be available in September 3rd through 12th grade, that the tech that, that we, we believe, and I, I can invite uh, Director Eggers back up, that um, with that we can we can do that in working with Kathy Crop and the IT department, and that is actually really critical because much like we we do the intense PD for a new curriculum once the curriculum's in the hands of the teachers, and we think that technology training is the same way. It our experience with technology training is if they can't apply that training right away. The, the technology training is not very useful. So getting the whole, the whole premise of this is having the technology in the hands, in the classrooms, so that the training can be put to immediate use. I will agree that it's gonna take some teachers time to ramp up and become confident and skillful users of the technology. And there's gonna be others that it's gonna be a quick journey. It's gonna vary quite a bit. I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, Director Eggers. Um, no, I, I think Rich, you covered covered that pretty well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I do the just to to kind of piggyback a little bit on what Rich had said. Um, it really is, and it kind of goes back to my three legged stool, right? You need to have all three of these things in place in order to start, and that's the equipment, the apps, and the software for the students and teachers. You need the professional development and you need the support. Um, so without all three of those things in place, that stool's not going to stand up, right? And and um, Dr. or Director Moraldo, um, in your in the Start Strong program, um, I would guess uh, based on my experience with how teachers use technology in the classroom is that for your student who is traveling throughout their school day with the laptop. They, they likely weren't, um, the, the teachers that, they, that were in front of your student had other kids maybe that didn't have a laptop and therefore the instruction uh, for that teacher would have been, I don't know that they would fully have been able to take advantage of what the laptop would have been able to do. Um, so, so that's why providing the devices um, for the students in the hands of the students so that the teachers can have that guaranteed reliable access at the point of instruction is key. And then, uh, you know, we've been talking about how 
We want to shift from those pockets of integration to universal uh, integration. So historically, we've done our ITP program um, each year. Uh, we've put that on pause the last uh, few years with COVID and whatnot. And we really want to take the success that we had with ITP over the last 20 years and apply it broad base across the system. And this is the plan that we believe will let us make that happen. So, it, yeah. Oh. Okay. Oh, well, one of you. Go. Okay. So uh, for, I think, four years, we've had social media and digital citizenship policy that's been board policy as an expectation for mm -hmm. student ends. And to my knowledge, that still hasn't happened K-12, especially 9-12. And what I worry about is there's a very clear connection between screen time and depression mm -hmm. in our district. And in a district that already on a health youth survey has 30 plus percent of our students on a weekly basis contemplate you know um, harming themselves and we aren't equipping them in what board has asked for to be done and so if we this is a really important mitigation that should have been in place long before we're going to put a device in all these students hands and what is the district plan to address the fact that this still hasn't happened and that we still are now going to intentionally be placing students potentially at risk by giving them a device mm -hmm. that is going to increase their screen time and potentially increase their risk for mental health impacts. And yet we're trying to invest in mental health impacts, yet let's also consider the prevention arm and how we thoughtfully approach technology. And do I think technology has to be the driver of bad outcomes? No, but without the educational piece that we as this board have pleaded with, I'm, I'm have significant hesitation. I certainly understand the hesitation. I I, I think I'm a, I I do. For me, I make a distinction though between what the individual and in our case the child is doing on the device because I I don't think doing uh, um, some of the programs that we use for learning is what is driving kids to con contemplate self harm. Frankly. I think it's social media when they're going and doing social media on the device. And um, we have safeguards to prevent that from happening while they're at school. We don't when they're in their home. And so, yeah, we're trying to educate our students on the dangers of it. They don't always listen to us. I think it's, it, it's a social media is incredibly compelling to young people and uh, something very challenging for I think any school system to police. The other thing, and I haven't done this, uh, Director Gallinger, but I know I'm, I'm aware of the data, the health use survey data on our students. I don't know that it looks that much different than our neighboring school districts who have had one-to-one -one programs in their schools for a long time. So I don't know if we can causally say if you're that a one-to-one -one is going to lead them to more bad use of technology. Um, and I, I would characterize bad use as social media that makes them feel depressed about themselves. Um, so I struggle with that a little bit. I'm, I, you know, I think, I think most of the social media stuff they do is on their phone and we don't provide them with that. They get that from their family and they can go off of our network and use their own digital lines to, to do it, even in our environments. If they're on our system, they're not able to do it. So. I, I share your concern um, uh, about the impact that screen time, but I don't think it's just screen time. I think it's the type of screen time is having on the mental health, frankly, not just of our children, but of our culture. Um, but I don't know that I can connect the learning tool and what we're trying to accomplish in, in terms of learning to that directly. But it, but I, I I hear your point. I mean you kind of educated me on that when we presented on this a few years ago, but you know, I thought the most compelling data that um, you shared was it was about the phone use and the smartphone more than it was the laptop. Um, I don't know that I can do much about getting smartphones and social media accounts away from young people to improve their mental health. I'd love to, but. 
but those are just kind of rambling thoughts mm -hmm. that I have. On <clears throat> I know Sydney has a comment, but just to tie into that, our devices would have filtered and protected. So on that score, we feel like we're protecting kids from harmful places they could go on. Okay, that's what I assumed. Thank you. And Sydney's turn. Thank you. So um, I, in going through what you guys put together, for me, it covered a number of things that I wanted to make sure were included. So a couple of things that were very important to me was that we were caring for the um, classroom technology footprint and being very clear that we were modernizing inside the classroom and the teaching tools during that the teacher is leveraging during the day. So I'm very pleased to see the level of specificity around um, the audio systems, around projector replacements, um, around teacher workstations, et cetera. Very happy about that. I think next, I'm very pleased to see the level of detail and surrounding infrastructure with the uptick in technology. So centralized staffing, technology uh, specialists that are building based, instructional tech specialists, I think um, that's helpful. I thought the um, both of the replacement cycles, uh, having clarity of what we're doing for devices over a number of years, great. Um, particularly happy to see a built-in or, you know, clearly called out amount for hotspots for low-income students. So uh, very pleased with, with the level of clarity included in the materials provided. I think I'm a, I'm a staunch believer that bring your own device is a disaster. Um, so I think from a cost per individual device, you can do better mass purchasing, um, for the benefit of the broader community, the ability to um, ensure compatibility of software drivers, et cetera, to smooth the teaching experience in the course of the day, I think is invaluable. I think the worst case scenario that we would have is to have a scenario where teachers are spending any minutes in a day, let alone many minutes a day, figuring out why something doesn't display print or, or something else. So I think um, there's a lot there. I think we just got into the ability to um, image and, and configure the machines in a standard way to ensure what and even when they're allowed to surf uh, the internet, which we haven't talked about. Yes, we usually talk about blocking particular sites or resources, but I think the opportunity is also at what point can students, what time of day can students actually access and leverage the devices is another one I would suggest exploring at all. Like, I don't know why any of them are using them at midnight. So we have the ability to control, control that as well, which we would not get from um, individual parental and devices. And parents are frankly overwhelmed with trying to keep up with how to safeguard individual devices um, themselves anyway. So from, from my perspective, I also agree that you will, I do not believe you will achieve the maturity you're talking about of adoption by staggering in the devices. Teachers will not adopt if they're not able to train immediately. Um, they will not be able to do that without the things you've cared for here, which is time to review others' work, time to have instruction in their own classroom. And if we don't roll the devices out immediately, which we absolutely can do in 2022, then all we're doing is delaying adoption. There, there, there is no magical, we train them and next year they start. That's just absolutely not how technology adoption works. So I'm, uh, for one, very pleased with the level of detail and thoughtfulness. I think what I'm hearing is that there's some maybe implementation plan, which I don't think you've been asked for, like, hey, how does this actually roll out over, over time? But I think that's from a cost perspective, um, I, I think that this is by far the most judicious way to spend the funds. It's something like you're looking at something like $500 a device, which is very respectable in mass and not what individual families are getting on their own. Um, so I, I am uh, very appreciative of what you laid out in the tech part. <laughs> what, what she said. That's what I said, Sydney. <laughs> oh, you saw. I'm, I'm doing it. <clears throat> I totally agree with everything you just said and could not have said it better. I have one more item, Marnie, <clears throat> that I was curious about was the hotspots for low-income students. 
And um, I think what it ended up, some of the, one of the documentation, you can correct me if I'm wrong, said it was about 475 students overall. And I just don't know if that is enough because we'll go, I, I won't go into my detail because you all know um, my feelings about what we consider yeah. low income. And so I'm just really concerned that we continue to base low income off of free and reduced lunch in our district. And that, is that gonna be enough? Um, Director Ronaldo, when we, we cost that item out of one of the budget, it, we did look at current usage of our hotspots during the pandemic. We put a lot out there and there was a lot unused. And we have the device, as you noted in the detail, um, the devices we already have, they're like 80 bucks a pop when you first buy them. So we have a surplus number of devices, but it's the monthly fee, uh, the $20 or uh, it's 20 bucks a month now. I think it started at 40 and then as the pandemic went down it went to 30 and 20, so we're at 20 bucks. So our current data would tell us that, that is a sufficient amount of hotspots to deploy um, for our most needy kids. Um, so we use, we use actual usage data now to drive that uh, forward. So. I want you to take some solace on that, that we, we were looking at actual data. We just didn't wing ding the number and go, eh, that'd be enough. So we looked at current data usage um, and we believe that will be sufficient. And of course, if it's not, then we'll have to reprioritize potentially and find the funds elsewhere. But um, So, but if we identify more kids who need hotspots, we have the hotspots. It's just a question of budgeting the $200 fee. It is, correct. Okay. So. Yeah, I, guess, I guess for me, it's how are you denoting who are the kids that would need it? And that's where my question lies is, I think there might be more that would need that support. And is it based only on free and reduced lunch? Um, I would say, you know, free and reduced lunch is often where we start, but then we do need a rational basis uh, to provide. And that would be sufficient. That would be just like, oh, that maybe that teacher notices X student isn't being able to complete their assignments. Okay, well. Maybe they need they don't have internet at home, so then we all part of the reporting process back up to be able to build those out. Lena, do you have? Oh, and I do want to point out also our schools have done multiple surveys this year about the need of technology, um, but based on if you were, we're not. Are, am I allowed to say? <laughs> no, if we are not ever going back to remote, but we surveyed multiple times. If for some reason we were told we had to and you had to do school from home, would you need a hotspot? And we feel like that data actually is really useful. Um, and then we did get lots of feedback about why, you know, some, some feedback about why students maybe didn't end up using the hotspots that they checked out last year and stuff. But so, I mean, that, but that's anecdotal and I do not have data on that. So, I, so we feel like we're using data to make the choice. And I, I don't know if uh, Executive Director McCormick might have some really good to add. Hi, Andrea McCormick, Executive Director of High Schools. We surveyed every student at the beginning of this school year because Canvas is our platform this year. So we made sure that every single student in our district had working internet at home so they could access Canvas because even with that one-to-one -one, with a learning platform where submissions are electronic, we needed that. So we surveyed all students, regardless of their free and reduced lunch status, and we're able to issue them the hotspots based on what we have this year. So and for me, I just want to make sure there's enough. I'm yeah, not, and I'm not questioning the need for this, to be very clear. I want to yeah. make sure that we're considering students who would qualify for housing and urban development as low income because they don't qualify for reduced lunch in this in this area. We so, had enough. There were a few students who indicated that they would want a hotspot because of the um, quality of their internet at home. If multiple people were back at home in a fully remote environment, like parents working at home and students. So there were some students that indicated that. Those are the only students who we didn't meet the need for because we didn't have a need because we're in person. So we felt that we were able to meet the need of all the high school students this year. And I, and I think very, very clearly, if there's an established need, we were not limited to students who have qualified for free and reduced lunch. It, but the, having the rational basis of need, uh, we were able to make make uh, it available to them. Thank you. More questions? Have we exhausted this yet? 
I think my last comment is, as, as I said two weeks ago, I, I have significant concerns over the cost of insurance. And I would rather see us redirect some of that money that was uh, down in those lower six rows towards ensuring, just having the district pay to insure all the devices rather than to put that burden on the families. Um, President Moore, I would just, you know, kind of related to um, Dr. Gallinger's statements, because we had this conversation um, last week as well. Um, I want to be really clear that I don't believe that being a one-to-one -one district is, is a magic bullet or anything like that. I look at our neighboring districts who have been one-to-one -one in some cases for many years. I haven't seen dramatic improvements in student learning or graduation rates or anything like that. So we had this conversation four years ago and came to a different conclusion than we've come to this time. Four years ago, we, we decided it wasn't uh, enough return on the investment to go this direction. And uh, then of course, so we didn't put it in our capital levy. Uh, we, the experience of the pandemic, I think has, it has changed me. And I think it's changed the attitude of a lot of folks in our system. Having said that, I don't believe it's, it, it, it's, it's not some, there is no magic bullets in education, I don't believe. What it does for me, though, is it, I believe it does help prepare our students better for higher ed and work-ready skills. Um, we've gotten some input that I hadn't even thought about that it has improved some of the organizational challenges, particularly we heard that from our middle school teachers. And I do think it does provide a, a pathway to more equitable access to tech for all students. I think you, I think it does that for us. Um, and so given that, I, that's what's kind of moved me. Um, but I recognize that it's a, it's a big investment. Um, but I also recognize that it is something that um, seems very popular within our, in, in our community. And, and I, I don't want to ignore that. If they're telling us this is something we want, um, and I feel like the team has done a really nice job of planning a way to um, roll this out, if you will, and and there's going to be some unanswered questions because unfortunately, well, it's not unfortunate; it's just our reality. We we have a new collective bargaining agreement that we have to enter into uh, with our teachers, so we're going to have they're going to get a say in how we do this, and it's going to be a collaborative effort. Um, as, as it relates to the training and the implementation uh, with our teachers. But I do agree, and I, I was glad to hear it said by a couple of board members that I think it's critical if we're going to start down this path, we have to have the devices in the hands of students. We, it, I, I completely concur that you, to, to, try, to start training teachers without their students having the devices in front of them, I don't think would be very effective. So uh, that's just how I, that's how I have moved in this conversation from somebody who four years ago was comfortable not recommending it to four years later recommending it. Those are the factors that have moved me. Uh, Sydney. I just want to go back to the, the insurance point for a second. I don't want that to be a hanging chad. So if, um, you know, rough math, everybody's calculating tonight. I'm just looking basic internet search. I don't know what we actually pay, but let's say it's $30 a year per device. This is a $50,000 expense. So is there some reason why we can't just say we would do it as a district and put that one to rest? Are you going to vote? No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm being honest. Like it's just. <laughs> um, so here's what I think. Am I going to vote? Yes. Yeah. So I think one thing that um, we uh, team is, so Diane and I are having a conversation. Insurance has done uh, potpourri of ways around the, the, even our neighbors. So you've got some that have districts buy in, the, the parent buys into a fund for 25 or 30 bucks. Others charge you 75 bucks for insurance. Um, to that end, my, my team has been uh, working on getting some additional federal grants for uh, procurement of laptops. So we may be able to get an extra 100,000 from the feds here shortly. Uh, to that end, that means we would have that extra capacity in your laptop one-to-one -one rollout. So if you would like to make the district uh, 
wholly the whole insurer, then that is something we could do within those funds. And I say that only because I just found out we got a grant for some CPUs. Um, so that does free up some capacity. So I believe we could insure it for close to hundred grand. What I don't know is um, there's also insurance, as you know, Sydney, that does like major repair only or complete damage. So we have to look at the gradations. Um, so I, at least I think we could do a full replacement if it was fully damaged. So we could take that off the table. Right. Perhaps. Or is there a way to buy it down? Because I also, way, I also think there's some value well, in a too. family, a student believing that they have a responsibility to the device, some but the right. Some skin in the game. So maybe it's something that instead of completely eliminating that it is reduced and the caveat that anyone free and reduced, however we define has real need for it is compensated for it either through our, cause we had talked about, you know, the foundation was a possibility through the district. So that's one need, but on the other side of it, I think just buying it down would be more valuable. So we could, for example, we could fully ensure whatever, whatever measure of low income or need that you, we agreed on. I mean, usually we use F and R for just free and reduced as, a, as our general. And I know Marty does not like that one. Hmm. Um, and then you're right, we could buy down. So maybe it's 20 bucks a year, 25 bucks a year. Um, more along the rent in model. Yeah. That's, so that, that's that is something we could do. The rent do. fund model, which is $25. So, I mean, we could bring the board back um, the structure on what that insurance would look like. Cause I know Dr. Gallinger has expressed, you know, if you have two or three kids at home and it's 75 bucks a year, that starts to be rather expensive. You can buy your own device instead of insure it. So um, that's something we could do. <laughs> Again, we have that you could do that within your current one owner replacement just because we found out we had a federal grant uh, for some additional laptops. So that, and we can bring that back to you in various structures and superintendent can update you on. What it is interesting that three districts that border us um, that are one-to-one, -one, all three approach this problem differently. Yeah. Probably not surprising. Yeah. I, yeah. So it does sound like there is a solution or. There is a solution know, to your concern. To yes. The concern. Okay. Well, good. Thank you very much for that. Okay. We're back. Are we exhausted enough on this one? All right. Then all those in favor of, oh my gosh, my notes are so long. I can't get back up to the name of it. All right. We, all those in favor, approval of resolution 1179, replacement capital projects levy, say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Okay. The, uh, eyes have it and the levy is approved and we'll move forward. Thank you. That was a rich discussion there. A very rich discussion. That's a big step forward for our system, by the way. We, you know, as I said, we've talked about this a lot over like the last eight years. So appreciate everybody's uh, good, good thoughts on that one. Great. All right. So now we are on to our next item on the agenda which is the levy ballot measure pro con statement. We've talked about this a little bit, that there's been a change in the way the law is and the um, voters pamphlet. And so this will be the first time uh, we'll be taking this kind of an action. At our last board meeting, we directed the superintendent to advertise, um, to collect people's uh, kind of an, a, um, a submission to say they're interested in working on a pro or con statement. And so now we've received that information and the board is, uh, our step is to take action on assignment of the committees to each of the pro and con for each of the three levies. So we're gonna do each levy one at a time. So we'll start with the motion on the first levy. I move the board appoint the following individuals, Don Peshek, Alicia Viver, and Wright Knoll to the pro committee for resolution 1178, replacement educational programs and operations levy. There were no applicants for the con committee. Second. Okay. And um, as she indicated, there were three people that had submitted their names for the pro and no one submitted their name for the con. And just so that we can jump ahead, there are people that did submit for the con on other levies. So, I mean, the information got out there that this was an available opportunity for people and no one so chose to come back with that. Any discussion on this? All right. All those in favor of the motion as presented say aye. 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 
Opposed? Okay, so that one is approved and we will move on to the next motion. I move a board, start again. I move the board appoint the following individuals, Don Peshek, Alicia Viver, and Wright Knoll to the pro committee and Daniel Sribni, Michelle Williams, and Samuel Lynn to the con committee for resolution 1179 replacement capital project levy. Second. All right. Is there any comment or discussion on the motion? All right. All those in favor of the motion as stated, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Then those are approved and we will move on to the third one. I move the board appoint the following individuals, John Keshek, Alicia Viver, and Wright Knoll to the pro committee for resolution 1180 school bus levy. There were no applicants for the con committee. Second. All right, are there any, um, any discussion or questions on the motion? All right, then all those in favor of the motion as presented say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so those three are approved. These names for the committees will be submitted with the resolution and the explanatory statement to King County by the deadline. And then our job on that part of it is done. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, now we are on to legislative matters. I think you guys covered everything earlier in the meeting when you talked about the conference. Okay. Um, do you have any status on the legislative linkage that you were working on? I do not. Sorry. All right, then we are on to uh, work some progress. Okay, and I know it's late, but I do have some things I need to share. Uh, first off, following board direction, we reached out to the staff who cur currently work out of our old administration center on Holly Street to get feedback on the naming of the facility. As you are aware, it's under uh, remodel right now. We shared the idea of naming the facility the Holly Street Early Learning Center. I can report back that staff who responded shared that they liked the name or did not have uh, other suggestions. So at this time, I'm planning to let our capital projects department move forward with ordering of a new sign that will refer to the building as the Holly Street Early Learning Center. So thank you for that. Um, and we process that. There was a few joke names that were thrown in there, like, <laughs> yeah. well, you know, yeah. where, where Ron used to hang out and stuff like that. <laughs> Um, we, I, I also wanted to share, we are excited to share that in collaboration with Costco pharmacies, we will be offering two more vaccine clinics. These will occur on Saturday, February 26th from 8 a.m. to noon and Saturday, March 5th from 8 a.m. to noon. These are for the five to 11 year old students. Uh, there will also be Pfizer booster shots available for adults by appointment only during these clinics as well. Um, just a, a shout out again to uh, Dave Montavo. Uh, he's done a nice job and Martin Turney um, getting these, these, you know, this will be, I, I don't know how many clinics we've offered now, but a lot. And I'm just pleased that we can play a role in getting our community vaccinated. Um, the second dose clinics will be on Saturday, March 19th and March 26th. And all of these will be held here at this central administration building, 5150. Um, and all this information and registration link will be available to the public soon. Um, I wanna give a shout out to the Issaquah Schools Foundation. They're in the process, or I probably have completed the process of awarding their annual grants to our schools and educators. I know there's been some exciting moments out in our schools when, uh, Happy, cheerful ISF volunteers show up with grand awards. Huge thank you to our amazing foundation for all the ways they, they support our students and staff. Um, just to note that uh, February is African American History Month and it is also National Career and Technical Education Month. And this week is National School Counseling Week. So lots to acknowledge and celebrate during the month of February. I thought I would give just a few quick COVID updates. Um, lots of good recovery work taking place in our school system, such as um, the operating, um, such as the operating of a recovery week of learning during our midwinter break 
for our students who receive special education services. This is voluntary, but some 200 students will be attending these classes offered during the break. So we offered it four days, uh, half each, uh, I think the days are three and a half hours long or four hours long. And we've got three sites. And I just gotta give a big shout out to Dr. Bailey and her team. Uh, they have literally put together a quick mini mm -hmm. interim session where students will be able to get um, or a 12, like 16 hours of um, specialized um, instruction directed at their IEP goals. Another um, thing that I, I just learned of this week that I was really pleased to hear, our high schools have cr also created and added sections of pre-algebra math class. We haven't had pre-algebra in our high schools for a while. Um, for students who have struggled with algebra as a result of last year's remote learning, um, so they added these classes during the second semester, which we just turned over to for this school year. Um, you know, good educators monitor and adjust, and that's what we're doing. Um, I will note that this is not an easy thing to do in the middle of a school year, and I really appreciate. Um, so it's had the effect of one for those students who are really struggling in their algebra class, we're throwing them a lifeline with a pre-algebra class. Um, teachers are stepping up and, and taking on these extra classes. Of course, we'll compensate them for it, but it's, it's somebody who taught during their prep periods during my career. It can be tiring, but they see the need there. It also has the effect of reducing the size of some of the algebra classes. So it's kind of a double win there. Um, and then finally, as I have um, uh, noted for the last couple of weeks, student attendance is back to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, the last few days, we had fewer than 700 students absent. And in fact, um, uh, our daily attendance rate is running at about 97%. So very happy about that. And, uh, and then I just want to acknowledge, um, if you saw the governor's press conference yesterday, and then you saw Superintendent Reichdahl, there is lots of conversation around the state regarding the lifting of some COVID mitigation requirements, such as mask wearing. I'm happy to hear this conversation and hopeful for the move away from some of, uh, some of these mitigations in a time in the future when it is appropriate. Um, you know, we are big supporters of mitigating the virus in our community. I think we've done an outstanding job of it, but I think we also need to give our community um, hope that we won't always be in a COVID mitigation cycle and if it's appropriate to move away from that. And if you're considering registering your kindergarten in the Issaquah School District, I think there's a very high likelihood um, that later this spring, certainly into the next school year, but my hope is later this school year, um, some of these mandates will be lifted because it will be safe enough to do so. So I was happy it's to hear that. Interesting though, that because when I was looking at my notes from the Ledge Conference, which was what, a week and a half ago, one of the things he said, because I wrote it down, was masks in schools aren't going away anytime soon. Yeah. So. Obviously, there's been an interest thing about this. <laughs> it's amazing what politicians <laughs> will do when the pressure is applied. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, I, I get it. I'm just saying, he did say that a week and a half ago. It's, it's rarely been about the science, <laughs> in this state at least. I did see a good post. It's not about the science, it's about the political science. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, there may be some truth there. That's all I had, President Thank you Moore. very much. Uh, appreciate that. A lot of good things happening right now. And I'm very excited for the uh, vaccine clinic that yeah. they'll be doing here. That's, uh, I'll have to look at that. I've worked at most of the other ones. So give that one a try. Does any, now we're on announcements and correspondence. Does anybody have anything they want to describe that they haven't already sent on? Nope. All right. We are now cruising to the end and we are at calendar and future agenda topics. Um, I did want to point out, and I'm sure everybody saw, but Liberty High School sent us their an invitation to uh, participate in their exit interviews. It's very exciting <laughs> that we have this back and we're going to be having exit interviews. So I let her know that if any of you are able to do that, um, that you would email directly. And then... Um, Sydney pointed out that um, we might want to get into our minds the scheduling of our next town hall. I think we talked about doing one up at the Skyline High School attendance area because we've done Issaquah. I missed that one. And then we did Liberty and I attended that one. And so um, thinking about doing one up at the Skyline area. Um, I don't know. This board is very difficult to schedule whether... Mm -hmm. 
Marnie? I said doodle. Yeah, I can throw out a doodle and give it a try. I know we, I know, I know it's so late now and it's, we're very tired. So if I had a target, so we're, so March is very busy. We, we're very taxed on the demands of your time yes. in March. We have the SIP meetings. We have uh, the superintendent search meetings, which uh, will be intense over that time. The beginning of April, we have NSBA. Um, later in April, there's spring break. I could aim. Oh, what am I missing? And an election. And, the, and yeah, an election. Our levy election is at the end of April. So I'm unavailable the first two weeks of May. You can do it without me. Yes. So that's why, you know, if I'm just getting a sense, because I don't want to start a doodle that's too that that's not in the date range we're really aiming for. Because we but we get to forego a superintendent evaluation. Yes, we get year, to forego right? the superintendent evaluation. Kind of fun. Yeah, that that's true. I wasn't going to I will also say that in general we do a um like a spring retreat, which is also not on our agenda mm. or, or on our calendar. Oh, good. right. Because because we have had just too much going on. Yeah. So it's there has just been a lot of demands on the board and it's becoming very difficult. So um, I would wonder if we could, which week is spring break? Okay. If we could aim for the last two weeks, oh, that's right before the election, but I don't know if that has any, any effect on all of you, some, some the week of April 18th. And I could throw out a doodle and into April 20, the week of April 25th, or we just go into early May. Um, Ron and I have to be at Cedar Trails on the 20th. Yeah, um, yes, the others have been. So I guess that was my assumption going into it. It would be an evening event. Ron and I have a- Yeah, maybe we should try to do it in the first week of May and maybe Suzanne just can't be there. I mean, not that, I, I mean, I wasn't at the first one, so because <laughs> there was no date. Um, okay, so now, uh, and. Um, the week of the 25th. The week of the 25th. I could do the 27th. The day after the election. It is. It did summer. Yeah, uh, that's true. I think you're getting head nods already. The uh, three nights. Yeah, because we have the levy oh. on Tuesday, and we have a board meeting on Thursday. Oh, oh, we have a okay. Yeah, I see what you're, you're. The board meeting is what I hadn't gotten to. So we have a board meeting on the twenty eighth. But if the board is good with, um, if everybody's looking at the twenty seventh. Okay, so I will write this down, and I will follow up with you when you're more conscious. Uh, April 27th for the town hall and see if there's any issues with Skyline High School or just see if we can put the details together, but I'll, I'll go with that. And I realize I'm missing a note on. Oh, right. It, uh, it doesn't, no. Oh, for the setup? Is Pine Lake better than Skyline? I'll, I'll work on this with you guys. I'll work on you. With it. Like shiny and I'll work on it with you. But the other thing that we need to finish is the movement of the June 9th board meeting. Oh, yeah. remember I brought that yeah. up at the last meeting mm -hmm. and we, I was, I had asked everybody to check on Monday, June 6th and I didn't hear from anybody. I did. Oh, sorry about that. I totally missed that. Okay, so you can't do June 6th. I think you had to do that. Yeah. I can't do June 7th. And somebody said they couldn't do June 8th. I can't do June 8th. No, Marnie. But you all can live without me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all I vote for Wednesday. What was that, Sydney? The okay. Not for me. Oh, so I'm out. Meeting. You want to run the meeting? Yeah. 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 Right. I, I mean, I, I volunteer I too. <laughs> we could. No Monday, no Monday. Yeah. No, I, what I know. I know. Um, okay. So still. I'm voting for Wednesday. 
two guys. <coughs> All yeah, right. Hey, you run the meeting until 1145. This is what you're doing. I know. Yeah. I know. I can, okay. I, if okay. we did it on Wednesday, I could apply, I could come after my ITC meeting. What, what time is your, yeah, um, probably, I'd be here probably around 730, Oh, that's not bad. So if we did it Wednesday, we just have you come in late. At least you you would arrive for some part of it. Right. Wait a minute. Sydney is thumbing about oh, Wednesday. Okay. No, no, no. I'm just trying to figure out what you said. Maybe you can do the whole part. Do okay. you want a motion? Sure. Uh, I move that we change the June 9th board meeting to Wednesday, June 8th, same time, same place. Second. All right. All those in favor of the movement of the June 9th board meeting to June 8th, please. Oh, wait. Discussion. Oh, yeah. Does anybody have any discussion? No, I, I do. Oh. Like, so since we're moving the date, like, yeah. can we just move the time? Oh, to? 7.30. Oh, to make it later? Right. I mean, since we're moving the date. You won't be able to do a work session or anything like that. Well, let's hope we don't need one. Yeah, that's okay if we don't. I mean, it's the day before graduation. Let's hope we don't have a long meeting. Right. Oh, good yeah, luck. What if we do? <laughs> I know. Oh, I, I would be fine with that too. I'd be leaving at five o'clock no matter what. I'd be leaving at 4.40. Yeah. Let's not do that. Um, I think we're better off doing it in... <laughs> In the evening, um, because that is our standard time. Um, but I could see us starting at seven. Yeah, that's nice. and it would give you more time, Marnie, and maybe you'd miss the beginning of the meeting. But I also don't want to make it too late. Yeah, yeah, I think seven's okay. Yeah. So did I hear Harlan amend the motion to seven p.m. start time? And did we have a second? Suzanne seconded. You did. You had a second. You seconded. I, I seconded. Okay, Harlan, you just he just Harlan moved. amended it, and I'm <laughs> fine with the amendment. It's a friendly amendment. Okay, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 All right, so now what we're offering up is June 8th at 7 p.m. Any other discussion? All right, all those in favor of the change say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Okay. Yeah. That's right. Oh, it we'll is. be so confused. We will be so confused. Though. So, Diane, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. If, Diane, if you could send out the calendar invite to make sure we need to get that on the board's calendar so that they do not forget and, the, and that time. And um, then I'll call us adjourned. I think we're done unless anybody.